This is Audible. Time Warner Audiobooks presents City of Bones, written by Michael Connolly and read by Peter J. Fernandez. This is for John Houghton, for the help, the friendship, and the stories. Chapter 1 The old lady had changed her mind about dying, but by then it was too late. She had dug her fingers into the paint and plaster of the nearby wall until most of her fingernails had broken off. Then she had gone for the neck, scrabbling to push the bloodied fingertips up and under the cord. She broke four toes, kicking at the walls. She had tried so hard, shown such a desperate will to live, that it made Harry Bosch wonder what had happened before. Where was that determination and will, and why had it deserted her until after she had put the extension cord noose around her neck and kicked over the chair? Why had it hidden from her? These were not official questions that would be raised in his death report, but they were the things Bosch couldn't avoid thinking about as he sat in his car outside the Splendid Age Retirement Home on Sunset Boulevard, east of the Hollywood Freeway. It was 4.20 p.m. on the first day of the year. Bosch had drawn holiday call-out duty. The day more than half over, and that duty consisted of two suicide runs. One a gunshot, the other the hanging. Both victims were women. In both cases there was evidence of depression and desperation, isolation. New Year's Day was always a big day for suicides. While most people greeted the day with a sense of hope and renewal, there were those who saw it as a good day to die. Some, like the old lady, not realizing their mistake until it was too late. Bosch looked up through the windshield and watched as the latest victim's body, on a wheeled stretcher and covered in a green blanket, was loaded into the coroner's blue van. He saw there was one other occupied stretcher in the van and knew it was from the first suicide, a 34-year-old actress who had shot herself while parked at a Hollywood overlook on Mulholland Drive. Bosch and the body crew had followed one case to the other. Bosch's cell phone chirped, and he welcomed the intrusion into his thoughts on small deaths. It was Mankiewicz, the watch sergeant at the Hollywood Division of the Los Angeles Police Department. Do you finish with that yet? I'm about to clear. Anything? A change to my mind, suicide. You got something else? Yeah, and I didn't think I should go out on the radio with it. Must be a slow day for the media, getting more what's happening calls from reporters than I'm getting service calls from citizens. They all want to do something on the first one the actress on Mulholland. You know, a death of a Hollywood dream story. And they'd probably jump all over this latest call, too. Yeah. What is it? A citizen up in Laurel Canyon, on Wonderland. He just called up and said his dog came back from a run in the woods with a bone in its mouth. The guy says it's human. An arm bone from a kid. Bosch almost groaned. There were four or five call-outs like this a year. Hysteria, always followed by simple explanation. Animal bones. Through the windshield, he saluted the two body movers from the coroner's office as they headed to the front doors of the van. I know what you're thinking, Harry. Not another bone run. You've done it a hundred times and it's always the same thing. Coyote, deer, whatever. But listen, this guy with the dog, he's an M.D. And he says there's no doubt it's a humorous. That's the upper arm bone. He says it's a child, Harry. And then get this. He said... There was silence, while Mankiewicz apparently looked for his notes. Bosch watched the coroner's blue van pull off into traffic. When Mankiewicz came back, he was obviously reading. The bone's got a fracture clearly visible just above the medial epicondyl, whatever that is. Bosch's jaw tightened. He felt a slight tickle of electric current go down the back of his neck. That's off my notes. I don't know if I'm saying it right. The point is, this doctor says it was just a kid, Harry. So could you humor us and go check out this humorous? Bosch didn't respond. Sorry. Had to get that in. 
Yeah, that was funny, Mank. What's the address? Mankiewicz gave it to him and told him he had already dispatched a patrol team. You were right to keep it off the air. Let's try to keep it that way. Mankiewicz said he would. Bosch closed his phone and started the car. He glanced over at the entrance to the retirement home before pulling away from the curb. There was nothing about it that looked splendid to him. The woman who had hung herself in the closet of her tiny bedroom had no next of kin, according to the operators of the home. In death, she would be treated the way she had been in life, left alone and forgotten. Bosch pulled away from the curb and headed toward Laurel Canyon. Chapter 2 Bosch listened to the Lakers game on the car radio while he made his way into the canyon and then up Lookout Mountain to Wonderland Avenue. He wasn't a religious follower of professional basketball, but wanted to get a sense of the situation in case he needed his partner, Jerry Edgar. Bosch was working alone because Edgar had lucked into a pair of choice seats to the game. Bosch had agreed to handle the callouts and to not bother Edgar unless a homicide or something Bosch couldn't handle alone came up. Bosch was alone also because the third member of his team, Kismin Ryder, had been promoted nearly a year earlier to robbery homicide division and still had not been replaced. It was early third quarter and the game with the Trailblazers was tied. While Bosch wasn't a hardcore fan, he knew enough from Edgar's constant talking about the game and begging to be left free of call-out duty that it was an important matchup with one of the Los Angeles team's top rivals. He decided not to page Edgar until he had gotten to the scene and assessed the situation. He turned the radio off when he started losing the AM station in the canyon. The drive up was steep. Laurel Canyon was a cut in the Santa Monica Mountains. The tributary roads ranged up toward the crest of the mountains. Wonderland Avenue dead-ended in a remote spot where the half-million-dollar homes were surrounded by heavily wooded and steep terrain. Bosch instinctively knew that searching for bones in the area would be a logistical nightmare. He pulled to a stop behind a patrol car already at the address Mankiewicz had provided and checked his watch. It was 4.38, and he wrote it down on a fresh page of his legal pad. He figured he had less than an hour of daylight left. A patrol officer he didn't recognize answered his knock. Her nameplate said Brasher. She led him back through the house to a home office where her partner, a cop whom Bosch recognized and knew was named Edgewood, was talking to a white-haired man who sat behind a cluttered desk. There was a shoebox with the top off on the desk. Bosch stepped forward and introduced himself. The white-haired man said he was Dr. Paul Gio, a general practitioner. Leaning forward, Bosch could see that the shoebox contained the bone that had drawn them all together. It was dark brown and looked like a gnarled piece of driftwood. He could also see a dog lying on the floor next to the doctor's desk chair. It was a large dog with a yellow coat. So this is it, Bosch said, looking back down into the box. Yes, detective, that's your bone, Gio said. And as you can see, he reached to a shelf behind the desk and pulled down a heavy copy of Gray's Anatomy. He opened it to a previously marked spot. Bosch noticed he was wearing latex gloves. The page showed an illustration of a bone, anterior and posterior views. In the corner of the page was a small sketch of a skeleton with the humerus bone of both arms highlighted. The humerus, Gio said, tapping the page. And then we have the recovered specimen. He reached into the shoebox and gently lifted the bone. Holding it above the book's illustration, he went through a point-by-point -point comparison. Medial epicondyl, trochlea, greater and lesser tubercle, he said. It's all there. And I was just telling these two officers I know my bones even without the book. This bone is human, detective. There's no doubt. Bosch looked at Guillaume's face. There was a slight quiver, perhaps the first showing of the tremors of Parkinson's. Are you retired, Doctor? Yes, but it doesn't mean I don't know a bone when I see... I'm not challenging you, Dr. Gio. Bosch tried to smile. You say it is human. I believe it, okay? 
I'm just trying to get the lay of the land here. You can put that back into the box now if you want. Gio replaced the bone in the shoebox. What's your dog's name? Calamity. Bosch looked down at the dog. It appeared to be sleeping. When she was a pup, she was a lot of trouble. Bosch nodded. So, if you don't mind telling it again, tell me what happened today. Gio reached down and ruffled the dog's collar. The dog looked up at him for a moment and then put its head back down and closed its eyes. I took Calamity out for her afternoon walk. Usually when I get up to the circle, I take her off the leash and let her run up into the woods. She likes it. What kind of dog is she? Bosch asked. Yellow Lab. Brasher answered quickly from behind him. Bosch turned and looked at her. She realized she had made a mistake by intruding and nodded, and stepped back toward the door of the room where her partner was. You guys can clear if you have other calls, Bosch said. I can take it from here. Edgewood nodded and signaled his partner out. Thank you, Doctor, he said as he went. Don't mention it. Bosch thought of something. Hey, guys. Edgewood and Brasher turned back. Let's keep this off the air, okay? You got it, said Brasher, her eyes holding on Bosch's until he looked away. After the officers left, Bosch looked back at the doctor and noticed that the facial tremor was slightly more pronounced now. They didn't believe me at first either, he said. It's just that we get a lot of calls like this. But I believe you, doctor. So why don't you continue with the story? Gio nodded. Well, I was up on the circle and I took off the leash. She went up into the woods like she likes to do. She's well trained. When I whistle, she comes back. Trouble is, I can't whistle very loud anymore. So if she goes where she can't hear me, then I have to wait, you see. What happened today when she found the bone? I whistled and she didn't come back. So she was pretty far up there. Yes, exactly. I waited. I whistled a few more times, and then finally she came down out of the woods next to Mr. Ulrich's house. She had the bone in her mouth. At first I thought it was a stick, you see, and that she wanted to play fetch with it. But as she came to me, I recognized the shape. I took it from her. Had a fight over that. And then I called you people after I examined it here and was sure. You people, Bosch thought. It was always said like that. As if the police were another species. The blue species which carried armor that the horrors of the world could not pierce. When you called, you told the sergeant that the bone had a fracture. Absolutely. Gio picked up the bone again, handling it gently. He turned it and ran his finger along a vertical striation along the bone's surface. That's a brake line, detective. It's a healed fracture. Okay. Bosch pointed to the box and the doctor returned the bone. Doctor, do you mind putting your dog on a leash and taking a walk up to the circle with me? Not at all. I just need to change my shoes. I need to change, too. How about if I meet you out front? Right away. I'm going to take this now. Bosch put the top back on the shoebox and then carried it with two hands, making sure not to turn the box or jostle its contents in any way. Outside, Bosch noticed the patrol car was still in front of the house. The two officers sat inside it, apparently writing out reports. He went to his car and placed the shoebox on the front passenger seat. Since he had been on call-out, he had not dressed in a suit. He had on a sport coat with blue jeans and a white Oxford shirt. He stripped off his coat, folded it inside out, and put it on the back seat. He noticed that the trigger from the weapon he kept holstered on his hip had worn a hole in the lining, and the jacket wasn't even a year old. Soon it would work its way into the pocket and then all the way through. More often than not, he wore out his coats from the inside. He took his shirt off next, revealing a white T-shirt beneath. He then opened the trunk to get out the pair of work boots from his crime scene equipment box. As he leaned against the rear bumper and changed his shoes, he saw Brasher get out of the patrol car and come back toward him. 
So it looks legit, huh? Think so. Somebody at the M.E.'s office will have to confirm, though. You going to go up and look? I'm going to try to. Not much light left, though. Probably be back out here tomorrow. Uh, by the way, I'm Julia Brasher. I'm new in the division. Harry Bosch. I know, I've heard of you. I deny everything. She smiled at the line and put her hand out, but Bosch was right in the middle of tying one of the boots. He stopped and shook her hand. Sorry, she said. My timing is off today. Don't worry about it. He finished tying the boot and stood up off the bumper. When I blurted out the answer in there, about the dog, I immediately realized you were trying to establish a rapport with the doctor. That was wrong. I'm sorry. Bosch studied her for a moment. She was mid-thirties, with dark hair and a tight braid that left a short tail going over the back of her collar. Her eyes were dark brown. He guessed she liked the outdoors. Her skin had an even tan. Like I said, don't worry about it. You're alone? Bosch hesitated. My partner's working on something else while I check this out. He saw the doctor coming out the front door of the house with the dog on a leash. He decided not to get out his crime scene jumpsuit and put it on. He glanced over at Julia Brasher, who was now watching the approaching dog. You guys don't have calls? No, it's slow. Bosch looked down at the mag light in his equipment box. He looked at her and then reached into the trunk and grabbed an oil rag, which he threw over the flashlight. He took out a roll of yellow crime scene tape and the Polaroid camera, then closed the trunk and turned to Brasher. Then do you mind if I borrow your mag? I, um, forgot mine. No problem. She slid the flashlight out of the ring on her equipment belt and handed it to him. The doctor and his dog came up then. Ready? Okay, doctor, I want you to take us up to the spot where you let the dog go and we'll see where she goes. I'm not sure you'll be able to stay with her. I'll worry about that, doctor. This way, then. They walked up the incline toward the small turnaround circle where Wonderland reached a dead end. Brasher made a hand signal to her partner in the car and walked along with them. You know, we had a little excitement up this way a few years ago, Gio said. A man was followed home from the Hollywood Bowl and then killed in a robbery. I remember, Bosch said. He knew the investigation was still open, but didn't mention it. It wasn't his case. Dr. Gio walked with a strong step that belied his age and apparent condition. He let the dog set the pace and soon moved several paces ahead of Bosch and Brasher. So, where were you before? Bosch asked Brasher. What do you mean? You said you were new in Hollywood Division. What about before? Oh, the Academy. He was surprised. He looked over at her, thinking he might need to reassess his age estimate. She nodded and said, I know. I'm old. Bosch got embarrassed. No, I wasn't saying that. I just thought that you'd been somewhere else. You don't seem like a rookie. I didn't go in until I was 34. Really? Wow. Yeah. Got the bug a little late. What were you doing before? Oh, a bunch of different things. Travel, mostly. Took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do. And you want to know what I want to do the most? Bosch looked at her. What? What you do? Homicide. He didn't know what to say, whether to encourage her or dissuade her. Well, good luck, he said. I mean, don't you just find it to be the most fulfilling job ever? Look at what you do. You take the most evil people out of the mix. The mix? Society. Yeah, I guess so. When we get lucky. They caught up to Dr. Gio, who had stopped with the dog at the turnaround circle. This the place? Yes. I let her go here. She went up through there. 
He pointed to an empty and overgrown lot that started level with the street, but then quickly rose into a steep incline toward the crest of the hills. There was a large concrete drainage culvert, which explained why the lot had never been built on. It was city property, used to funnel stormwater runoff away from the homes on the street. Many of the streets in the canyon were former creek and riverbeds. When it rained, they would return to their original purpose, if not for the drainage system. Are you going up there? the doctor asked. I'm going to try. I'll go with you, Brasher said. Bosch looked at her and then turned at the sound of a car. It was the patrol car. It pulled up and Edgewood put down the window. We got a hot shot, partner. Double D. He nodded toward the empty passenger seat. Brasher frowned and looked at Bosch. I hate domestic disputes. Bosch smiled. He hated them too, especially when they turned into homicides. Sorry about that. Well, maybe next time. She started around the front of the car. Here, Bosch said, holding out the mag light. I've got an extra in the car, she said. You can just get that back to me. You sure? He was tempted to ask for a phone number, but didn't. I'm sure. Good luck. You too. Be careful. She smiled at him and then hurried around the front of the car. She got in and the car pulled away. Bosch turned his attention back to Gio and the dog. An attractive woman, Gio said. Bosch ignored it, wondering if the doctor had made the comment based on seeing Bosch's reaction to Brasher. He hoped he hadn't been that obvious. Okay, doctor, he said. Let the dog go and I'll try to keep up. Gio unhooked the leash while patting the dog's chest. Go get the bone, girl. Get a bone. Go. The dog took off into the lot and was gone from sight before Bosch had taken a step. He almost laughed. Well, I guess you were right about that, Doc. He turned to make sure the patrol car was gone and Brasher hadn't seen the dog take off. You want me to whistle? Nah. I'll just go in and take a look around, see if I can catch up to her. He turned the flashlight on. Chapter 3 The woods were dark long before the sun disappeared. The overhead canopy created by a tall stand of Monterey pines knocked down most of the light before it got to the ground. Bosch used the flashlight and made his way up the hillside in the direction in which he had heard the dog moving through the brush. It was slow moving and hard work. The ground contained a foot-thick layer of pine needles that gave way often beneath Bosch's boots as he tried for purchase on the incline. Soon his hands were sticky with sap from grabbing branches to keep himself upright. It took him nearly ten minutes to go thirty yards up the hillside. Then the ground started to level off, and the light got better as the tall trees thinned. Bosch looked around for the dog but didn't see her. He called down to the street, though he could no longer see it or Dr. Gio. Dr. Gio! Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Whistle for your dog. He then heard a three-part whistle. It was distinct but very low having the same trouble getting through the trees and underbrush as the sunlight had. Bosch tried to repeat it, and after a few tries thought he had it right, but the dog didn't come. Bosch pressed on, staying on the level ground because he believed that if someone was going to bury or abandon a body, then it would be done on even ground as opposed to the steep slope. Following a path of least resistance, he moved into a stand of acacia trees and here he immediately came upon a spot where the earth had recently been disturbed. It had been overturned, as if a tool or an animal had been randomly rooting in the soil. He used his foot to push some of the dirt and twigs aside, and then realized they weren't twigs. He dropped to his knees and used the light to study the short brown bones scattered over a square foot of dirt. 
He believed he was looking at the disjointed fingers of a hand, a small hand, a child's hand. Bosch stood up. He realized that his interest in Julia Brasher had distracted him. He had brought no means with him for collecting the bones. Picking them up and carrying them down the hill would violate every tenet of evidence collection. The Polaroid camera hung on a shoelace around his neck. He raised it now and took a close-up shot of the bones. He then stepped back and took a wider shot of the spot beneath the acacia trees. In the distance, he heard Dr. Guillaume's weak whistle. Bosch went to work with the yellow plastic crime scene tape. He tied a short length of it around the trunk of one of the acacia trees and then strung a boundary around the trees. Thinking about how he would work the case the following morning, he stepped out of the cover of the acacia trees and looked for something to use as an aerial marker. He found a nearby growth of sagebrush. He wrapped the crime scene tape around and over the top of the bush several times. When he was finished, it was almost dark. He took another cursory look around the area, but knew that a flashlight search was useless and the ground would need to be exhaustively covered in the morning. Using a small penknife attached to his keychain, he began cutting four-foot lengths of the crime scene tape off the roll. Making his way back down the hill, he tied the strips off at intervals on tree branches and bushes. He heard voices as he got closer to the street and used them to maintain his direction. At one point on the incline, the soft ground suddenly gave way and he fell, tumbling hard into the base of a pine tree. The tree impacted his midsection, tearing his shirt and badly scratching his side. Bosch didn't move for several seconds. He thought he might have cracked his ribs on the right side. His breathing was difficult and painful. He groaned loudly and slowly pulled himself up on the tree trunk so that he could continue to follow the voices. He soon came back down into the street, where Dr. Gio was waiting with his dog and another man. The two men looked shocked when they saw the blood on Bosch's shirt. Oh my, what happened? Gio cried out. Nothing. I fell. Your shirt is... There's blood. Comes with a job. Let me look at your chest. The doctor moved in to look, but Bosch held his hands up. I'm okay. Who was this? The other man answered. I'm Victor Ulrich. I live there. He pointed to the house next to the lot. Bosch nodded. I just came out to see what was going on. Well, nothing is going on at the moment. But there is a crime scene up there. Or there will be. We probably won't be back to work it until tomorrow morning. But I need both you men to keep clear of it and not to tell anybody about this. All right? Both of the neighbors nodded. And doctor, don't let your dog off the leash for a few days. I need to go back down to my car to make a phone call. Mr. Ulrich, I'm sure we will want to talk to you tomorrow. Will you be around? Sure. Anytime. I work at home. Doing what? Writing. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Bosch headed back down the street with Gio and the dog. You really need me to take a look at your injury, Gio insisted. It'll be fine. Bosch glanced to his left and thought he saw a curtain quickly close behind a window of the house they were passing. The way you are holding yourself when you walk. You've damaged a rib, Gio said. Maybe you've broken it. Maybe more than one. Bosch thought of the small, thin bones he had just seen beneath the acacia trees. There's nothing you can do for a rib, broken or not, he said. I can tape it. You'll breathe a hell of a lot easier. I can also take care of that wound. Bosch relented. Okay, Doc, you get out your black bag. I'm going to get my other shirt. Inside Gio's house, a few minutes later, the doctor cleaned the deep scratch on the side of Bosch's chest and taped his ribs. It did feel better, but it still hurt. Gio said he could no longer write a prescription, but suggested Bosch not take anything more powerful than aspirin anyway. 
Bosch remembered that he had a prescription bottle with some Vicodin tablets left over from when he'd had a wisdom tooth removed a few months earlier. They would smooth out the pain, if he wanted to go that way. I'll be fine, Bosch said. Thanks for fixing me up. Don't mention it. Bosch pulled on his good shirt and watched Gio as he closed up his first aid kit. He wondered how long it had been since the doctor had used his skills on a patient. How long have you been retired, he asked. Twelve years next month. You miss it? Gio turned from the first aid kit and looked at him. The tremor was gone. Every day. I don't miss the actual work. You know, the cases. But it was a job that made a difference. I miss that. Bosch thought about how Julia Brasher had described homicide work earlier. He nodded that he understood what Gio was saying. You said there was a crime scene up there? the doctor asked. Yes. I found more bones. I've got to make a call. See what we're going to do. Can I borrow your phone? I don't think my cell will work around here. No, they never do in the canyon. Use the phone on the desk there and I'll give you some privacy. He headed out, carrying the first aid kit with him. Bosch went behind the desk and sat down. The dog was on the ground next to the chair. The animal looked up and seemed startled when she saw Bosch in the master's spot. Calamity, he said. I think you lived up to your name today, girl. Bosch reached down and rubbed the scruff of the dog's neck. The dog growled, and he quickly took his hand away, wondering if it was the dog's training or something about himself that had caused the hostile response. He picked up the phone and called the home of his supervisor, Lieutenant Grace Billets. He explained what had happened on Wonderland Avenue and his findings up on the hill. Harry, how old do these bones look? Billets asked. Bosch looked at the Polaroid he had taken of the small bones he had found in the dirt. It was a bad photo, the flash overexposing it because he was too close. I don't know. They look old to me. I'd say we're talking years here. Okay, so whatever's there at the scene isn't fresh. Maybe freshly uncovered, but no. It's been there. That's what I'm saying. So I think we should stick a pin in it and gear up for tomorrow. Whatever's up there on that hill, it's not going anywhere tonight. Yeah, Bosch said. I'm thinking the same thing. She was silent a moment before speaking. These kind of cases, Harry. What? They drain the budget. They drain manpower. And they're the hardest to close, if you can close them. Okay, I'll climb back up there and cover the bones up. I'll tell the doctor to keep his dog on a leash. Come on, Harry, you know what I mean. She exhaled loudly. First day of the year and we're going to start in the hole. Marsh was silent, letting her work through her administrative frustrations. It didn't take long. It was one of the things he liked about her. Okay, anything else happen today? Not too much. Couple suicides, that's it so far. Okay. When are you going to start tomorrow? I'd like to get out there early. I'll make some calls and see what I can get going. And get the bone the dog found confirmed before we start anything. Okay. Let me know. Bosch agreed and hung up the phone. He next called Teresa Corazon, the county medical examiner, at home. Though their relationship outside of work had ended years before and she had moved at least two times since, she had always kept the same number and Bosch knew it by heart. It came in handy now. He explained what he had going and that he needed an official confirmation of the bone as human before he set other things in motion. He also told her that if it was confirmed, he would need an archaeological team to work the crime scene as soon as possible. Corazon put him on hold for almost five minutes. Okay, she said when she came back on the line. I couldn't get Kathy Cole. She's not home. Bosch knew that Cole was the staff archaeologist. 
Her real expertise and reason for her inclusion as a full-time employee was retrieving bones from the body dump sites up in the desert of the North County, which was a weekly occurrence. But Bosch knew she would be called in to handle the search for bones off Wonderland Avenue. So what do you want me to do? I want to get this confirmed tonight. Just hold your horses, Harry. You're always so impatient. You're like a dog with a bone. No pun intended. It's a kid, Teresa. Can we be serious? Just come here. I'll look at this bone. And what about tomorrow? I'll get things in motion. I left a message for Kathy, and as soon as we hang up here, I'll call the office and have her paged. She'll head up the dig as soon as the sun is up and we can get in there. Once the bones are recovered, there is a forensic anthropologist at UCLA we have on retainer, and I can bring him in if he's in town. And I'll be there myself. Are you satisfied? This last part gave Bosch pause. Teresa, he finally said, I want to try to keep this as low profile as I can for as long as I can. And what are you implying? that I'm not sure that the medical examiner for Los Angeles County needs to be there, and that I haven't seen you at a crime scene without a cameraman in tow for a long time. Harry, he's a private videographer, okay? The film he takes is for future use by me and controlled solely by me. It doesn't end up on the 6 o'clock news. Whatever. I just think we need to avoid any complications on this one. It's a child case. You know how they get. Just get over here with that bone. I'm leaving in an hour. She abruptly hung up. Bosch wished he had been a little more politic with Corazon, but was glad he'd made his point. Corazon was a personality, regularly appearing on court TV and network shows as a forensic expert. She had also taken to having a cameraman follow her so that her cases could be turned into documentaries for broadcast on any of the cop and legal shows on the vast cable and satellite spectrum. He could not and would not let her goals as a celebrity coroner interfere with his goals as an investigator of what might be the homicide of a child. He decided he'd make the calls to the department's special services and canine units after he got confirmation on the bone. He got up and left the room, looking for Gio. The doctor was in the kitchen, sitting at a small table and writing in a spiral-bound notebook. He looked up at Bosch. Just writing a few notes on your treatment. I've kept notes on every patient I've ever treated. Bosch just nodded, even though he thought it was odd for Gio to be writing about him. I'm going to go, doctor. We'll be back tomorrow. In force, I'd expect. We might want to use your dog again. Will you be here? I'll be here and be glad to help. How are the ribs? They hurt. Only when you breathe, right? That'll last about a week. Thanks for taking care of me. You don't need that shoebox back, do you? No, I wouldn't want that back now. Bosch turned to head toward the front door but then turned back to Gio. Doctor, do you live alone here? I do now. My wife died two years ago, a month before our 50th anniversary. I'm sorry. Gio nodded and said, My daughter has her own family up in Seattle. I see them on special occasions. Marsh felt like asking why only on special occasions, but didn't. He thanked the man again and left. Driving out of the canyon and toward Teresa Corazon's place in Hancock Park, he kept his hand on the shoebox so that it would not be jostled or slide off the seat. He felt a deep sense of dread rising from within. He knew it was because fate had certainly not smiled on him this day. He had caught the worst kind of case there was to catch, a child case. Child cases haunted you. They hollowed you out and scarred you. There was no bulletproof vest thick enough to stop you from being pierced. Child cases left you knowing the world was full of lost light. Chapter 4 Teresa Corazon lived in a Mediterranean-style mansion with a stone turnaround circle complete with koi pond in front. 
Eight years earlier, when Bosch had shared a brief relationship with her, she had lived in a one-bedroom condominium. The riches of television and celebrity had paid for the house and the lifestyle that came with it. She was not even remotely like the woman who used to show up at the house unannounced at midnight with a cheap bottle of red wine from Trader Joe's and a video of her favorite movie to watch. The woman who was unabashedly ambitious but not yet skilled at using her position to enrich herself. Bosch knew he now served as a reminder of what she had been and what she had lost in order to gain all that she had. It was no wonder that their interactions were now few and far between, but as tense as a visit to the dentist when they were unavoidable. He parked on the circle and got out with the shoebox and the Polaroids. He looked into the pond as he came around the car and could see the dark shapes of the fish moving below the surface. He smiled, thinking about the movie Chinatown and how often they had watched it the year they were together. He remembered how much she enjoyed the portrayal of the coroner. He wore a black butcher's apron and ate a sandwich while examining a body. Bosch doubted she had the same sense of humor about things anymore. The light hanging over the heavy wood door to the house went on, and Corazon opened it before he got there. She was wearing black slacks and a cream-colored blouse. She looked past him at the slick back he had been driving. Let's make this quick, before that car drips oil on my stones. Hello to you too, Teresa. That's it? She pointed at the shoebox. This is it. He handed her the Polaroids and started taking the lid off the box. It was clear she was not asking him in for a glass of New Year's champagne. You want to do this right here? I don't have a lot of time. I thought you'd be here sooner. What moron took these? That would be me. I can't tell anything from these. Do you have a glove? Bosch pulled a latex glove out of his coat pocket and handed it to her. He took the photos back and put them in an inside pocket of his jacket. She expertly snapped the glove on and reached into the open box. She held the bone up and turned it in the light. He was silent. He could smell her perfume. It was strong, as usual. A holdover from her days when she spent most of her time in autopsy suites. After a five-second examination, she put the bone back down in the box. Human. You sure? She looked up at him with a glare as she snapped off the glove. It's the humerus. The upper arm. I'd say a child of about ten. You may no longer respect my skills, Harry, but I do still have them. She dropped the glove into the box on top of the bone. Bosch could roll with all the verbal sparring from her, but it bothered him that she did that with the glove, dropping it on the child's bone like that. He reached into the box and took the glove out. He remembered something and held the glove back out to her. The man whose dog found this said there was a fracture on the bone. A healed fracture. Do you want to take a look and see if you... No, I'm late for an engagement. What you need to know right now is if it is human. You now have that confirmation. Further examination will come later under proper settings at the medical examiner's office. Now I really have to go. I'll be there tomorrow morning. Bosch held her eyes for a long moment. Sure, Teresa. Have a good time tonight. She broke off the stair and folded her arms across her chest. He carefully put the top back on the shoebox, nodded to her, and headed back to his car. He heard the heavy door close behind him. Thinking of the movie again as he passed the koi pond, he spoke the film's final line quietly to himself. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. He got in the car and drove home, his hand holding the shoebox secure on the seat next to him. Chapter 5 By nine o'clock the next morning, the end of Wonderland Avenue was a law enforcement encampment, and at its center was Harry Bosch. He directed teams from Patrol, K-9, the Scientific Investigation Division, the Medical Examiner's Office, and the Special Services Unit. 
A department helicopter circled above, and a dozen police academy cadets milled about, waiting for orders. Earlier, the aerial unit had locked in on the sagebrush Bosch had wrapped in yellow crime scene tape and used it as a base point to determine that Wonderland offered the closest access to the spot where Bosch had found the bones. The special services unit then swung into action. Following the trail of crime scene tape up the hillside, the six-man team hammered and strung together a series of wooden ramps and steps with rope guidelines that led up the hillside to the bones. Accessing and exiting the site would now be much easier than it had been for Bosch the evening before. It was impossible to keep such a nest of police activity quiet. Also, by 9 a.m., the neighborhood had become a media encampment. The media trucks were stacked behind the roadblocks set a half block from the turnaround circle. The reporters were gathering into press conference-sized groups. And no fewer than five news helicopters were circling at an altitude above the department's chopper. It all created a background cacophony that had already resulted in numerous complaints from residents on the street to police administrators at Parker Center downtown. Bosch was getting ready to lead the first group up to the crime scene. He first conferred with Jerry Edgar, who had been apprised of the case the night before. All right, we're going to take the M.E. and S.I.D. up first, he said, pronouncing the acronyms as Emmy and Sid. Then we'll take the cadets and the dogs up. I want you to oversee that part of it. No problem. You see your pal the Emmy's got a damn cameraman with her? Nothing we can do about it at the moment. Let's just hope she gets bored and goes back downtown where she belongs. You know, for all we know, these could be old Indian bones or something. Bosch shook his head. I don't think so. Too shallow. Bosch walked over to the first group. Teresa Corazon, her videographer, and her four-person dig team, which consisted of archaeologist Kathy Cole and three investigators who would do the spade work. The dig team members were dressed in white jumpsuits. Corazon was in an outfit similar to what she was wearing the night before, including shoes with two-inch heels. Also in the group were two criminalists from SID. Bosch signaled the group into a tighter circle so he could speak privately to them and not be overheard by all the others milling about. Okay. We're going to go up and start the documentation and recovery. Once we have all of you in place, we'll bring up the dogs and the cadets to search the adjacent areas and possibly expand the crime scene. You guys? He stopped to reach his hand up to Corazon's cameraman. Turn that off. You can film her, but not me. The man lowered his camera, and Bosch gave Corazon a look, and then continued. You all know what you're doing, so I don't need to brief you. The one thing I do want to say is that it's tough going getting up there even with the ramps and the stairs, so be careful. Hold on to the ropes, watch your footing. We don't want anybody hurt. If you have heavy equipment, break it up and make two or three trips. If you still need help, I'll have the cadets bring it up. Don't worry about time. Worry about safety. All right? Everybody cool? He got simultaneous nods from everybody. Bosch signaled Corazon away from the others and into a private conversation. You're not dressed right, he said. Look, don't you start telling... You want me to take my shirt off so you can see my ribs? The side of my chest looks like blueberry pie because I fell up there last night. Those shoes you've got on aren't going to work. It might look good for the camera, but not... I'm fine. I'll take my chances. Anything else? Bosch shook his head. I warned you, he said. Let's go. He headed toward the ramp and the others followed. Special services had constructed a wooden gateway to be used as a checkpoint. A patrol officer stood there with a clipboard. He took each person's name and affiliation before they were allowed through. Bosch led the way. The climbing was easier than the day before, but his chest burned with pain as he pulled himself along on the rope guides and negotiated the ramps and steps. He said nothing and tried not to show it. When he got to the acacia trees, he signaled the others to hold back while he went under the crime scene tape to check first. He found the area of overturned earth and the small brown bones he had seen the night before. 
they appeared undisturbed. Okay. Come on in here and have a look. The group members came under the tape and stood over the bones in a semicircle. The camera started rolling and Corazon now took charge. All right, the first thing we're going to do is back out and take photos. Then we're going to set up a grid and Dr. Cole will supervise the excavation and recovery. If you find anything, photograph it nine ways from Sunday before you collect it. She turned to one of the investigators. Finch, I want you to handle the sketches. Standard grid, document everything. Don't assume we will be able to rely on photos. Finch nodded. Corazon turned to Bosch. Detective, I think we've got it. The less people in here, the better. Bosch nodded and handed her a two-way radio. I'll be around. If you need me, use the rover. Cell phones don't work up here, but be careful what you say. He pointed up at the sky, where the media helicopters were circling. Speaking of which, Cole said, I think we're going to string a tarp up off these trees so we can have some privacy as well as cut down on the sun glare. Is that okay with you? It's your crime scene now, Bosch said. Run with it. He headed back down the ramp with Edgar behind him. Harry, this could take days, Edgar said. And maybe then some. Well, they're not going to give us days. You know that, right? Right. I mean, these cases. We'll be lucky if we even come up with an ID. Right. Bosch kept moving. When he got down to the street, he saw that Lieutenant Billets was on the scene with her supervisor, Captain Lavallee. Jerry, why don't you go get the cadets ready, Bosch said. Give them the crime scene 101 speech. I'll be over in a minute. Bosch joined Billets and Lavallee and updated them on what was happening, detailing the morning's activities right down to the neighborhood complaints about noise from the hammers, saws, and helicopters. We've got to give something to the media, Lavallee said. Media Relations wants to know if you want them to handle it from downtown or you want to take it here. I don't want to take it. What does Media Relations know about it? Almost nothing. So you have to call them and they'll work up the press release. Captain, I'm kind of busy here. Can I make the time, detective? Keep them off our backs. When Bosch looked away from the captain to the reporters gathered a half block away at the roadblock, he noticed Julia Brasher showing her badge to a patrol officer and being allowed through. She was in street clothes. All right. I'll make the call. He started down the street to Dr. Guillaume's home. He was headed toward Brasher, who smiled at him as she approached. I've got your mag. It's in my car down here. I have to go down to Dr. Guillaume's house anyway. Oh, don't worry about it. That's not why I'm here. She changed direction and continued with Bosch. He looked at her attire. Faded blue jeans and a t-shirt from a 5K charity run. You're not on the clock, are you? No, I work the 3 to 11. I just thought you might need a volunteer. I heard about the Academy call-out. You want to go up there and look for bones, huh? I want to learn. Bosch nodded. They walked up the path to Gio's door. It opened before they got there, and the doctor invited them in. Bosch asked if he could use the phone in his office again, and Gio showed him the way, even though he didn't have to. Bosch sat down behind the desk. How are the ribs? the doctor asked. Fine. Brasher raised her eyebrows, and Bosch picked up on it. Had a little accident when I was up there last night. What happened? Oh, I was just sort of minding my own business when a tree trunk suddenly attacked me for no reason. She grimaced and somehow managed to smile at the same time. Bosch dialed media relations from memory and told an officer about the case in very general terms. At one point, he put his hand over the phone and asked Gio if he wanted his name put in the press release. The doctor declined. A few minutes later, Bosch was finished and hung up. He looked at Gio. Once we clear the scene in a few days, the reporters will probably stick around. They'll be looking for the dog that found the bone, is my guess. So if you want to stay out of it, keep Calamity off the street or they'll put two and two together. 
Good advice, Gio said. And you might want to call your neighbor, Mr. Ulrich, and tell him not to mention it to any reporters either. On the way out of the house, Bosch asked Brasher if she wanted her flashlight, and she said she didn't want to bother carrying it while she was helping search the hillside. Get it to me whenever, she said. Bosch liked the answer. It meant he would get at least one more chance to see her. Back at the circle, Bosch found Edgar lecturing the academy cadets. The golden rule of the crime scene people is don't touch anything until it's been studied, photographed, and charted. Bosch walked into the circle. Okay, we ready? They're ready, Edgar said. He nodded toward two of the cadets who were holding metal detectors. I borrowed those from Sid. Bosch nodded and gave the cadets and Brasher the same safety speech he had given the forensic crew. They then headed up to the crime scene, Bosch introducing Brasher to Edgar, and then letting his partner lead the way through the checkpoint. He took up the rear, walking behind Brasher. We'll see if you want to be a homicide detective by the end of the day, he said. Anything's got to be better than chasing the radio and washing puke out of the back of your car at the end of every shift. I remember those days. Bosch and Edgar spread the twelve cadets and Brasher out in the areas adjacent to the stand of acacia trees and had them begin conducting side-by-side -side searches. Bosch then went down and brought up the two canine teams to supplement the search. Once things were underway, he left Edgar with the cadets and went back to the acacias to see what progress had been made. He found Cole sitting on an equipment crate and supervising the placement of wooden stakes into the ground so that strings could be used to set the excavation grid. Bosch had worked one prior case with Cole and knew she was very thorough and good at what she did. She was in her late thirties with a tennis player's build and tan. Bosch had once run across her at a city park where she was playing tennis with a twin sister. They had drawn a crowd. It looked like somebody hitting the ball off a mirrored wall. Cole's straight blonde hair fell forward and hit her eyes as she looked down at the oversized clipboard on her lap. She was making notations on a piece of paper with a grid already printed on it. Bosch looked over her shoulder at the chart. Cole was labeling the individual blocks with letters of the alphabet as the corresponding stakes were placed in the ground. At the top of the page she had written, City of Bones. Bosch reached down and tapped the chart where she had written the caption. Why do you call it that? She shrugged her shoulders. Because we're setting out the streets and the blocks of what will become a city to us, she said, running her fingers over some of the lines on the chart in illustration. At least while we're working here, it will feel like it. Our little city. Bosch nodded. And every murder is the tale of a city, he said. Cole looked up at him. Who said that? I don't know. Somebody did. He turned his attention to Corazon, who was squatting over the small bones on the surface of the soil, studying them while the lens of the video camera studied her. He was thinking of something to say about it when his rover was keyed and he took it off his belt. Bosh here. Edgar, better come on back over here, Harry. We already have something. Right. Edgar was standing in an almost level spot in the brush about forty yards from the acacia trees. A half dozen of the cadets and Brasher had formed a circle and were looking down at something in the two-foot-high brush. The police chopper was circling in a tighter circle above. Bosch got to the circle and looked down. It was a child's skull, partially submerged in the soil, its whole eyes staring up at him. Nobody touched it, Edgar said. Brasher here found it. Bosch glanced at her, and the humor she seemed to carry in her eyes and mouth were gone. He looked back at the skull and pulled the radio off his belt. Dr. Corazon, he said into it. It was a long moment before her voice came back. Yes, I'm here. What is it? We are going to have to widen the crime scene. Chapter 6 
with Bosch acting as the general overseeing the small army that worked the expanded crime scene. The day progressed well. The bones came out of the ground in the hillside brush easily, as if they had been impatiently waiting a very long time. By noon, three blocks in the grid were being actively excavated by Kathy Cole's team, and dozens of bones emerged from the dark soil. Like their archaeological counterparts who unearthed the artifacts of the ancients, the dig team used small tools and brushes to bring these bones gently to light. They also used metal detectors and vapor probes. The process was painstaking, yet it was moving at an even faster pace than Bosch had hoped for. The finding of the skull had set this pace and brought a sense of urgency to the entire operation. It was removed from its location first, and the field examination conducted on camera by Teresa Corazon found fracture lines and surgical scarring. The record of surgery assured them they were dealing with relatively contemporary bones. The fractures in and of themselves were not definitive in the indication of homicide, but when added to the evidence that the body had been buried, they gave a clear sense that the tale of a murder was unfolding. By two o'clock, when the hillside crews broke for lunch, almost half of the skeleton had already been recovered from the grid. A small scattering of other bones had been found in the nearby brush by the cadets. Additionally, Cole's crew had unearthed fragments of deteriorated clothing and a canvas backpack of a size most likely used by a child. The bones came down the hillside in square wooden boxes with rope handles attached on the sides. By lunch, a forensic anthropologist was examining three boxes of bones in the medical examiner's office. The clothing, most of it rotten and unrecognizable, and the backpack, which had been left unopened, were transported to LAPD's Scientific Investigation Division lab for the same scrutiny. A metal detector scan of the search grid produced a single coin, a quarter minted in 1975, found at the same depth as the bones and approximately two inches from the left wing of the pelvis. It was assumed that the quarter had been in the left front pocket of pants that had rotted away along with the body's tissue. To Bosch, the coin gave one of the key parameters of time of death. If the assumption that the coin had been buried with the body was correct, the death could not have happened before 1975. Patrol had arranged for two construction site lunch wagons to come to the circle to feed the small army working the crime scene. Lunch was late and people were hungry. One truck served hot lunches while the other served sandwiches. Bosch waited at the end of the line for the sandwich truck with Julia Brasher. The line was moving slowly, but he didn't mind. They mostly talked about the investigation on the hillside and gossiped about department brass. It was get-to-know-you conversation. Bosch was attracted to her, and the more he heard her talk about her experiences as a rookie and a female in the department, the more he was intrigued by her. She had a mixture of excitement and awe and cynicism about the job that Bosch remembered clearly from his own early days on the job. When he was about six people from the order window of the lunch truck, Bosch heard someone in the truck asking one of the cadets questions about the investigation. Are they bones from a bunch of different people? I don't know, man. We just look for them, that's all. Bosch studied the man who would ask the question. Were they all cut up? Hard to tell. Bosch broke from his spot with Brasher and walked to the back of the truck. He looked through the open door at the back and saw three men wearing aprons working in the truck or appearing to work. They did not notice Bosch watching. Two of the men were making sandwiches and filling orders. The man in the middle, the one who had asked the cadet questions, was moving his arms on the prep counter below the order window. He wasn't making anything, but from outside the truck it would appear he was creating a sandwich. As Bosch watched, he saw the man to the right slice a sandwich in half, put it on a paper plate, and slide it to the man in the middle. The middle man then held it out through the window to the cadet who ordered it. Bosch noticed that while the two real sandwich makers wore jeans and t-shirts beneath their aprons, 
The man in the middle had on cuffed slacks and a shirt with a button-down collar. Protruding from the back pocket of his pants was a notebook, the long, thin kind that Bosch knew reporters used. Bosch stuck his head in the door and looked around. On a shelf next to the doorway, he saw a sport jacket rolled into a ball. He grabbed it and stepped back away from the door. He went through the pockets of the jacket and found an LAPD-issued press pass on a neck chain. It had a picture of the middle sandwich maker on it. His name was Victor Frisbee, and he worked at the New Times. Holding the jacket to the side of the door, Bosch rapped on the outside of the truck, and when all three men turned to look, he signaled Frisbee over. The reporter pointed to his chest with a, Who, me, look, and Bosch nodded. Frisbee came to the door and bent down. Yes? Bosch reached up and grabbed him by the top bib on the apron and jerked him out of the truck. Frisbee landed on his feet, but had to run several steps to stop from falling. As he turned around to protest, Bosch hit him in the chest with a balled-up jacket. Two patrol officers, they always ate first, were dumping paper plates into a nearby trash can. Bosch signaled them over. Take him back to the perimeter. If you see him crossing it again, arrest him. Each officer took Frisbee by an arm and started marching him down the street to the barricades. Frisbee started protesting, his face growing as red as a Coke can. But the patrol officers ignored everything about him but his arms and marched him toward his humiliation in front of the other reporters. Bosch watched for a moment and then took the press card out of his back pocket and dropped it in the trash can. He rejoined Brasher in line. Now they were just two cadets away from being served. What was that all about? Brasher asked. Health code violation. Didn't wash his hands. She started laughing. I'm serious. The law is the law as far as I'm concerned. God, I hope I get my sandwich before you see a roach or something and close the whole thing down. Don't worry. I think I just got rid of the roach. Ten minutes later, after Bosch lectured the truck owner about smuggling the media into the crime scene, they took their sandwiches and drinks to one of the picnic tables special services had set up on the circle. It was a table that had been reserved for the investigative team, but Bosch didn't mind allowing Brasher to sit there. Edgar was there along with Cole and one of the diggers from her crew. Bosch introduced Brasher to those who didn't know her and mentioned she had taken the initial call on the case and helped him the night before. So, where's the boss? Bosch asked Cole. Oh, she already ate. I think she went off to tape an interview with herself or something. Bosch smiled and nodded. I think I'm going to get seconds, Edgar said as he climbed over the bench and left with his plate. Bosch bit into his BLT and savored its taste. He was starved. He wasn't planning to do anything but eat and rest during the break, but Cole asked if it was all right if she gave him some of her initial conclusions on the excavation. Bosch had his mouth full. After he swallowed, he asked her to wait until his partner came back. They talked in generalities about the condition of the bones and how Cole believed that the shallow nature of the grave had allowed animals to disinter the remains and scatter the bones. Possibly for years. We're not going to get them all, she said. We won't come close. We're going to quickly reach a point where the expense and the effort won't be worth the return. Edgar returned with another plate of fried chicken. Bosch nodded to Cole who looked down at a notepad she had on the table to her left. She checked some of her notations and started talking. The things I want you to be mindful of are the grave depth and location terrain. I think these are key things. They're going to have to play somehow into who this child was and what happened to him. Him? Bosch asked. The hip spacing and the waistband of the underwear. She explained that included in the rotten and decomposed clothing was the rubber waistband, which was all that was left of the underwear that had been on the body when it was buried. Decomposition fluids from the body had led to the deterioration of the clothing, but the rubber waistband was largely intact and appeared to have come from a style of underwear made for males. 
Okay, Bosch said. You were saying about grave depth? Yes. Well, we think that the hip assembly and lower spinal column were in undisturbed position when we uncovered them. Going on that, we're talking about a grave that wasn't more than six inches to a foot deep. A grave this shallow reflects speed, panic, a host of things indicative of poor planning. But, she held up a finger, by the same token, the location, very remote, very difficult, reflects the opposite. It shows careful planning. So you have some kind of contradiction going on here. The location appears to have been chosen because it was damn hard to get to, yet the burial appears to have been fast and furious. This person was literally just covered with loose topsoil and pine needles. I know pointing all of this out isn't necessarily going to help you catch the bad guy, but I want you to see what I'm seeing here. This contradiction. Bosch nodded. It's all good to know. We'll keep it in mind. Okay, good. The other contradiction, the smaller one, is the backpack. Burying it with the body was a mistake. The body decomposes at a much faster rate than the canvas, so if you get identifiers off the bag or its contents, it becomes a mistake made by the bad guy. Again, poor planning in the midst of good planning. You're smart, detectives. I'm sure you'll figure all this out. She smiled at Bosch and then studied her pad again lifting the top page to look beneath it. I think that's it. Everything else we talked about up at the site. I think things are going very well up there. By the end of the day, we'll have the main grave done. Tomorrow we'll do some sampling in the other grids, but this should probably wrap by tomorrow. Like I said, we're not going to get everything, but we should get enough to do what we need to do. Bosch suddenly thought of Victor Frisbee's question to the cadet at the lunch wagon and realized that the reporter might have been thinking ahead of Bosch. Sampling? You think there's more than one body buried up there? Cole shook her head. I have no indication of that at all. But we should make sure. We'll do some sampling, sink some gas probes. It's routine. The likelihood, especially in light of the shallow grave, is that this is a singular case, but we should be sure about it, as sure as we can be. Bosch nodded. He was glad he had eaten most of his sandwich because he was suddenly not hungry. The prospect of mounting an investigation with multiple victims was daunting. He looked at the others at the table. That doesn't leave this table. I already caught one reporter sniffing around for a serial killer. We don't want media hysteria here. Even if you tell them what we're doing is routine and just to make sure, it'll be the top of the story. All right? Everyone nodded, including Brasher. Bosch was about to say something when there was a loud banging from the row of portable toilets on the special services trailer on the other side of the circle. Someone was inside one of the phone booth-sized bathrooms pounding on its thin aluminum skin. After a moment, Bosch could hear a woman's voice behind the sharp banging. He recognized it and jumped up from the table. Bosch ran across the circle and up the steps to the truck's platform. He quickly determined which toilet the banging was coming from and went to the door. The exterior hasp, used for securing the toilet for transport, had been closed over the loop and a chicken bone had been used to secure it. Hold on! Hold on, Bosch yelled. He tried to pull the bone out, but it was too greasy and slipped from his grip. The pounding and screaming continued. Bosch looked around for a tool of some kind, but didn't see anything. Finally, he took his pistol out of his holster, checked the safety, and used the butt of the weapon to hammer the bone through the hasp, careful all the time to aim the barrel of the gun at a downward angle. When the bone finally popped out, he put the gun away and flipped the hasp open. The door burst outward, and Teresa Corazon charged out, almost knocking him over. He grabbed her to maintain his balance, but she roughly pushed him away. You did that? What? No, I didn't. I was over there the whole... I want to know who did it. Bosch lowered his voice. He knew everyone in the encampment was probably looking at them. The media down the street as well. 
Look, Teresa, come down. It was a joke, okay? Whoever did it, did it as a joke. I know you don't like confined spaces, but they didn't know that. Somebody just wanted to ease the tension around here a little bit, and you just happened to be... It's because they're jealous, that's why. What? Of who I am, what I've done. Bosch was nonplussed by that. Whatever. She headed for the stairs, then abruptly turned around and came back to him. I'm leaving. You happy now? Bosch shook his head. Happy? That has nothing to do with anything here. I'm trying to conduct an investigation, and if you want to know the truth, not having the distraction of you and your cameraman around might be a help. Then you've got it. And you know that phone number you called me on the other night? Bosch nodded. Yeah, what about... Burn it. She walked down the steps, angrily hooked a finger at her cameraman, and headed toward her official car. Bosch watched her go. When he got back to the picnic table, only Brasher and Edgar remained. His partner had reduced his second order of fried chicken to bones. He sat with a satisfied smirk on his face. Bosch dropped the bone he had knocked out of the hasp onto Edgar's plate. That went over real well, he said. He gave Edgar a look that told him he knew he had been the one who did it. But Edgar revealed nothing. The bigger the ego, the harder they fall, Edgar said. I wonder if a cameraman got any of the action on tape. You know, it would have been good to keep her as an ally, Bosch said. To just put up with her so that she was on our side when we needed her. Edgar picked up his plate and struggled to slide his large body out of the picnic table. I'll see you up on the hill, he said. Bosch looked at Brasher. She raised her eyebrows. You mean he was the one who did it? Bosch didn't answer. Chapter 7 The work in the City of Bones lasted only two days. As Cole had predicted, the majority of the pieces of the skeleton had been located and removed from the spot beneath the acacia trees by the end of the first day. Other bones had been found nearby in the brush, in a scatter pattern indicative of disinterment over time by foraging animals. On Friday, the searchers and diggers returned, but a day-long search of the hillside by fresh cadets and further excavation of the main squares of the grid found no more bones. Vapor probes and sample digs in all the remaining squares of the grid turned up no bones or other indications that other bodies had been buried beneath the acacia trees. Cole estimated that 60% of the skeleton had been collected, on her recommendation, and with Teresa Corazon's approval, the excavation and search were suspended pending further developments at dusk on Friday. Bosch had not objected to this. He knew they were facing limited returns for a large amount of effort, and he deferred to the experts. He was also anxious to proceed with the investigation and identification of the bones, elements which were largely stalled as he and Edgar had worked exclusively on Wonderland Avenue during the two days supervising the collection of evidence, canvassing the neighborhood, and putting together the initial reports on the case. It was all necessary work, but Bosch wanted to move on. On Saturday morning, he and Edgar met in the lobby of the medical examiner's office and told the receptionist they had an appointment with Dr. William Golliher, the forensic anthropologist on retainer from UCLA. He's waiting for you in sweet A, the receptionist said after making a call to confirm. You know which way that is? Bosch nodded, and they were buzzed through the gate. They took an elevator down to the basement level and were immediately greeted by the smell of the autopsy floor when they stepped out. It was a mixture of chemicals and decay that was unique in the world. Edgar immediately took a paper breathing mask out of a wall dispenser and put it on. Bosch didn't bother. You really ought to, Harry, Edgar said as they walked down the hall. Do you know that all smells are particulate? Bosch looked at him. Thanks for that, Jerry. They had to stop in the hallway as a gurney was pushed out of an autopsy suite. There was a body on it, wrapped in plastic. Harry, you ever notice that they wrap them up the same way they do the burritos at Taco Bell? Bosch nodded at the man pushing the gurney. 
That's why I don't eat burritos. Really? Marsh moved on down the hall without answering. Suite A was an autopsy room reserved for Teresa Corazon, for the infrequent times she actually left her administrative duties as chief medical examiner and performed an autopsy. Because the case had initially garnered her hands-on attention, she had apparently authorized Gallaher to use her suite. Corazon had not returned to the crime scene on Wonderland Avenue after the portable toilet incident. They pushed through the double doors of the suite and were met by a man in blue jeans and a Hawaiian shirt. Please, call me Bill, Gallaher said. I guess it's been a long two days. Say that again, Edgar said. Gallaher nodded in a friendly manner. He was about fifty with dark hair and eyes and an easy manner. He gestured toward the autopsy table that was in the center of the room. The bones that had been collected from beneath the acacia trees were now spread across the stainless steel surface. Well, let me tell you what's been going on in here, Gallaher said. As the team in the field has been collecting the evidence, I've been here examining the pieces, doing the radiograph work, and generally trying to put the puzzle of all of this together. Bosch stepped over to the stainless steel table. The bones were laid out in place so as to form a partial skeleton. The most obvious pieces missing were the bones of the left arm and leg and the lower jaw. It was presumed that these were the pieces that had long ago been taken and scattered distantly by animals that had rooted in the shallow grave. Each of the bones was marked, the larger pieces with stickers and the smaller ones with string tags. Bosch knew that notations on these markers were codes by which the location of each bone had been charted on the grid Cole had drawn on the first day of the excavation. Bones can tell us much about how a person lived and died, Gallaher said somberly. In cases of child abuse, the bones do not lie. The bones become our final evidence. Bosch looked back at him and realized his eyes were not dark. They actually were blue but they were deeply set and seemed haunted in some way. He was staring past Bosch at the bones on the table. After a moment, he broke from this reverie and looked at Bosch. Let me start by saying that we are learning quite a bit from the recovered artifacts, the anthropologist said. But I have to tell you guys, I've consulted on a lot of cases, but this one blows me away. I was looking at these bones and taking notes, and I looked down, and my notebook was smeared. I was crying, man. I was crying, and I didn't even know it at first. He looked back at the outstretched bones with a look of tenderness and pity. Bosch knew that the anthropologist saw the person who was once there. This one is bad, guys. Real bad. Then give us what you've got so we can go out there and do our job, Bosch said in a voice that sounded like a reverent whisper. Gallaher nodded and reached back to a nearby counter for a spiral notebook. Okay, Gallaher said. Let's start with the basics. Some of this you may already know, but I'm just going to go over all of my findings, if you don't mind. We don't mind, Bosch said. Good. Then here it is. What you have here are the remains of a young male caucasoid. Comparisons to the indices of marish growth standards put the age at approximately ten years old. However, as we will soon discuss, this child was the victim of severe and prolonged physical abuse. Histiologically, victims of chronic abuse often suffer from what is called growth disruption. This abuse-related stunting serves to skew age estimation. What you often get is a skeleton that looks younger than it is. So what I am saying is that this boy looks ten, but is probably twelve or thirteen. Bosch looked over at Edgar. He was standing with his arms folded tightly across his chest, as if bracing for what he knew was ahead. Bosch took a notebook out of his jacket pocket and started writing notes in shorthand. Time of death, Gallaher said. This is tough. Radiological testing is far from exact in this regard, 
We have the coin which gives us the early marker of 1975. That helps us. What I am estimating is that this kid has been in the ground anywhere from 20 to 25 years. I am comfortable with that, and there is some surgical evidence we can talk about in a few minutes that adds support to that estimation. So we've got a 10- to 13-year-old kid killed 20 to 25 years ago, Edgar summarized, a note of frustration in his voice. I know I'm giving you a wide set of parameters, Detective, Gallagher said, but at the moment it's the best that science can do for you. Not your fault, Doc. Bosch wrote it all down. Despite the wide spread of the estimation, it was still vitally important to set a time frame for the investigation. Gallagher's estimation put the time of death into the late 70s to early 80s. Bosch momentarily thought of Laurel Canyon in that time frame. It had been a rustic, funky enclave, part bohemian and part upscale, with cocaine dealers and users, porno purveyors and burned-out rock-and-roll hedonists on almost every street. Could the murder of a child have been part of that mix? Cause of death, Gallagher said. Tell you what, let's get to cause of death last. I want to start with the extremities and the torso, give you guys an idea of what this boy endured in his short lifetime. His eyes locked on Bosch's for a moment before returning to the bones. Bosch breathed in deeply, producing a sharp pain from his damaged ribs. He knew his fear from the moment he had looked down at the small bones on the hillside was now going to be realized. He instinctively knew all along that it would come to this, that a story of horror would emerge from the overturned soil. He started scribbling on the pad, running the ballpoint deep into the paper as Gallagher continued. First of all, we only have maybe 60% of the bones here, he said. But even still, we have incontrovertible evidence of tremendous skeletal trauma and chronic abuse. I don't know what your level of anthropological expertise is, but I'm going to assume much of this will be new to you. I'm going to give you the basics. Bones heal themselves, gentlemen. And it is through the study of bone regeneration that we can establish a history of abuse. On these bones, there are multiple lesions in different stages of healing. There are fractures, old and new. We only have two of the four extremities, but both of these show multiple instances of trauma. In short, this boy spent pretty much most of his life either healing or being hurt. Bosch looked down at the pad and pen clutched tightly in his hands. His hands were turning white. You'll be getting a written report from me by Monday, but for now, if you want a number, I will tell you that I found 44 distinct locations indicating separate trauma in various stages of healing. And these were just his bones, detectives. It doesn't cover the damage that could have been inflicted on vital organs and the tissue. But it is, without a doubt, that this boy lived probably day in and day out with a lot of pain. Bosch wrote the number down on the pad. It seemed like a meaningless gesture. Primarily, the injuries I have cataloged can be noted on the artifacts by subperiosteal lesions, Gallagher said. These lesions are thin layers of new bone that grow beneath the surface in the area of trauma or bleeding. Subperi... How do you spell that? Bosch asked. What does it matter? It will be in the report. Bosch nodded. Take a look at this, Gallagher said. Gallagher went to the x-ray box on the wall and flipped on the light. There was already film on the box. It showed an x-ray of a long, thin bone. He ran his finger along the stem of the bone, pointing out a slight demarcation of color. This is the one femur that was collected, he said. The upper thigh. This line here, where the color changes is one of the lesions. This means that this area, the boy's upper leg, had suffered a pretty strong blow in the weeks before his death. A crushing blow. It did not break the bone, but it damaged it. 
This kind of injury would no doubt have caused surface bruising, and I think affected the boy's walk. What I am telling you is that it could not have gone unnoticed. Bosch moved forward to study the X-ray. Edgar stayed back. When he was finished, Gallagher removed the X-ray and put up three more, covering the entire light box. We also have periosteal shearing on both of the limbs present. This is the stripping of the bone surface, primarily seen in child abuse cases when the limb is struck violently by the adult hand or other instrument. Recovery patterns on these bones show that this particular type of trauma occurred repeatedly, and over years to this child. Gallagher paused to look at his notes. Then he glanced at the bones on the table. He picked up the upper arm bone and held it up while he referred to his notes and spoke. Bosch noticed he wore no gloves. The humerus, Gallagher said. The right humerus shows two separate and healed fractures. The breaks are longitudinal. This tells us the fractures are the result of the twisting of the arm with great force. It happened to him once, and then it happened again. He put the bone down and picked up one of the lower arm bones. The ulna shows a healed latitudinal fracture. The break caused a slight deviation in the attitude of the bone. This was because the bone was allowed to heal in place after the injury. You mean it wasn't set? Edgar asked. He wasn't taken to a doctor or an emergency room? Exactly. This kind of injury, though commonly accidental and treated every day in every emergency room, can also be a defensive injury. You hold your arm up to ward off an attack and take the blow across the forearm. The fracture occurs. Because of the lack of indication of medical attention paid to this injury, my supposition is that this was not an accidental injury and was part of the abuse pattern. Gallagher gently returned the bone to its spot and then leaned over the examination table to look down at the rib cage. Many of the rib bones had been detached and were lying separated on the table. The ribs, Gallagher said. Nearly two dozen fractures in various stages of healing. A healed fracture on rib 12, I believe, may date to when the boy was only two or three. Rib 9 shows a callus indicative of trauma only a few weeks old at the time of death. The fractures are primarily consolidated near the angles. In infants, this is indicative of violent shaking. In older children, this is usually indicative of blows to the back. Bosch thought of the pain he was in of how he had been unable to sleep well because of the injury to his ribs. He thought of a young boy living with that kind of pain year in and year out. I gotta go wash my face, he suddenly said. You can continue. He walked to the door, shoving his notebook and pen into Edgar's hands. In the hallway, he turned right. He knew the layout of the autopsy floor and knew there were restrooms around the next turn of the corridor. He entered the restroom and went right to an open stall. He felt nauseous and waited, but nothing happened. After a long moment, it passed. Bosch came out of the stall just as the door opened from the hallway and Teresa Corazon's cameraman walked in. They looked warily at each other for a moment. Get out of here, Bosch said. Come back later. The man silently turned and walked out. Bosch walked to the sink and looked at himself in the mirror. His face was red. He bent down and used his hands to cup cold water against his face and eyes. He thought about baptisms and second chances. Of renewal. He raised his face until he was looking at himself again. I'm going to get this guy. He almost said it out loud. When Bosch returned to Suite A, all eyes were on him. Edgar gave him his notebook and pen back, and Gallagher asked if he was all right. Yeah, fine, he said. If it is any help to you, Gallagher said. I've consulted on cases all over the world. Chile, Kosovo, even the World Trade Center. And this case... 
He shook his head. It's hard to comprehend, he added. It's one of those where you have to think that maybe the boy was better off leaving this world. That is, if you believe in a god and a better place than this. Bosch walked over to a counter and pulled a paper towel out of a dispenser. He started wiping his face again. And what if you don't? Gulliher walked over to him. Well, you see, this is why you must believe, he said. If this boy did not go from this world to a higher plane, to something better than, then I think we're all lost. Did that work for you when you were picking through the bones at the World Trade Center? Bosch immediately regretted saying something so harsh, but Gulliher seemed unfazed. He spoke before Bosch could apologize. Yes, it did, he said. My faith was not shaken by the horror or the unfairness of so much death. In many ways it became stronger. It brought me through it. Bosch nodded and threw the towel into a trash can with a foot pedal device for opening it. It closed with an echoing slam when he took his foot off the pedal. What about cause of death, he said, getting back to the case. We can jump ahead, detective, Gulliher said. All injuries, discussed and not discussed here, will be outlined in my report. He went back to the table and picked up the skull. He brought it over to Bosch, holding it in one hand close to his chest. In the skull, we have the bad and possibly the good, Gulliher said. The skull exhibits three distinct cranial fractures showing mixed stages of healing. Here is the first. He pointed to an area at the lower rear of the skull. This fracture is small and healed. You can see here that the lesions are completely consolidated. Then, next we have this more traumatic injury on the right parietal extending to the frontal. This injury required surgery, most likely for a subdural hematoma. He outlined the injury area with a finger, circling the forward top of the skull. He then pointed to five small and smooth holes which were linked by a circular pattern on the skull. This is a trephine pattern. A trephine is a medical saw used to open the skull for surgery or to relieve pressure from brain swelling. In this case, it was probably swelling due to the hematoma. Now the fracture itself and the surgical scar show the beginning of bridging across the lesions. New bone. I would say this injury and subsequent surgery occurred approximately six months prior to the boy's death. It's not the injury causing death, Bosch asked. No, this is. Gulliher turned the skull one more time and showed them another fracture. This one in the lower left rear of the skull. Tight spider web fracture with no bridging, no consolidation. This injury occurred at the time of death. The tightness of the fracture indicates a blow with tremendous force from a very hard object. A baseball bat, perhaps. Something like that. Bosch nodded and stared down at the skull. Gulliher had turned it so that its hollow eyes were focused on Bosch. There are other injuries to the head, but not of a fatal nature. The nose bones and the zygomatic process show new bone formation following trauma. Gulliher returned to the autopsy table and gently placed the skull down. I don't think I need to summarize for you, detectives. But in short, somebody beat the shit out of this boy on a regular basis. Eventually, they went too far. It will all be in the report to you. He turned from the autopsy table and looked at them. There is a glimmer of light in all of this, you know. Something that might help you. The surgery, Bosch said. Exactly. Opening a skull is a very serious operation. There will be records somewhere. There had to be follow-up. The roundel is held back in place with metal clips after surgery. There were none found with the skull. I would assume they were removed in a second procedure. Again, there will be records. 
The surgical scar also helps us date the bones. The trefine holes are too large by today's standards. By the mid-80s, the tools were more advanced than this. Sleeker. The perforations were smaller. I hope this all helps you. Bosch nodded and said, What about the teeth? Anything there? We are missing the lower mandible, Gallagher said. On the upper teeth present, there is no indication of any dental work, despite indication of anti-mortem decay. This in itself is a clue. I think it puts this boy in the lower levels of social classification. He didn't go to the dentist. Edgar had pulled his mask down around his neck. His expression was pained. When this kid was in the hospital with the hematoma, why wouldn't he tell the doctors what was happening to him? What about his teachers, his friends? You know the answers to that as well as me, Detective, Gallagher said. Children are reliant on their parents. They are scared of them and they love them, don't want to lose them. Sometimes there's no explanation for why they don't cry out for help. What about all these fractures and such? Why didn't the doctor see it and do something? That's the irony of what I do. I see the history and tragedy so clearly, but with a living patient it might not be apparent. If the parents came in with a plausible explanation for the boy's injury, what reason would a doctor have to x-ray an arm or a leg or a chest? None. And so the nightmare goes unnoticed. Unsatisfied, Edgar shook his head and walked to the far corner of the room. Anything else, doctor? Bosch asked. Gallagher checked his notes and then folded his arms. That's it on a scientific level. You'll get the report. On a purely personal level, I hope you find the person who did this. They will deserve whatever they get, and then some. Bosch nodded. We'll get him, Edgar said. Don't you worry about that. They walked out of the building and got into Bosch's car. Bosch just sat there for a moment before starting the engine. Finally, he hit the steering wheel hard with the heel of his palm, sending a shock down the injured side of his chest. You know it doesn't make me believe in God like him, Edgar said. It makes me believe in aliens, little green men from outer space. Bosch looked over at him. Edgar was leaning his head against the side window, looking down at the floor of the car. How so? Because a human couldn't have done this to his own kid. A spaceship must have come down and abducted the kid and done all that stuff to him. Only explanation. Yeah. I wish that was on the checklist, Jerry. Then we could all just go home. Bosch put the car into drive. I need a drink. He started driving out of the lot. Not me, man, Edgar said. I just want to go see my kid and hug him until this gets better. They didn't speak again until they got over to Parker Center. Chapter 8 Bosch and Edgar rode the elevator to the fifth floor and went into the SID lab, where they had a meeting set up with Antoine Jesper, the leading criminalist assigned to the Bones case. Jesper met them at the security fence and took them back. He was a young black man with gray eyes and smooth skin. He wore a white lab coat that swayed and flapped with his long strides and always moving arms. This way, guys, he said. I don't have a lot, but what I got is yours. He took them through the main lab, where only a handful of other criminalists were working, and into the drying room, a large climate-controlled space where clothing and other material evidence from cases were spread on stainless steel drying tables and examined. It was the only place that could rival the autopsy floor of the medical examiner's office in the stench of decay. Jesper led them to two tables, where Bosch saw the open backpack and several pieces of clothing blackened with soil and fungus. There was also a plastic sandwich bag filled with an unrecognizable lump of black decay. Water and mud got into the backpack, Jesper said. Bleached in over time, I guess. Jesper took a pen out of the pocket of his lab coat and extended it into a pointer. He used it to help illustrate his commentary. 
We've got your basic backpack containing three sets of clothes and what was probably a sandwich or some kind of food item. More specifically, three t-shirts, three underwear, three sets of socks, and the food item. There was also an envelope, or what was left of an envelope. You don't see that here because Documents has it. But don't get your hopes up, guys. It was in worse shape than that sandwich. If it was a sandwich. Bosch nodded. He made a list of the contents in his notebook. Any identifiers, he asked. Jesper shook his head. No personal identifiers on the clothing or in the bag, he said. But two things to note. First, this shirt here has a brand name identifier, Solid Surf. Says it across the chest. You can't see it now, but I picked it up with the black light. Might help? Might not. If you're not familiar with the term solid surf, I can tell you that it's a skateboarding reference. Got it, Bosch said. Next is the outside flap of the bag. He used his pointer to flip over the flap. Clean this up a little bit and came up with this. Bosch leaned over the table to look. The bag was made of blue canvas. On the flap was a clear demarcation of color forming a large letter B at the center. It looks like there was some kind of adhesive applicate at one time on the bag, Jesper said. It's gone now, and I don't really know if that occurred before or after this thing was put in the ground. My guess is before. It looks like it was peeled off. Bosch stepped back from the table and wrote a few lines in his notebook. He then looked at Jesper. Okay, Antoine, good stuff. Anything else? Not on this stuff. Then let's go to documents. Jesper led the way again through the central lab and then into a sub-lab, where he had to enter a combination into a door lock to enter. The documents lab contained two rows of desks that were all empty. Each desk had a horizontal light box and a magnifying glass mounted on a pivot. Jesper went to the middle desk in the second row. The nameplate on the desk said Bernadette Fournier. Bosch knew her. They had worked a case previously in which a suicide note had been forged. He knew she did good work. Jesper picked up a plastic evidence pouch that was sitting in the middle of the desk. He unzipped it and removed two plastic viewing sleeves. One contained an unfolded envelope that was brown and smeared with black fungus. The other contained a deteriorated rectangular piece of paper that was broken into three parts along the folds and was also grossly discolored by decay and fungus. This is what happens when stuff gets wet, man, Jesper said. It took Bernie all day just to unfold the envelope and separate the letter. As you can see, it came apart at the folds. And as far as whether we'll ever be able to tell what was in the letter, it doesn't look good. Bosch turned on the light box and put the plastic sleeves down on it. He swung the magnifier over and studied the envelope and the letter it had once contained. There was nothing remotely readable on either document. One thing he noted was that it looked like there was no stamp on the envelope. Damn, he said. He flipped the sleeves over and kept looking. Edgar came over next to him as if to confirm the obvious. Would have been nice, he said. What will she do now? Bosch asked Jesper. Well, she'll probably try some dyes, some different lights. Try to get something that reacts with the ink, brings it up. But she wasn't too optimistic yesterday. So like I said, I wouldn't be getting my hopes up about it. Bosch nodded and turned off the light. Chapter 9 Near the back entrance to the Hollywood Division Station was a bench with large sand-filled ashtrays on either side. It was called the Code 7, after the radio call for out of service or on break. At 11.15 p.m. on Saturday night, Bosch was the only occupant on the Code 7 bench. He wasn't smoking, though he wished he was. He was waiting. The bench was dimly lit by the lights over the station's back door and had a view of the parking lot jointly shared by the station and the firehouse on the back end of the city complex. Bosch watched as the patrol units came in from the 3 to 11 shift and the officers went into the station to change out of uniforms, shower, and call it a night, 
if they could. He looked down at the mag light he held in his hands and rubbed his thumb over the end cap and felt the scratchings where Julia Brasher had etched her badge number. He hefted the light and then flipped it in his hand, feeling its weight. He flashed on what Gallagher had said about the weapon that had killed the boy. He could add flashlight to the list. Bosch watched a patrol car come into the lot and park by the motor pool garage. A cop he recognized as Julia Brasher's partner, Edgewood, emerged from the passenger side and headed into the station carrying the car's shotgun. Bosch waited and watched. Suddenly unsure of his plan and wondering if he could abandon it and get into the station without being seen. Before he decided on a move, Brasher got out of the driver's side and headed toward the station door. She walked with her head down, the posture of someone tired and beat from a long day. Bosch knew the feeling. He also thought something might be wrong. It was a subtle thing. But the way Edgewood had gone in and left her behind told Bosch something was off. Since Brasher was a rookie, Edgewood was her training officer, even though he was at least five years younger than her. Maybe it was just an awkward situation because of age and gender. Or maybe it was something else. Brasher didn't notice Bosch on the bench. She was almost to the station door before he spoke. Hey. He forgot to wash the puke out of the back seat. She looked back while continuing to walk until she saw it was him. She stopped then and walked over to the bench. I brought you something, Bosch said. He held out the flashlight. She smiled tiredly as she took it. Thank you, Harry. You didn't have to wait here. To... I wanted to. There was an awkward silence for a moment. Were you working the case tonight, she asked. More or less. Started the paperwork. And we sort of got the autopsy earlier today. If you could call it an autopsy. I can tell by your face it was bad. Bosch nodded. He felt strange. He was still sitting and she was still standing. I can tell by the way you look that you had a tough one, too. Aren't they all? Before Bosch could say anything, two cops, fresh from showers and in street clothes, came out of the station and headed toward their personal cars. Cheer up, Julia, one of them said. We'll see you over there. Okay, Kiko, she said back. She turned and looked back down at Bosch. She smiled. Some people from the shift are getting together over at Bordner, she said. You want to come? Mmm, that's okay. I just thought maybe you could use a drink or something. I could. I need one. Actually, that's why I was waiting here for you. I just don't know if I want to get into a group thing at a bar. Well, what were you thinking then? Boss checked his watch. It was now 11.30. Depending on how long you take in the locker room, we could probably catch the last martini call at Musso's. She smiled broadly now. I love that place. Give me 15 minutes. She headed toward the station door without waiting for a reply from him. I'll be here, he called after her. Chapter 10 Musso and Frank's was an institution that had been serving martinis to the denizens of Hollywood, both famous and infamous, for a century. The front room was all red leather booths and quiet conversation with ancient waiters and red half coats moving slowly about. The back room contained the long bar, where most nights it was standing room only, while patrons vied for the attention of bartenders who could have been the fathers of the waiters. As Bosch and Brasher came into the bar, two patrons slipped off their stools to leave. Bosch and Brasher quickly moved in, beating two black-clad studio types to the choice spots. A bartender who recognized Bosch came over and they both ordered vodka martinis, slightly dirty. 
Bosch was already feeling at ease with her. They had spent lunch together at the crime scene picnic tables the last two days, and she had never been far from his sight during the hillside searches. They had ridden over to Musso's together in his car, and it seemed like a third or fourth date already. They small-talked about the division and the details Bosch was willing to part with about his case. By the time the bartender put down their martini glasses along with the sidecar carafes, he was ready to forget about bones and blood and baseball bats for a while. They clinked glasses and Brasher said, To life. Yeah, Bosch said. Getting through another day. Just barely. Bosch knew that now was the time to talk to her about what was troubling her. If she didn't want to talk, he wouldn't press it. That guy you called Kiko in the back lot, why'd he tell you to cheer up? She slumped a little and didn't answer at first. If you don't want to talk about, no, it's not that. It's more like I don't want to think about it. I know the feeling. Forget I asked. No, it's okay. My partner's going to write me up, and since I'm on probation, it could cost me. Write you up for what? Crossing the tube. It was a tactical expression, meaning to walk in front of the barrel of a shotgun or other weapon held by a fellow officer. What happened? I mean, if you want to talk about it. She shrugged, and they both took long drinks from their glasses. Oh, it was a domestic. I hate domestics. And the guy locked himself in the bedroom with a gun. We didn't know if he was going to use it on himself, his wife, or us. We waited for backup, and then we were going to go in. She took another drink. Bosch watched her. Her inner turmoil showed clearly in her eyes. Edgewood had shotgun. Kiko had the kick. Fennel, Kiko's partner, and I had the door. So we did the deed. Kiko's big. He opened the door with one kick. Fennel and I went in. The guy was passed out on the bed. Seemed like no problem, but Edgewood had a big problem with me. He said I crossed the tube. Did you? I don't think so. But if I did, then so did Fennel and he didn't say jack to him. You're the rookie. You're the one on probation. Yeah, and I'm getting tired of it, that's for sure. I mean, how did you make it through, Harry? Right now you've got a job that makes a difference. What I do just chasing the radio all day and night, going from dirt bag to dirt bag, it's like spinning on a house fire. We're not making any headway out there, and on top of that, I've got this uptight male asshole telling me every two minutes how I fucked up. Bosch knew what she was feeling. Every cop in a uniform went through it. You wade through the cesspool every day, and soon it seems that that is all there is. An abyss. It was why he could never go back to working patrol. Patrol was a band-aid on a bullet hole. Did you think it would be different? When you were in the academy, I mean. I don't know what I thought. I just don't know if I can make it through to a point where I think I'm making any difference. I think you can. The first couple years are tough. But you dig in and you start seeing the long view. You pick your battles and you pick your path. You'll do all right. He didn't feel confident giving her the rah-rah speech. He had gone through long stretches of indecision about himself and his choices. Telling her to stick it out made him feel a little false. Let's talk about something else, she said. Fine with me, he said. He took a long drink from his glass, trying to think of how to turn the conversation in another direction. He put his glass down, turned, and smiled at her. So, there you were, hiking in the Andes, and you said to yourself, Gee, I want to be a cop. She laughed, seemingly shaking off the blues of her earlier comments. Not quite like that, and I've never been in the Andes. Well, what about the rich, full life you lived before putting on the badge? You said you were a world traveler. Never made it to South America. 
Is that where the Andes are? All this time I thought they were in Florida. She laughed again. And Bosch felt good about successfully changing the subject. He liked looking at her teeth when she laughed. They were just a little bit crooked and in a way that made them perfect. So, seriously, what did you do? She turned in the stool so they were shoulder to shoulder, looking at each other in the mirror behind all the colored bottles lined along the back wall of the bar. Oh, I was a lawyer for a while. Not a defense lawyer, so don't get excited. Civil law. Then I realized that was bullshit and quit and just started traveling. I worked along the way. I made pottery in Venice, Italy. I was a horse guide in the Swiss Alps for a while. I was cook on a day trip tourist boat in Hawaii. I did other things and I just saw a lot of the world. Except for the Andes. Then I came home. To L.A.? Born and raised. You? Same. Queen of Angels. Cedars. She held out her glass and they clinked. To the few, the proud, the brave, she said. Bosch finished off his glass and poured in the contents of his sidecar. He was way ahead of Brasher, but didn't care. He was feeling relaxed. It was good to forget about things for a while. It was good to be with somebody not directly related to the case. Born at Cedars, huh? he asked. Where'd you grow up? Don't laugh. Bel Air. Bel Air? I guess somebody's daddy isn't too happy about her joining the cops. Especially since his was the law firm she walked out of one day and wasn't heard from for two years. Bosch smiled and raised his glass. She clicked hers off it. Brave girl. After they put their glasses down, she said, Let's stop all the questions. Okay, Bosch said. And do what? Just take me home, Harry. To your place. He paused for a moment, looking at her shiny blue eyes. Things were moving lightning fast greased on the smooth runners of alcohol. But that was often the way it was between cops, between people who felt they were part of a closed society, who lived by their instincts and went to work each day knowing that how they made their living could kill them. Yeah, he finally said. I was just thinking the same thing. He leaned over and kissed her on the mouth. Chapter 11 Julia Brasher stood in the living room of Bosch's house and looked at the CDs stored in the racks next to the stereo. I love jazz. Bosch was in the kitchen. He smiled when he heard her say it. He finished pouring two martinis out of a shaker and came out to the living room and handed her a glass. Who do you like? Hmm, lately, Bill Evans. Bosch nodded, went to the rack, and came up with Kind of Blue. He loaded it into the stereo. Bill and Miles, he said. Not to mention Coltrane and a few other guys. Nothing better. As the music began, he picked up his martini, and she came over and tapped it with her glass. Rather than drink, they kissed each other. She started laughing halfway through the kiss. What, he said. Nothing. I'm just feeling reckless. And happy. Yeah, me too. I think it was you giving me the flashlight. Bosch was puzzled. What do you mean? You know. It's so phallic. The look on Bosch's face made her laugh again, and she spilled some of her drink on the floor. Later, when she was lying face down on his bed, Bosch was tracing the outline of the flaming sun tattooed on the small of her back and thinking about how comfortable and yet strange she felt to him. He knew almost nothing about her. 
like the tattoo, there seemed to be a surprise from every angle of view he had on her. What are you thinking about, she asked. Nothing. Just wondering about the guy who got to put this on your back. I wish it had been me, I guess. How come? Because there will always be a piece of him with you. She turned on her side, revealing her breasts and her smile. Her hair was out of its braid and down around her shoulders. He liked that, too. She reached up and pulled him down into a long kiss. Then she said, that's the nicest thing that's been said to me in a long time. He put his head down on her pillow. He could smell the sweet scent of perfume and sex and sweat. You don't have any pictures on your wall, she said. Photos, I mean. He shrugged his shoulders. She turned over so her back was to him. He reached under her arm and cupped one of her breasts and pulled her back into him. Can you stay till the morning, he asked. Well, my husband will probably wonder where I am, but I guess I could call him. Bosch froze. Then she started laughing. Don't scare me like that. Well, you never even asked me if I was involved with anyone. You didn't ask me. You were obvious. The lone detective type. And then, in a deep male voice, Just the facts, ma'am. No time for dames. Murder is my business. I have a job to do and I am... He ran his thumb down her side, over the indentations of her ribs. She cut off her words with laughter. You lent me your flashlight, he said. I didn't think an involved woman would have done that. And I've got news for you, tough guy. I saw the mag in your trunk. In the box, before you covered it up. You weren't fooling anybody. Bosch rolled back on the other pillow, embarrassed. He could feel his face getting red. He brought his hands up to hide it. Oh, God. Mr. Obvious. She rolled over to him and peeled back his hands. She kissed him on the chin. I thought it was nice. Kind of made my day and gave me something to maybe look forward to. She turned his hands back and looked at the scarring across the knuckles. They were old marks and not very noticeable anymore. Hey, what is this? Just scars. I know that. From what? I had tattoos. I took them off. It was a long time ago. How come? They made me take them off when I went into the army. She started to laugh. Why? What did it say? Fuck the army or something? No, nothing like that. But then what? Come on, I want to know. It said H-O-L-D on one hand and F-A-S-T on the other. Hold fast? What does hold fast mean? Well, it's kind of a long story. I have time. My husband doesn't mind. She smiled. Come on, I want to know. It's not a big deal. When I was a kid, one of the times I ran away, I ended up down in San Pedro, down around the fishing docks. And a lot of those guys down there, the fishermen, the tuna guys... I saw they had this on their hands. Hold fast. And I asked one of them about it, and he told me it was like their motto, their philosophy. It's like when they were out there in those boats, way out there for weeks, and the waves got huge, and it got scary. You just had to grab on and hold fast. Bosch made two fists and held them up. Hold fast to life. To everything that you have. So you had it done. How old were you? I don't know. Sixteen, thereabouts. He nodded and then he smiled. What I didn't know was that those tuna guys got it from some Navy guys. 
So a year later, I go waltzing into the army with hold fast on my hands, and the first thing my sergeant told me was to get rid of it. He wasn't going to have any squid tattoo on one of his guy's hands. She grabbed his hands and looked closely at the knuckles. This doesn't look like laser work. Boss shook his head. They didn't have lasers back then. So what did you do? My sergeant, his name was Rosser, took me out of the barracks and over to the back of the administration building. There was a brick wall. He made me punch it. Until every one of my knuckles was cut up. Then, after they were scabbed up in about a week, he made me do it again. Jesus fucking Christ, that's barbaric. No, that's the army. He smiled at the memory. It wasn't as bad as it sounded. He looked down at his hands. The music stopped and he got up and walked through the house naked to change it. When he came back to the bedroom, she recognized the music. Clifford Brown? He nodded and came toward the bed. He didn't think he had ever known a woman who could identify jazz music like that. Stand there. What? Let me look at you. Tell me about those other scars. The room was dimly lit by a light from the bathroom, but Bosch became conscious of his nakedness. He was in good shape, but he was more than fifteen years older than her. He wondered if she had ever been with a man so old. Harry, you look great. You totally turned me on, okay? What about the other scars? He touched the thick rope of skin above his left hip. This? This was a knife. Where'd that happen? A tunnel. And your shoulder? Bullet. Where? He smiled. A tunnel. Ouch. Stay out of tunnels. I try. He got into the bed and pulled the sheet up. She touched his shoulder running her thumb over the thick skin of the scar. Right in the bone, she said. Yeah. I got lucky. No permanent damage. It aches in the winter, and when it rains, that's about it. What did it feel like? Being shot, I mean. Bosch shrugged his shoulders. It hurt like hell, and then everything sort of went numb. How long were you down? About three months. You didn't get a disability out? It was offered. I declined. How come? I don't know. I liked the job, I guess. And I thought that if I stuck with it, someday I'd meet this beautiful young cop who'd be impressed by all my scars. She jammed him in the ribs, and the pain made him grimace. Oh, poor baby, she said in a mocking voice. That hurt. She touched the tattoo on his shoulder. What's that supposed to be? Mickey Mouse on acid? Sort of. It's a tunnel rat. Her face lost all trace of humor. What's the matter? You were in Vietnam, she said, putting things together. I've been in those tunnels. What do you mean? When I was on the road. I spent six weeks in Vietnam. The tunnels, they're like a tourist thing now. You pay your money and you can go down into them. It must have been. What you had to do must have been so frightening. It was more scary afterward. Thinking about it. They have them roped off so they can sort of control where you go. But nobody really watches you. So I went under the rope and went further in. It got so dark in there, Harry. Bosch studied her eyes. And did you see it? He asked quietly. The lost light. She held his eyes for a moment and nodded. I saw it. My eyes adjusted and there was light. Almost like a whisper. But it was enough for me to find my way. Lost light. We called it Lost Light. 
We never knew where it came from, but it was down there, like smoke hanging in the dark. Some people said it wasn't light, that it was the ghosts of everybody who died in those things. From both sides. They spoke no more after that. They held each other, and soon she was asleep. Bosch realized he had not thought about the case for more than three hours. At first, this made him feel guilty. But then he let it go, and soon he too was asleep. He dreamed he was moving through a tunnel, but he wasn't crawling. It was as if he were underwater and moving like an eel through the labyrinth. He came to a dead end, and there was a boy sitting against the curve of the tunnel's wall. He had his knees up and his face down, buried in his folded arms. Come with me, Bosch said. The boy peeked his eyes over one arm and looked up at Bosch. A single bubble of air rose from his mouth. He then looked past Bosch as if something was coming up behind him. Bosch turned around, but there was only the darkness of the tunnel behind him. When he looked back at the boy, he was gone. Chapter 12 Late Sunday morning, Bosch drove Brasher to the Hollywood station so she could get her car and he could resume work on the case. She was off duty Sundays and Mondays. They made plans to meet at her house in Venice that night for dinner. There were other officers in the parking lot when Bosch dropped her next to her car. Bosch knew that word would get around quickly that it appeared they had spent the night together. I'm sorry, he said. I should have thought it out better last night. I don't really care, Harry. I'll see you tonight. Hey, look, you should care. Cops can be brutal. She made a face. Oh, police brutality, yeah. I've heard of it. I'm serious. It's also against regs, on my part. I'm a D3, supervisor level. She looked at him a moment. Well, that's your call, then. I'll see you tonight. I hope. She got out and closed the door. Bosch drove on to his assigned parking slot and went into the detective bureau, trying not to think of the complications he might have just invited into his life. It was deserted in the squad room, which was what he was hoping for. He wanted time alone with the case. There was still a lot of office work to do, but he also wanted to step back and think about all the evidence and information that had been accumulated since the discovery of the bones. The first thing to do was put together a list of what needed to be done. The murder book, the blue binder containing all written reports pertaining to the case, had to be completed. He had to draw up search warrants seeking medical records of brain surgeries at local hospitals. He had to run routine computer checks on all the residents living in the vicinity of the crime scene on Wonderland. He also had to read through all the call-in tips spawned by the media coverage of the Bones on the Hill and start gathering missing person and runaway reports that might match the victim. He knew it was more than a day's work if he labored by himself, but decided to keep with his decision to allow Edgar the day off. His partner, the father of a 13-year-old boy, had been greatly upset by Gallagher's report the day before, and Bosch wanted him to take a break. The days ahead would likely be long, and just as emotionally upsetting. Once Bosch had his list together, he took his cup out of a drawer and went back to the watch office to get coffee. The smallest he had on him was a five-dollar bill, but he put it in the coffee fund basket without taking any change. He figured he'd be drinking more than his share through the day. You know what they say, someone said behind him as he was filling the cup. Bosch turned. It was Mankiewicz, the watch sergeant. About what? Fishing off the company dock? I don't know. What do they say? I don't know either. That's why I was asking you. Mankiewicz smiled and moved toward the machine to warm up his cup. So, already it was starting to get around, Bosch thought. Gossip and innuendo, 
especially anything with a sexual tone, moved through a police station like a fire racing up a hill in August. Well, let me know when you find out, Bosch said as he started for the door of the watch office. Could be useful to know. Will do. Oh, and one other thing, Harry. Bosch turned, ready for another shot for Mankiewicz. What? Just stop fooling around and wrap up your case. I'm tired of my guys having to take all the calls. There was a facetious tone in his voice. In his humor and sarcasm was a legitimate complaint about his officers on the desk being tied up by the tip calls. Yeah, I know. Any good ones today? Not that I could tell, but you'll get to slog through the reports and use your investigative wiles to decide that. Wiles? Yes, Wiles. Like Wiley Coyote. Oh, and CNN must have had a slow morning and picked up the story. Good video. All you brave guys on the hill with your makeshift stairs and little boxes of bones. So now we're getting the long-distance calls. Topeka and Providence so far this morning. It's not going to end until you clear it, Harry. We're all counting on you back here. Again, there was a smile and a message behind what he was saying. All right, I'll use all my wiles, I promise, Mank. That's what we're counting on. Back at the table, Bosch sipped his coffee and let the details of the case move through his mind. There were anomalies, contradictions. There were the conflicts between location choice and method of burial noticed by Kathy Cole. But the conclusions made by Gallagher added even more to the list of questions. Gallagher saw it as a child abuse case. But the backpack full of clothes was an indication that the victim, the boy, was possibly a runaway. Bosch had spoken to Edgar about it the day before when they returned to the station from the SID lab. His partner was not as sure of the conflict as Bosch, but offered a theory that perhaps the boy was the victim of child abuse both at the hands of his parents and then an unrelated killer. He rightfully pointed out that many victims of abuse run away only to be drawn into another form of abusive relationship. Bosch knew the theory was legitimate, but tried not to let himself go down that road because he knew it was even more depressing than the scenario Gallagher had spun. His direct line rang and Bosch answered, expecting it to be Edgar or Lieutenant Billets checking in. It was a reporter from the L.A. Times named Josh Meyer. Bosch barely knew him and was sure he'd never given him the direct line. He didn't let on that he was annoyed, however. Though tempted to tell the reporter that the police were running down leads extending as far as Topeka and Providence, he simply said there was no further update on the investigation since Friday's briefing from the Media Relations Office. After he hung up, he finished his first cup of coffee and got down to work. The part of an investigation Bosch enjoyed the least was the computer work. Whenever possible, he gave it to his partners to handle, so he decided to put the computer runs at the end of his list and started with a quick look through the accumulated tip sheets from the watch office. There were about three dozen more sheets since he had last looked through the pile on Friday. None contained enough information to be helpful or worth pursuing at the moment. Each was from a parent or sibling or friend of someone who had disappeared, all of them permanently forlorn and seeking some kind of closure to the most pressing mystery of their lives. He thought of something and rolled his chair over to one of the old IBM Selectrics. He inserted a sheet of paper and typed out four questions. Do you know if your missing loved one underwent any kind of surgical procedure in the months before his disappearance? If so, what hospital was he treated at? What was the injury? What was the name of his physician? He rolled the page out and took it to the watch office. He gave it to Mankiewicz to be used as a template of questions to be asked of all callers about the bones. That wily enough for you? Bosch asked. No, but it's a start. While he was there, Bosch took a plastic cup and filled it with coffee, and then came back to the bureau and dumped it into his cup. 
He made a note to ask Lieutenant Billets on Monday to procure some help in contacting all the callers of the last few days to ask the same medical questions. He then thought of Julia Brasher. He knew she was off on Mondays and would volunteer if needed, but he quickly dismissed it, knowing that by Monday the whole station would know about them, and bringing her into the case would make matters worse. He started the search warrants next. It was a matter of routine in homicide work to need medical records in the course of an investigation. Most often these records came from physicians and dentists, but hospitals were not unusual. Bosch kept a file with search warrant templates for hospitals as well as a listing of all 29 hospitals in the Los Angeles area and the attorneys who handled legal filings at each location. Having all of this handy allowed him to draw up 29 search warrants in a little over an hour. The warrants sought the records of all male patients under the age of 16 who underwent brain surgery entailing the use of a trephine drill between 1975 and 1985. After printing out the requests, he put them in his briefcase. While normally it was proper on a weekend to fax a search warrant to a judge's home for approval and signature, it would certainly not be acceptable to fax 29 requests to a judge on a Sunday afternoon. Besides, the hospital lawyers would not be available on a Sunday anyway. Bosch's plan was to take the warrants to a judge first thing Monday morning, then divide them with Edgar and hand-deliver them to the hospitals thereby being able to push the urgency of the matter with the lawyers in person. Even if things went according to plan, Bosch didn't expect to start receiving returns of records from the hospitals until midweek or later. Bosch next typed out a daily case summary as well as a recap of the anthropological information from Gallagher. He put these in the murder book and then typed up an evidence report detailing the preliminary SID findings on the backpack. When he was finished, Bosch leaned back and thought about the unreadable letter that had been found in the backpack. He did not anticipate that the documents section would have any success with it. It would forever be the mystery shrouded in the mystery of the case. He gulped the last of his second cup of coffee and opened the murder book to the page containing a copy of the crime scene sketch and chart. He studied the chart and noted that the backpack had been found right next to the spot Cole had marked as the probable original location of the body. Bosch wasn't sure what it all meant, but instinctively he knew that the questions he now had about the case should be kept foremost in his mind as new evidence and details continued to be gathered. They would be the screen through which everything would be sifted. He put the report into the murder book and then finished the updating of the paperwork by bringing the investigator's log, an hour-by-hour -hour time chart with small entry blocks, up to date. He then put the murder book in his briefcase. Bosch took his coffee cup to the sink in the restroom and washed it out. He then returned it to its drawer, picked up his briefcase, and headed out the back door to his car. Chapter 13 The basement of Parker Center, the headquarters of the Los Angeles Police Department, serves as the record archives for every case the department has taken a report on in the modern era. Until the mid-90s, records were kept on paper for a period of eight years and then transferred to microfiche for permanent storage. The department now used computers for permanent storage and was also moving backward putting older files into digital storage banks. But the process was slow, and had not gone further back than the late 80s. Bosch arrived at the counter in archives at 1 o'clock. He had two containers of coffee with him and two roast beef sandwiches from Philippe's in a paper bag. He looked at the clerk and smiled. Believe it or not, I need to see the fiche on missing person reports, 1975 to 85. The clerk, an old guy with a basement pallor, whistled and said, Look out, Christine, here they come. Bosch smiled and nodded and didn't know what the man was talking about. There appeared to be no one else behind the counter. The good news is they break up, the clerk said. I mean, I think it's good news. Are you looking for adult or juvie records? Juveniles. 
Then that cuts it up a bit. Thanks. Don't mention it. The clerk disappeared from the counter and Bosch waited. In four minutes, the man came back with ten small envelopes containing microfiche sheets for the years Bosch requested. Altogether, the stack was at least four inches thick. Bosch went to a microfiche reader and copier, set out a sandwich and the two coffees, and took the second sandwich back to the counter. The clerk refused the first offer, but then took the sandwich when Bosch said it was from Philippe's. Bosch went back to the machine and started fishing, wading first into the year 1985. He was looking for missing person and runaway reports of young males in the age range of the victim. Once he got proficient with the machine, he was able to move quickly through the reports. He would scan first for the closed stamp that indicated the missing individual had returned home or been located. If there was no stamp, his eyes would immediately go to the age and sex boxes on the form. If they fit the profile of his victim, he'd read the summary and then push the photocopy button on the machine to get a hard copy to take with him. The microfiche also contained records of missing person reports forwarded to the LAPD by outside agencies, seeking people believed to have gone to Los Angeles. Despite his speed at the task, it took Bosch more than three hours to go through all the reports for the ten years he had requested. He had hard copies of more than 300 reports in the tray to the side of the machine when he was finished. And he had no idea whether his effort had been worth the time or not. Bosch rubbed his eyes and pinched the bridge of his nose. He had a headache from staring at the machine's screen and reading tale after tale of parental anguish and juvenile angst. He looked over and realized he hadn't eaten his sandwich. He returned the stack of microfiche envelopes to the clerk and decided to do the computer work in Parker Center rather than drive back to Hollywood. From Parker Center, he could jump on the 10 freeway and shoot out to Venice for dinner at Julia Brasher's house. It would be easier. The squad room of the robbery homicide division was empty except for the two on-call detectives who were sitting in front of a television watching a football game. One of them was Bosch's former partner, Kismin Ryder. The other, Bosch didn't recognize. Ryder stood up smiling when she saw it was Bosch. Harry! What are you doing here, she asked. Working a case. I want to use a computer. That all right? That bone thing? He nodded. I heard about it on the news. Harry, this is Rick Thornton, my partner. Boss shook his hand and introduced himself. I hope she makes you look as good as she did me. Thornton just nodded and smiled, and Ryder looked embarrassed. Come on over to my desk, she said. You can use my computer. She showed him the way and let him sit in her seat. We're just twiddling our thumbs here. Nothing happening. I don't even like football. Don't complain about the slow days. Didn't anybody ever tell you that? Yeah, my old partner. Only thing he ever said that made any sense. I bet. Anything I can do to help? I'm just running the names. The usual. He opened his briefcase and took out the murder book. He opened it to a page where he had listed the names, addresses, and birth dates of residents on Wonderland Avenue, who had been interviewed during the neighborhood canvas. It was a matter of routine and due diligence to run the name of every person investigators came across in an investigation. You want a coffee or something? Ryder asked. Nah, I'm fine. Thanks, Kiz. He nodded in the direction of Thornton, who had his back to them, and was on the other side of the room. How are things going? She shrugged her shoulders. Every now and then he lets me do some real detective work, she said in a whisper. Well, you can always come back to Hollywood, he whispered back with a smile. He started typing in the commands for entering the National Crime Index computer. Immediately, Ryder made a sound of derision. Harry. You're still typing with two fingers? It's all I know, kids. I've been doing it this way for almost 30 years. You expect me to suddenly know how to type with ten fingers? I'm still not fluent in Spanish and don't know how to dance, either. You've only been gone a year. Just get up, dinosaur. Let me do it. You'll be here all night. 
Bosch raised his hands in surrender and stood up. She sat down and went to work. Behind her back, Bosch secretly smiled. Just like old times, he said. Don't remind me. I always get the shit work. And stop smiling. She hadn't looked up from her typing. Her fingers were a blur above the keyboard. Bosch watched in awe. Hey, it's not like I planned this. I didn't know you were going to be here. Yeah, like Tom Sawyer didn't know he had to paint a fence. What? Never mind. Tell me about the boot. Bosch was stunned. What? Is that all you can say? You heard me. The rookie you're, uh, seeing. How the hell do you know about it already? I'm a highly skilled gatherer of information, and I still have sources in Hollywood. Bosch stepped away from her cubicle and shook his head. Well, is she nice? That's all I wanted to know. I don't want to pry. Bosch came back. Yes, she's nice. I hardly know her. You seem to know more about her and me than me. You having dinner with her tonight? Yeah, I'm having dinner with her. Hey, Harry. Ryder's voice had lost any note of humor. What? You got a pretty good hit here. Bosch leaned down and looked at the screen. After digesting the information, he said, I don't think I'm going to make it to dinner tonight. Chapter 14 Bosch pulled to a stop in front of the house and studied the darkened windows and porch. Figures, Edgar said. The guy ain't even going to be home, probably already in the wind. Edgar was annoyed with Bosch, who had called him in from home. The way he figured it, the bones had been in the ground twenty years. What was the harm of waiting until Monday morning to talk to this guy? But Bosch said he was going by himself if Edgar didn't come in. Edgar came in. No, he's home, Bosch said. How do you know? I just know. He looked at his watch and wrote the time and address down on a page in his small notebook. It occurred to him then that the house they were at was the one where he had seen the curtain pulled closed behind a window on the evening of the first call-out. Let's go, he said. You talk to him the first time, so you take the lead. I'll jump in when it feels right. They got out and walked up the driveway to the house. The man they were visiting was named Nicholas Trent. He lived alone in the house, which was across the street and two houses down from the hillside where the bones had been found. Trent was fifty-seven years old. He had told Edgar during his initial canvas of the neighborhood that he was a set decorator for a studio in Burbank. He was unmarried and had no children. He knew nothing about the bones on the hill and could offer no clues or suggestions that were helpful. Edgar knocked hard on the front door, and they waited. Mr. Trent, it's the police, he said loudly. Detective Edgar, answer your door, please. He had raised his fist to hit the door again when the porch light went on. The door was then opened, and a white man with a shaved scalp stood in the darkness within. The light from the porch slashed across his face. Mr. Trent, it's Detective Edgar. This is my partner, Detective Bosch. We have a few follow-up questions for you, if you don't mind. Bosch nodded, but didn't offer his hand. Trent said nothing, and Edgar forced the issue by putting his hand against the door and pushing it open. All right if we come in? he asked, already halfway across the threshold. No, it's not all right, Trent said quickly. Edgar stopped and put a puzzled look on his face. Sir, we just have a few more questions we'd like to ask. Yeah, and that's bullshit. Excuse me? We all know what is going on here. I talked to my attorney already. Your act is just that, an act. A bad one. Bosch could see they were not going to get anywhere with the trick-or-treat strategy. He stepped up and pulled Edgar back by the arm. Once his partner had cleared the threshold, he looked at Trent. Mr. Trent, if you knew we'd be back, then you knew we'd find out about your past. Why didn't you tell Detective Edgar about it before? It could have saved us some time. Instead, it gives us suspicion. 
You can understand that, I'm sure. Because the past is the past. I didn't bring it up. I buried the past. Leave it that way. Not when there are bones buried in it, Edgar said in an accusatory tone. Bosch looked back at Edgar and gave him a look that said, Use some finesse. See, Trent said, This is why I'm saying, Go away. I have nothing to tell you people. Nothing. I don't know anything about it. Mr. Trent, you molested a nine-year-old boy, Bosch said. The year was 1966, and I was punished for it, severely. It's the past. I've been a perfect citizen ever since. I had nothing to do with those bones up there. Bosch waited a moment, and then spoke in a calm and quieter tone. If that is the truth, then let us come in and ask our questions. The sooner we clear you, the sooner we move on to other possibilities. But you have to understand something here. The bones of a young boy were found about a hundred yards from the home of a man who molested a young boy in 1966. I don't care what kind of citizen he's been since then. We need to ask him some questions. And we will ask those questions. We have no choice. Whether we do it in your home right now or with your lawyer at the station, with all of the news cameras waiting outside, that's going to be your choice. He paused. Trent looked at him with scared eyes. So you can understand our situation, Mr. Trent, and we can certainly understand yours. We're willing to move quickly and discreetly, but we can't without your cooperation. Trent shook his head as though he knew that no matter what he did now, his life as he knew it was in jeopardy and probably permanently altered. He finally stepped back and signaled Bosch and Edgar in. Trent was barefoot and wearing baggy black shorts that showed off thin ivory legs with no hair on them. He wore a flowing silk shirt over his thin upper body. He had the same build as a ladder, all hard angles. He led them to a living room cluttered with antiques. He sat down in the center of a couch. Bosch and Edgar took the two leather club chairs opposite. Bosch decided to keep the lead. He didn't like the way Edgar had handled the door. To be cautious and careful, I'm going to read you your constitutional rights, he said. Then I'll ask you to sign a waiver form. This protects you as well as us. I'm also going to record our conversation so that nobody ends up putting words in anybody else's mouth. If you want a copy of the tape, I will make it available. Trent shrugged and Bosch took it as reluctant agreement. When Bosch had the form signed, he slipped it into his briefcase and took out a small recorder. Once he started it and identified those present as well as the time and date, he nodded to Edgar to assume the lead again. This was because Bosch thought that observations of Trent and his surroundings were going to be more important than his answers now. Mr. Trent, how long have you lived in this house? Since 1984. He then laughed. What is funny about that? Edgar asked. 1984. Don't you get it? George Orwell? Big Brother. He gestured toward Bosch and Edgar as the front men of Big Brother. Edgar apparently didn't follow the statement and continued with the interview. Rent or own? Own. Uh, at first I rented, then I bought the house in 87 from the landlord. Okay. And you are a set designer in the entertainment industry? Set decorator. There is a difference. What is the difference? The designer plans and supervises the construction of the set. The decorator then goes in and puts in the details. The little character strokes. The character's belongings or tools. Like that. How long have you done this? Twenty-six years. Did you bury that boy up on the hillside? Trent stood up indignantly. Absolutely not. I've never even set foot on that hill, and you people are making a big mistake if you waste your time on me when the true killer of that poor soul is still out there somewhere. Bosch leaned forward in his chair. Sit down, Mr. Trent, he said. The fervent way in which Trent delivered the denial made Bosch instinctively think he was either innocent or one of the better actors he had come across on the job. Trent slowly sat down on the couch again. You're a smart guy, Bosch said, deciding to jump in. 
You know exactly what we're doing here. We have to bag you or clear you. It's that simple. So why don't you help us out? Instead of dancing around with us, why don't you tell us how to clear you? Trent raised his hands wide. I don't know how. I don't know anything about the case. How can I help you when I don't know the first thing about it? Well, right off the bat, you can let us take a look around here. If I can start to get comfortable with you, Mr. Trent, then maybe I can start seeing it from your side of things. But right now, like I said, I've got you with your record and I've got bones across the street. Bosch held up his two hands as if he was holding those two things in them. It doesn't look that good from where I'm looking at things. Trent stood up and threw one hand out in a gesture toward the interior of the house. Fine. Be my guest. Look around to your heart's content. You won't find a thing because I had nothing to do with it. Nothing. Bosch looked at Edgar and nodded, the signal being that he should keep Trent occupied while Bosch took a look around. Thank you, Mr. Trent, Bosch said as he stood up. As he headed into a hallway that led to the rear of the house, he heard Edgar asking if Trent had ever seen any unusual activity on the hillside where the bones had been found. I just remember kids used to play up. He stopped. Apparently, when he realized that any mention he made of kids would only further suspicion about him. Bosch glanced back to make sure the red light of the recorder was still on. Did you like watching the kids play up there in the woods, Mr. Trent? Edgar asked. Bosch stayed in the hallway, out of sight, but listening to Trent's answer. No. I couldn't see them if they were up in the woods. On occasion, I would be driving up or walking my dog, when he was alive. And I would see the kids climbing up there. The girl across the street. The Fosters next door. All the kids around here. It's a city-owned right-of-way. The only undeveloped land in the neighborhood. So they went up there to play. Some of the neighbors thought the older ones went up there to smoke cigarettes, and the concern was that they would set the whole hillside on fire. How long ago are you talking about? Like when I first moved here. I didn't get involved. The neighbors who had been here took care of it. Bosch moved down the hall. It was a small house, not much bigger than his own. The hallway ended at a conjunction of three doors. Bedrooms on the right and left, and a linen closet in the middle. He checked the closet first, found nothing unusual, and then moved into the bedroom on the right. It was Trent's bedroom. It was neatly kept, but the tops of the twin bureaus and bed tables were cluttered with knickknacks that Bosch assumed Trent used on the job in helping to turn sets into real places for the camera. He looked in the closet. There were several shoe boxes on the upper shelf. Bosch started opening them and found they contained old, worn-out shoes. It was apparently Trent's habit of buying new shoes and putting his old ones in the box then shelving them. Bosch guessed that these, too, became part of his work inventory. He opened one box and found a pair of work boots. He noticed that dirt had dried hard in some of the treads. He thought about the dark soil where the bones had been found. Samples of it had been collected. He put the boots back and made a mental note of it for the search warrant. His current search was just a cursory look around. If they moved to the next step with Trent and he became a full-fledged suspect, then they would come back with a search warrant and literally tear the place apart, looking for evidence tying him to the bones. The work boots might be a good place to start. He was already on tape saying he had never been up on that hillside. If the dirt in the treads matched the soil samples from the excavation, then they'd have Trent caught in a lie. Most of what sparring with suspects was about was the locking in of a story. It was then that the investigator looked for the lies. There was nothing else in the closet that warranted Bosch's attention. Same with the bedroom or the attached bathroom. Bosch, of course, knew that if Trent was the killer, he'd had many years to cover his tracks. He would also have had the last three days, since Edgar first questioned him during the canvas, to double-check his trail and be ready. 
The other bedroom was used as an office and a storage room for his work. On the walls hung framed one-sheets, advertising the films Bosch assumed Trent had worked on. Bosch had seen some of them on television, but rarely went to theaters to see movies. He noticed that one of the frames held the one-sheet for a film called The Art of the Cape. Years before, Bosch had investigated the murder of that film's producer. He had heard that after that, the one-sheets from the movie had become collector items in underground Hollywood. When he was finished looking around the rear of the house, Bosch went through a kitchen door into the garage. There were two bays, one containing Trent's minivan. The other was stacked with boxes with markings on them corresponding to rooms in a house. At first, Bosch was shocked at the thought that Trent had still not completely unpacked after moving in nearly twenty years before. Then he realized the boxes were work-related and used in the process of set decoration. When he turned around, he was looking at an entire wall hung with the heads of wild game, their black marble eyes staring at him. Bosch felt a nerve tickle run down his spine. All of his life he had hated seeing things like that. He wasn't sure why. He spent another few minutes in the garage, mostly going through a box in the stack that was marked Boys' Room 9 to 12. It contained toys airplane models, a skateboard, and a football. He took the skateboard out for a few moments and studied it, all the while thinking about the shirt from the backpack with solid surf printed on it. After a while, he put the skateboard back in the box and closed it. There was a side door to the garage that led to a path that went to the backyard. A pool took up most of the level ground before the yard rose into the steep wooded hillside. It was too dark to see much, and Bosch decided he would have to do the exterior look during daylight hours. Twenty minutes after he left to begin the search, Bosch returned to the living room empty-handed. Trent looked up at him expectantly. Satisfied? I'm satisfied for now, Mr. Trent. I appreciate your... You see? It never ends. Satisfied for now. You people will never let it go, will you? I mean, if I was a drug dealer or a bank robber, my debt would be cleared and you people would leave me alone. But because I touched a boy almost 40 years ago, I am guilty for life. I think you did more than touch him, Edgar said. But we'll get the records. Don't worry. Trent put his face in his hands and mumbled something about it being a mistake to have cooperated. Bosch looked at Edgar who nodded that he was finished and ready to go. Bosch stepped over and picked up his recorder. He slid it into the breast pocket of his jacket, but didn't turn it off. He'd learned a valuable lesson on a case the year before. Sometimes the most important and telling things are said after an interview is supposedly over. Mr. Trent, thank you for your cooperation. We're going to go, but we might need to talk to you tomorrow. Are you working tomorrow? God, no, don't call me at work. I need this job and you'll ruin it. You'll ruin everything. He gave Bosch his pager number. Bosch wrote it down and headed toward the front door. He looked back at Edgar. Did you ask him about trips? He's not planning to go anywhere, is he? Edgar looked at Trent. Mr. Trent, you work on movies. You know how the dialogue goes. You call us if you plan to go out of town. If you don't and we have to find you, you're not going to like it very much. Trent spoke in a flat-line monotone. His eyes focused forward. Somewhere far away. I'm not going anywhere at all. Now please leave. Just leave me alone. They walked out the door and Trent closed it hard behind them. At the bottom of the driveway was a large bougainvillea bush in full bloom. It blocked Bosch's view of the left side of the street until he got there. A bright light suddenly flashed on and in Bosch's face. A reporter, with a cameraman in tow, moved in on the two detectives. Bosch was blinded for a few moments until his eyes started to adjust. Hi, detectives. Judy Sertain, Channel 4 News. 
Is there a break in the bones case? No comment, Edgar barked. No comment and turn that damn light off. Bosch finally saw her in the glare of the light. He recognized her from TV and from the gathering at the roadblock earlier in the week. He also recognized that a no comment was not the way to leave this situation. He needed to defuse it and keep the media away from Trent. No, he said. No breakthrough. We're just following routine procedures. Sertain shoved the microphone she was carrying toward Bosch's face. Why are you out here in the neighborhood again? We're just finishing the routine canvas of the residents here. I hadn't had a chance to talk to the resident here before. We just finished up, that's all. He was talking with a bored tone in his voice. He hoped she was buying it. Sorry, he added. No big story tonight. Well, was this neighbor or any of the neighbors helpful to the investigation? Well, everyone here has been very cooperative with us, but as far as investigative leads go, it has been difficult. Most of these people weren't even living in the neighborhood when the bones were buried. That makes it tough. Bosch gestured toward Trent's house. This gentleman, for example. We just found out that he didn't buy his home here until 1987, and we're pretty sure those bones were already up there by then. So then it's back to the drawing board? Sort of. And that's really all I can tell you. Good night. He pushed past her toward his car. A few moments later, Sertain was on him at the car door. Without her cameraman. Detective, we need to get your name. Bosch opened his wallet and took out a business card. The one with the general station number printed on it. He gave it to her and said good night again. Look, if there is anything you can tell me, you know, off the record... I would protect you, Sertain said. You know, off camera like this, whatever you want to do. No, there's nothing, Bosch said as he opened the door. Have a good night. Edgar cursed the moment the doors of the car were closed. How the hell did she know we were here? Probably a neighbor, Bosch said. She was out here the whole two days of the dig. She's a celebrity. She made nice with the residents, made friends. Plus, we're sitting in a goddamn Shamu. Might as well have called a press conference. Bosch thought of the inanity of trying to do detective work in a car painted black and white. Under a program designed to make cops more visible on the street, the department had assigned detectives in the divisions to black and whites that didn't carry the emergency lights on top, but were just as noticeable. They watched as the reporter and her cameraman went to Trent's door. She's going to try to talk to him, Edgar said. Bosch quickly went into his briefcase and got out his cell phone. He was about to dial Trent's number and tell him not to answer when he realized he couldn't get a cell signal. God damn it, he said. Too late anyway, Edgar said. Let's just hope he plays it smart. Bosch could see Trent at his front door, totally bathed in the white light from the camera. He said a few words and then made a waving gesture and closed the door. Good, Edgar said. Bosch started the car, turned it around, and headed back through the canyon to the station. So, what's next? Edgar asked. We have to pull the records on his conviction. See what it was about. I'll do that first thing. No. First thing, I want to deliver the search warrants to the hospitals. Whether Trent fits our picture or not, we need to ID the kid in order to connect him to Trent. Let's meet at Van Nuys Courthouse at 8. We get them signed and then split them up. Bosch had picked Van Nuys Court because Edgar lived nearby and they could separate and go from there in the morning after the warrants had been approved by a judge. What about a warrant on Trent's place, Edgar said. You see anything while you were looking around? Not much. He's got a skateboard and a box in the garage. You know, with his work stuff. For putting on a set. I was thinking of our victim's shirt when I saw that. And there were some work boots with dirt in the treads. It might match the samples from the hill, but I'm not counting on a search coming through for us. The guy has had twenty years to make sure he's clear. If he's the guy. You don't think so? Bosch shook his head. Timing's wrong. Eighty-four is on the late side. The far edge of our window. I thought we were looking at 75 to 85. We are, in general. 
But you heard Gallagher, 20 to 25 years ago. That's early 80s on the high side. I don't know about 84 being early 80s. Well, maybe he moved to that house because of the body. He buried the kid there before and wanted to be close by, so he moves into the neighborhood. I mean, Harry, these are sick fucks, these guys. Bosch nodded. There's that. But I just wasn't getting the vibe from the guy. I believed him. Harry, your mojo's been wrong before. Oh, yeah. I think it's him. He's the guy. Here how we said, just because I touched a boy. Probably to him, sodomizing a nine-year-old is reaching out and touching somebody. Edgar was being reactionary, but Bosch didn't call him on it. He was a father. Bosch wasn't. We'll get the records and we'll see. We also have to go to the hall to check the reverses, see who was on that street back then. The reverses were phone books that listed residents by address instead of by name. A collection of the books for every year was kept in the Hall of Records. They would allow the detectives to determine who was living on the street during the 1975 to 1985 range they were looking at as the boy's time of death. That's going to be a lot of fun, Edgar said. Oh yeah, Bosch said. I can't wait. They drove in silence the rest of the way. Bosch became depressed. He was disappointed with himself for how he had run the investigation so far. The bones were discovered Wednesday, and the full investigation took off on Thursday. He knew he should have run the names, a basic part of the investigation, sooner than Sunday. By delaying it, he had given Trent the advantage. He'd had three days to expect and prepare for their questions. He had even been briefed by an attorney. He could have even been practicing his responses and looks in a mirror. Bosch knew what his internal lie detector said, but he also knew that a good actor could beat it. Chapter 15 Bosch drank a beer on the back porch with the sliding door open so he could hear Clifford Brown on the stereo. Almost fifty years before, the trumpet player made a handful of recordings and then checked out in a car crash. Bosch thought about all the music that had been lost. He thought about young bones in the ground and what had been lost. And then he thought about himself and what he had lost. Somehow the jazz and the beer and the grayness he was feeling about the case had all mixed together in his mind. He felt on edge. Like he was missing something that was right in front of him. For a detective, it was just about the worst feeling in the world. At 11 p.m., he came inside and turned the music down so he could watch the news on Channel 4. Judy Sertain's report was the third story after the first break. The anchor said, New developments in the Laurel Canyon bone case. We go to Judy Sertain at the scene. Ah, oh, shit, Bosch said, not liking the sound of the introduction. The program cut to a live shot of Sertain on Wonderland Avenue, standing on the street in front of a house Bosch recognized as Trent's. I'm here on Wonderland Avenue in Laurel Canyon, where four days ago a dog brought home a bone that authorities say was human. The dog's find led to the discovery of more bones belonging to a young boy who investigators believe was murdered and then buried more than twenty years ago. Bosch's phone started ringing. He picked it up off the arm of the TV chair and answered it. Hold on, he said, and then held the phone down by his side while he watched the news report. Sertain said, Tonight, the lead investigators on the case returned to the neighborhood to speak to one resident who lives less than 100 yards from the place where the boy was buried. That resident is Nicholas Trent, a 57-year-old Hollywood set decorator. The program cut to tape of Bosch being questioned by Sertain that night but it was used as visual filler while Sertain continued her report in a voiceover dub. Investigators declined to comment on their questioning of Trent, but Channel 4 News has learned. Bosch sat down heavily on the chair and braced himself. That Trent was once convicted of molesting a young boy. The sound was then brought up on the street interview just as Bosch said, That's really all I can tell you. The next jump was to video of Trent standing in his doorway and waving the camera off and closing the door. Trent declined comment on his status in the case, 
but neighbors in the normally quiet hillside neighborhood expressed shock upon learning of Trent's background. As the report shifted to a taped interview of a resident Bosch recognized as Victor Ulrich, Bosch hit the mute button on the TV remote and brought the phone up. It was Edgar. You watching this shit? he asked. Oh, yeah. We look like shit. We look like we told her. They used your quote out of context, Harry. We're going to be fucked by this. Well, you didn't tell her, right? Harry, you think I'd tell some... No, I don't. I was confirming. You didn't tell her, right? Right. And neither did I. So, yeah, we're going to take some shit, but we're clear on it. Well, who else knew? I doubt Trent was the one who told her. About a million people now know he's a child molester. Bosch realized the only people who knew were Kiz, who had gotten the records flag while doing the computer work, and Julia Brasher, whom Bosch told while he was making his excuse for missing dinner. Suddenly, a vision of Sertain standing at the roadblock on Wonderland came to him. Brasher had volunteered her help during both days of the hillside search and excavation. It was entirely possible that she had connected with Sertain in some way. Was she the reporter's source? The leak? There didn't have to be a leak, Bosch said to Edgar. All she needed was Trent's name. She could have gotten any cop she knew to run it on the box for her. Or she could have looked it up on the sexual offenders CD. It's public record. Hold on. He had gotten a call waiting beep on the phone. He switched over and learned it was Lieutenant Billets calling. He told her to hold while he got off the other line. He clicked over. Jerry, it's Bullets. I gotta call you back. It's still me, Billet said. Oh, sorry. Hold on. He tried again and this time made the switch back. He told Edgar he'd call him back if Billet said anything he needed to know right away. Otherwise, go with the plan, he added. See you at Van Nuys at eight. He switched back over to Billet's. Bullets, she said. Is that what you guys call me? What? You said bullets. When you thought I was Edgar, you called me bullets. You mean just now? Yes, just now. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. You mean when I was switching over to... Never mind. It doesn't matter. I assume you saw Channel 4? Yeah, I saw it. And all I can tell you is that it wasn't me and it wasn't Edgar. That woman got a tip that we were out there and we no commented our way out of there. How she came up with his... Harry, you didn't no comment your way out of there. They have you on tape, your mouth moving, and then I hear you say, that's all I can say. If you say that's all, that means you gave her something. Bosch shook his head, even though he was on the phone. I didn't give her shit. I just bullshitted my way by. I told her we were just finishing up the routine canvas of the neighborhood and I hadn't talked to Trent before. Was that true? Not really. But I wasn't going to say we were there because the guy's a child molester. Look, she didn't know about Trent when we were there. If she did, she would have asked me. She found out later, and how, I don't know. That's what Jerry and I were just talking about. There was silence for a moment, before Billets continued. Well, you better have your shit together on this tomorrow, because I want a written explanation from you that I can send up the line. Before that report on four was even over, I got a call from Captain Lavelli and she said she had already gotten the call from Deputy Chief Irving. Yeah. Yeah, typical. Right on down the food chain. Look, you know that leaking the criminal record of a citizen is against departmental policy, whether that citizen is the target of an investigation or not. I just hope you have your story straight on this. I don't need to tell you that there are people in the department just waiting for you to make a mistake they can sink their teeth into. Look, I'm not trying to downplay the leak. It was wrong and it was bad. But I'm trying to solve a murder here, Lieutenant, and now I've got a whole new obstacle to overcome. And that's what's typical. There's always something thrown in the way. Then you should be more careful next time. Careful of what? What did I do wrong? I'm following leads where they go. Bosch immediately regretted the explosion of frustration and anger. Of those people in the department waiting for his self-destruction, Billets certainly wasn't on the list. She was only the messenger here. In the same moment, he realized his anger was also self-directed because he knew Billets was right. 
he should have handled Sertain differently. Look. I'm sorry, he said in a low, even tone. It's just the case. It's got its hooks, you know. I think I do, Billets answered just as quietly. And speaking of the case, what exactly is going on? This whole thing with Trent came out of left field for me. I thought you were going to keep me up to date. It all came up today, late. I was just going to fill you in in the morning. I didn't know Channel 4 would be doing it for me. And doing it for Lavallee and Irving as well. Never mind them for now. Tell me about Trent. Chapter 16 It was well after midnight by the time Bosch got to Venice. Parking on the little streets near the canals was non-existent. He drove around looking for ten minutes and ended up parking in the lot by the library out on Venice Boulevard and then walking back in. Not all of the dreamers drawn to Los Angeles came to make movies. Venice was the century-old dream of a man named Abbott Kinney. Before Hollywood and the film industry barely had a pulse, Kinney came to the marshlands along the Pacific. He envisioned a place built on a network of canals with arched bridges and a town center of Italian architecture. It would be a place emphasizing cultural and artistic learning, and he would call it Venice of America. But like most of the dreamers who come to Los Angeles, his vision was not uniformly shared or realized. Most financiers and investigators were cynical and passed on the opportunity to build Venice putting their money into projects of less grand design. Venice of America was dubbed Kinney's Folly. But a century later, many of the canals and the arched bridges reflected in their waters remained while the financiers and doomsayers and their projects were long swept away by time. Bosch liked the idea of Kinney's Folly outlasting them all. Bosch had not been to the canals in many years, Though for a short period in his life, after returning from Vietnam, he had lived there in a bungalow with three other men he knew from overseas. In the years since, many of the bungalows had been erased and modern two- and three-story homes costing a million dollars or more had replaced them. Julia Brasher lived in a house at the corner of the Howland and Eastern Canals. Bosch expected it to be one of the new structures. He guessed she probably used her law firm money to buy it or even build it, but as he came to the address, he saw that he was wrong. Her house was a small bungalow made of white clabbered, with an open front porch overlooking the joining of the two canals. Bosch saw lights on behind the windows of her house. It was late, but not that late. If she worked the 3 to 11 shift, then it was unlikely she was used to going to bed before 2. He stepped up onto the porch, but hesitated before knocking on the door. Until the doubts of the last hour had crept in, he had gotten only good feelings about Brasher and their fledgling relationship. He knew he now had to be careful. There could be nothing wrong, and yet he could spoil everything if he misstepped here. Finally, he raised his arm and knocked. Brasher answered right away. I was wondering if you were going to knock or stand out there all night. You knew I was standing here? The porch is old. It creaks. I heard it. Well, I got here and then figured it was too late. I should have called first. Just come in. Is anything wrong? Bosch came in and looked around. He didn't answer the question. The living room had an unmistakable beach flavor to it right down to the bamboo and rattan furniture and the surfboard leaning in one corner. The only deviation was her equipment belt and holster hanging on a wall rack near the door. It was a rookie mistake, leaving it out like that, but Bosch assumed she was proud of her new career choice and wanted to remind friends outside the cop world of it. Sit down, she said. I have some wine open. Would you like a glass? Bosch thought a moment about whether mixing wine with the beer he'd had an hour earlier would lead to a headache the next day when he knew he'd have to be focused. It's red. Um, I'll take just a little bit. Gotta be sharp tomorrow, huh? I guess. 
She went into the kitchen while he sat down on the couch. He looked around the room and now saw a mounted fish with a long, sharp point hanging over the white brick fireplace. The fish was a brilliant blue, shading to black with a white and yellow underside. Mounted fish didn't bother him the way the heads of mounted game did, but he still didn't like the eye of the fish always watching. You catch this thing, he called out. Yeah, off Cabo. Took me three and a half hours to bring it in. She then appeared with two glasses of wine. On fifty-pound test line, she said. That was a workout. What is it? Black marlin. She toasted the fish with her glass and then toasted Bosch. Hold fast. Bosch looked at her. That's my new toast, she said. Hold fast. It seems to cover everything. She sat down on the chair closest to Bosch. Behind her was the surfboard. It was white with a rainbow design and a border running along the edges. It was a short board. So you surf the wild waves, too. She glanced back at the board and then at Bosch and smiled. I try to. Picked it up in Hawaii. You know John Burroughs? She shook her head. Lot of surfers in Hawaii. What beats does he surf? No, I mean here. He's a cop. He works homicide out of Pacific Division. Lives on a walk street by the beach. Not too far from here. He surfs. On his board it says, To protect and surf. She laughed. That's cool. I like that. I'll have to get that put on my board. Bosch nodded. John Burroughs, huh? I'll have to look him up. She said it with just a touch of teasing in her voice. Bosch smiled and said, And maybe not. He liked the way she kidded him like that. It all felt good to Bosch, which made him feel all the more out of sorts because of his reason for being there. He looked at his wine glass. I've been fishing all day and didn't catch a thing, he said. Microfish, mostly. I saw you on the news tonight, she said. Are you trying to put the squeeze on that guy? The child molester? Bosch sipped his wine to give himself time to think. She had opened the door. He now just had to step through very carefully. What do you mean, he asked. Well, giving that reporter his criminal background. I figured you must be making some kind of play, you know, turning up the heat on him, to make him talk or something. It seems kind of risky. Why? Well, first of all, trusting a reporter is always risky. I know that from back when I was a lawyer and got burned. And second, and second, you never know how people are going to react when their secrets are no longer secrets. Bosch studied her for a moment and then shook his head. I didn't give it to her, he said. Somebody else did. He studied her eyes for any kind of tell. There was nothing. There's going to be trouble over it, he added. She raised her eyebrows in surprise. Still no tell. Why? If you didn't give her the information, why would there... She stopped, and now Bosch could see her put it together. He saw the disappointment fill her eyes. Oh, Harry. He tried to back out through the door. What? Don't worry about it. I'll be fine. It wasn't me, Harry. Is that what you hear about? To see if I'm the leak or the source or whatever you'd call it? She abruptly put her wine glass down on the coffee table. Red wine lapped over the edge and onto the table. She didn't do anything about it. Bosch knew there was no use trying to avoid the collision. He had screwed up. Look, only four people knew, and I was one of them. So you thought you'd come here undercover and find out if it was me? She waited for a response. Finally, all Bosch could do was nod. Well, it wasn't me. And I think you should go now. Bosch nodded and put down his glass. He stood up. Look, 
I'm sorry. I screwed it up. I thought the best way to not mess anything up, you know, between you and me was to... He made a helpless gesture with his hands as he headed to the door. Was to do the undercover thing, he continued. I just didn't want to mess it up, that's all. But I had to know. I think if you were me, you would have felt the same way about it. He opened the door and looked back at her. I'm sorry, Julia. Thanks for the wine. He turned to go. Harry? He turned back. She came to him and reached up and grabbed the lapels of his jacket with both hands. She slowly pulled him forward and then pushed him backward, as if roughing up a suspect in slow motion. Her eyes dropped to his chest as her mind worked and she came to a decision. She stopped shaking him but kept her grasp on his jacket. I can get over it, she said. I think. She looked up to his eyes and pulled him forward. She kissed him hard on the mouth for a long time and then pushed him back. She let go. I hope. Call me tomorrow. Bosch nodded and stepped through the door. She closed it. Bosch went down the porch to the sidewalk next to the canal. He looked at the reflection of the lights of all the houses on the water. An arched footbridge, lighted by the moon and nothing else, crossed the canal twenty yards away, its reflection perfect on the water. He turned and walked back up the steps to the porch. He hesitated at the door again, and soon Brasher opened it. The porch creaks, remember? He nodded, and she waited. He wasn't sure how to say what he wanted to say. Finally. He just began. One time when I was in one of those tunnels we were talking about last night, I came up head on with some guy. He was VC. Black pajamas, greased face. We sort of looked at each other for a split second and I guess instincts took over. We both raised up and fired at the same time. Simultaneous. And then we fucking ran in opposite directions. Both of us scared shitless, screaming in the dark. He paused as he thought about the story, seeing it more than remembering it. Anyway, I thought he had to have hit me. It was almost point blank, too close to miss. I thought my gun had backfired and jammed or something. The kick had felt wrong. When I got up top, the first thing I did was check myself. No blood, no pain. I took all of my clothes off and checked myself. Nothing. He had missed. Point blank and somehow the guy had missed. She stepped over the door's threshold and leaned against the front wall beneath the porch light. She didn't say anything and he pressed on. Anyway, then I checked my forty-five for a gem and I found out why he hadn't hit me. The guy's bullet was in the barrel of my gun. With mine. We had pointed at each other and his shot went right up the barrel of my gun. What were the chances of that? A million to one? A billion? As he spoke, he held his empty hand out as a gun pointing at her. His hand was extended directly in front of his chest. The bullet that day in the tunnel had been meant for his heart. I guess I just want you to know that I know how lucky I was with you tonight. He nodded, and then turned and went down the steps. Chapter 17 Death investigation is a pursuit with countless dead ends, obstacles and colossal chunks of wasted time and effort. Bosch knew this every day of his existence as a cop, but was reminded of it once again when he got to the homicide table shortly before noon Monday and found his morning's time and effort had most likely been wasted, while a brand new obstacle awaited him. The homicide squad had the area at the rear corner of the detective bureau. The squad consisted of three teams of three. Each team had a table consisting of the three detectives' desks pushed together, two facing each other the third along one side. 
Sitting at Bosch's table in the slot left vacant by Kiz Ryder's departure was a young woman in a business suit. She had dark hair and even darker eyes. They were eyes sharp enough to peel a walnut, and they held on Bosch's whole way through the squad room. Can I help you? he asked when he got to the table. Harry Bosch? That's me. Detective Carol Bradley, IAD. I need to take a statement from you. Bosch looked around. There were several people in the squad room trying to act busy while surreptitiously watching. Statement about what? Deputy Chief Irving asked our division to determine if the criminal record of Nicholas Trent was improperly divulged to the media. Bosch still hadn't sat down. He put his hands on the top of his chair and stood behind it. He shook his head. I think it's pretty safe to assume it was improperly divulged. Then I need to find out who did it. Bosch nodded. I'm trying to run an investigation here, and all anybody cares about is, look, I know you think it's bullshit, and I may think it's bullshit, but I've got the order. So let's go into one of the rooms and put your story on tape. It won't take long, and then you can go back to your investigation. Bosch put his briefcase on the table and opened it. He took out his tape recorder. He had remembered it while driving around all morning delivering search warrants at the local hospitals. Speaking of tape, why don't you take this into one of the rooms and listen to it first? I had it on last night. It should end my involvement in this pretty quick. She hesitantly took the recorder, and Bosch pointed to the hallway that led to the three interview rooms. I'm still going to need to... Fine. Listen to the tape, then we'll talk. Your partner, too. He should be in any time now. Bradley went down the hall with the recorder. Bosch finally sat down and didn't bother to look at any of the other detectives. It wasn't even noon, but he felt exhausted. He had spent the morning waiting for a judge in Van Nuys to sign the search warrants for medical records and then driving across the city delivering them to the legal offices of 19 different hospitals. Edgar had taken 10 of the warrants and headed off on his own. With fewer to deliver, he was then going downtown to conduct record searches on Nicholas Trent's criminal background and to check the reverse directories and property records for Wonderland Avenue. Bosch noticed that waiting for him was a stack of phone messages and the latest batch of call-in tips from the front desk. He took the phone messages first. Nine out of twelve of them were from reporters, all no doubt wanting to follow up on Channel 4's report on Trent the night before and then rebroadcast during the morning news program. The other three were from Trent's lawyer, Edward Morton. He had called three times, between 8 and 9.30 a.m. Bosch didn't know Morton, but expected he was calling to complain about Trent's record being given to the media. He normally wasn't quick to return calls to lawyers, but decided it would be best to get the confrontation over with and to assure Morton that the leak had not come from the investigators on the case. Even though he doubted that Morton would believe anything he said, he picked up the phone and called back. A secretary told him that Morton had gone to a court hearing but was due to check in at any moment. Bosch said he would be waiting for him to call again. After hanging up, Bosch dropped the pink slips with the reporter's numbers on them into the trash can next to his spot at the table. He started going through the call-in sheets and quickly noticed that the desk officers were now asking the questions he had typed out the morning before and given to Mankiewicz. On the eleventh report in the pile, he came across a direct hit. A woman named Sheila Delacroix had called at 8.41 a.m. that morning and said she had seen the Channel 4 report that morning. She said her younger brother Arthur Delacroix disappeared in 1980 in Los Angeles. He was twelve years old at the time, and was never heard from since. In answer to the medical questions, she responded that her brother had been injured during a fall from a skateboard a few months before his disappearance. He suffered a brain injury that required hospitalization and neurosurgery. She did not remember the exact medical details, but was sure the hospital was Queen of Angels. She could not recall the name of any of the doctors who treated her brother. Other than an address and callback number for Sheila Delacroix, that was all the information on the report. 
Bosch circled the word skateboard on the sheet. He opened his briefcase and got out a business card Bill Golliher had given him. He called the first number and got a machine at the anthropologist's office at UCLA. He called the second and got Golliher while he was eating lunch in Westward Village. Got a quick question. The injury that required surgery on the skull. The hematoma? Right. Could that have been caused by a fall from a skateboard? There was silence, and Bosch let Golliher think. The clerk who took the calls to the general lines in the squad room came up to the homicide table and shot Bosch a peace sign. Bosch covered his receiver. Who is it? Kiz Ryder. Tell her to hold. He uncovered the receiver. Doc, you there? Yes, I'm just thinking. It might be possible, depending on what it was he hit, but a fall just to the ground, I would say it's not likely. You had a tight fracture pattern, which indicates a small area of surface-to-surface -surface contact. Also, the location is high up on the cranium. It's not the back of the head, which you would normally associate with fall injuries. Bosch felt some of the wind going out of his sails. He had thought he might have an ID on the victim. Is this a particular person you're talking about? Gulliher asked. Yeah, we just got a tip. Are there x-rays? Surgical records? I'm working on it. Well, I'd like to see them to make a comparison. As soon as I get them. What about the other injuries? Could they be from skateboarding? Of course, some of them could be from that, Gulliher said. But I would say not all. The ribs, the twist fractures... Also, some of these injuries dated to very early childhood, Detective. There aren't many three-year-olds on skateboards, I would think. Bosch nodded and tried to think if there was anything else to ask. Detective, you do know that in abuse cases, the reported cause of injury and the true cause are not often the same? I understand. Whoever brought the kid into the emergency room wouldn't volunteer he hit him with a flashlight or whatever. Right. There would be a story. The child would adhere to it. Skateboard accident. It's possible. Okay, Doc, I gotta go. I'll get you the x-rays as soon as I get them. Thanks. He punched line two on the phone. Kiz? Harry, hi, how are you doing? Busy. What's up? I feel awful, Harry. I think I fucked up. Bosch leaned back in his chair. He would never have guessed it was her. Channel 4? Yeah, I, uh... Yesterday, after you left Parker and my partner stopped watching the football game, he asked what was up with you being in there. So I told him. I'm still trying to establish the relationship, Harry, you know? I told him I ran the names for you and there was a hit. One of the neighbors had a molestation record. That's all I told him, Harry, I swear. Bosch breathed out heavily. He actually felt better. His instinct about Ryder had been right on. She was not the leak. She had simply trusted someone she should have been able to trust. Kids, I got I.D. sitting up here waiting to talk to me about this. How do you know Thornton gave it to Channel 4? I saw the report on TV this morning when I was getting ready. I know Thornton knows that reporter, Sertain. Thornton and I worked a case a few months ago, an insurance murder on the West Side. It got some media play and he was feeding her stuff off the record. I saw them together. Then yesterday, after I told him about the hit, he said he had to go to the can. He picked the sports page up and went down the hall. But he didn't go to the can. We got a call out and I went down and banged on the door to tell him we were rolling. He didn't answer. I didn't really think anything about it until I saw the news today. I think he didn't go to the can because he went into another office or down to the lobby to use a phone to call her. Well, it explains a lot. I'm really sorry, Harry. That TV report didn't make you look good at all. I'm going to talk to IAD. Just hold on to that, Kiz, for now. I'll let you know if I need you to talk to IAD. But what are you going to do? 
Get a new partner. I can't work with this guy. Be careful. You start jumping partners and pretty soon you'll be all alone. I'd rather work alone than with some asshole I can't trust. There's that. What about you? The offer still stand? What? I'm an asshole you can trust? You know what I mean. The offer stands. All you have to do is, hey, Harry, I gotta go. Here he comes. Okay, bye. Bosch hung up and rubbed his mouth with his hand as he thought about what to do about Thornton. He could tell Kiz's story to Carol Bradley, but there was still too much room in it for error. He wouldn't feel comfortable going to IAD with it unless he was sure. The actual idea of going to IAD about anything repulsed him, but in this instance, someone was harming Bosch's investigation, and that was something he could not let pass. After a few minutes, he came up with a plan and checked his watch. It was ten minutes before noon. He called Kiz Ryder back. It's Harry. Is he there? Yeah, why? Repeat after me in a sort of excited voice. You did, Harry? Great. Who was he? You did, Harry? That's great. Who was he? Okay, now you're listening. Listening? Listening? Now say, how did a ten-year-old get here from New Orleans? How did a ten-year-old get all the way here from New Orleans? Perfect. Now hang up and don't say anything. If Thornton asks you, tell him we ID'd the kid through dental records. He was a ten-year-old runaway from New Orleans, last seen in 1975. His parents are on a plane heading here now, and the chief is going to have a press conference about it all today at four. Okay, Harry. Good luck. You too. Bosch hung up and looked up. Edgar was standing across the table from him. He had heard the last part of the conversation, and his eyebrows were up. No, it's all bullshit, Bosch said. I'm setting up the leak. And that reporter. The leak? Who is the leak? Kiz's new partner, we think. Edgar slid into his chair and just nodded. But we do have a possible ID on the bones, Bosch said. He told Edgar about the call-in sheet on Arthur Delacroix and his subsequent conversations with Bill Gallagher. 1980? That's not going to work with Trent. I checked the reverses and property records. He wasn't on that street until 84, like he said last night. Something tells me he isn't our guy. Bosch thought about the skateboard again. It wasn't enough to alter his gut feeling. Tell that to Channel 4. Bosch's phone rang. It was Ryder. He just went to the can. You tell him about the press conference? I told him everything. He kept asking questions, the dipshit. Well, if he tells her that everybody will have it at four, she'll go out with the exclusive on the new news. I'm going to go watch. Let me know. He hung up and checked his watch. He still had a few minutes. He looked at Edgar. By the way, IAD is in one of the rooms back there. We're under investigation. Edgar's jaw dropped. Like most cops, he resented internal affairs because even when you did a good and honest job, the IAD could still be on you for any number of things. It was like the Internal Revenue Service, the way just seeing a letter with the IRS return address in the corner was enough to pull your guts into a knot. Relax. It's about the Channel 4 thing. We should be clear of it in a few minutes. Come with me. They went into Lieutenant Billet's office, where there was a small television on a stand. She was doing paperwork at her desk. You mind if we check out Channel 4's noon report? Bosch asked. Be my guest. I'm sure Captain Lavallee and Chief Irving are going to be watching as well. The news program opened with a report on a 16-car pileup in the morning fog on the Santa Monica Freeway. It wasn't that significant a story. No one was killed. But they had good video, so it led the program. But the dog bone case had moved up to second billing. The anchor said they were going to Judy Sertain with another exclusive report. 
The program cut to Sertain sitting at a desk in the Channel 4 newsroom. Channel 4 has learned that the bones found in Laurel Canyon have been identified as those of a ten-year-old runaway from New Orleans. Bosch looked at Edgar and then at Billets, who was rising from her seat with an expression of surprise on her face. Bosch put out his hand as if to signal her to wait a moment. The parents of the boy who reported him missing more than 25 years ago are en route to Los Angeles to meet with police. The remains were identified through dental records. Later today, the chief of police is expected to hold a press conference where he will identify the boy and discuss the investigation. As reported by Channel 4 last night, police are focusing on... Bosch turned the TV off. Harry? Jerry? What's going on? Billets asked immediately. All of that was bogus. I was smoking out the leak. Who? Kiz's new partner. A guy named Rick Thornton. Bosch explained what Ryder had explained to him earlier. He then outlined the scam he had just pulled. Where's the ID detective? Billets asked. One of the interview rooms. She's listening to a tape I had of me and the reporter last night. A tape? Why didn't you tell me about it last night? I forgot about it last night. All right, I'll take it from here. You feel Kiz is clean on this? Bosch nodded. She has to trust her partner enough to tell him anything. He took that trust and gave it to Channel 4. I don't know what he's getting in return, but it doesn't matter. He's fucking with my case. All right, Harry. I said I would handle it. You go back to the case. Anything new I should know about? We've got a possible ID. This one legit. That we'll be running down today. What about Trent? We're letting that sit until we find out if this is the kid. If it is, the timing is wrong. The kid disappeared in 1980. Trent didn't move into the neighborhood until four years later. Great. Meantime, we've taken his buried secret and put it on TV. Last I heard from patrol, the media was camped in his driveway. Bosch nodded. Talk to Thornton about it, he said. Oh, we will. She sat down behind her desk and picked up the phone. It was their cue to leave. On the way back to the table, Bosch asked Edgar if he had pulled the file on Trent's conviction. Yeah, I got it. It was a weak case. Nowadays, the DA probably wouldn't have even filed on it. They went to their respective spots at the table, and Bosch saw that he had missed a callback from Trent's lawyer. He reached for the phone, but then waited until Edgar finished his report. The guy worked as a teacher at an elementary school in Santa Monica. He was caught by another teacher in a stall in the bathroom holding an eight-year-old's penis while he urinated. He said he was teaching the kid how to aim it, that the kid kept pissing on the floor. What it came down to is the kid's story was all over the place, but didn't back his. And the parents said the boy already knew how to aim by the time he was four. Trent was convicted and got a two plus one. He served 15 months of it up at Wayside. Bosch thought about all of this. His hand was still on the phone. It's a long-ass jump from that to beating a kid to death with a baseball bat. Yeah, Harry, I'm beginning to like your mojo better all the time. I wish I did. He picked up the phone and punched in the number for Trent's attorney, Edward Morton. He was transferred to the lawyer's cell phone. He was on his way to lunch. Hello? Detective Bosch. Bosch, yes. I want to know where he is. Who? Don't play this game, detective. I've called every holding jail in the county. I want to be able to speak to my clients right now. I'm assuming you're speaking about Nicholas Trent. Have you tried his job? Home and work. No answer. Pager, too. If you people have him, he's entitled to representation, and I am entitled to know. I'm telling you now, if you fuck with me on this, I will go right to a judge and the media. We don't have your man, counselor. I haven't seen him since last night. Yes, he called me after you left. Then again, after watching the news. You people fucked him over. You should be ashamed of yourself. Bosch's face burned with a rebuke, but he didn't respond to it. If he didn't personally deserve it, then the department did. He'd take the bullet for now. Do you think he ran, Mr. Morton? 
Why run if you're innocent? I don't know. Ask O.J. A horrible thought suddenly shot into Bosch's gut. He stood up, the phone still pressed to his ear. Where are you now, Mr. Morton? Sunset heading west, near Book Soup. Turn around and come back. Meet me at Trent's house. I have a lunch. I'm not going... Meet me at Trent's house. I'm leaving now. He put the phone in its cradle and told Edgar it was time to go. He'd explain on the way. Chapter 18 There was a small gathering of television reporters in the street in front of Nicholas Trent's house. Bosch parked behind the Channel 2 van and he and Edgar got out. Bosch didn't know what Edward Morton looked like, but didn't see anyone in the group who looked like an attorney. After more than 25 years on the job, he had unerring instincts that allowed him to identify lawyers and reporters. Over the top of the car, Bosch spoke to Edgar before the reporters could hear them. If we have to go in, we'll do it around back, without the audience. I got gotcha. you. They walked up to the driveway and were immediately accosted by the media crews, who turned on cameras and threw questions that went unanswered. Bosch noticed that Judy Sertain of Channel 4 was not among the reporters. Are you here to arrest Trent? Can you tell us about the boy from New Orleans? Uh, what about the press conference? Media relations doesn't know anything about a press conference. Is Trent a suspect or not? Once Bosch was through the crowd and on Trent's driveway, he suddenly turned back and faced the cameras. He hesitated a moment as if composing his thoughts. What he really was doing was giving them time to focus and get ready. He didn't want anyone to miss this. There is no press conference scheduled, Bosch said. There has been no identification of the bones yet. The man who lives in this house was questioned last night, as was every resident of this neighborhood. At no time was he called a suspect by the investigators on this case. Information leaked to the media by someone outside of the investigation and then broadcast without being checked first with the actual investigators has been completely wrong and damaging to the ongoing investigation. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. When there is some real and accurate information to report, we will give it to you through media relations. He turned back around and headed up the driveway to the house with Edgar. The reporters threw more questions at them, but Bosch gave no indication of even hearing them. At the front door, Edgar knocked sharply and called out to Trent, telling him it was the police. After a few moments, he knocked again and made the same announcement. They waited again and nothing happened. The back, Edgar asked? Yeah, or the garage has a door on the side. They walked across the driveway and started heading down the side of the house. The reporters yelled more questions. Bosch guessed they were so used to throwing questions that were not answered at people that it simply became natural for them to do it, and natural for them to know they would not be answered. Like a dog barking in the backyard long after the master is left for work. They passed the side door to the garage, and Bosch noted that he was correct in remembering that there was only a single key lock on the knob. They continued into the backyard. There was a kitchen door with a deadbolt and a key lock on the knob. There was also a sliding door which would be easy to pop open. Edgar stepped over to it, but looked down through the glass to the interior sliding track and saw that there was a wooden dowel in place that would prevent the door from being opened from the outside. This won't work, Harry, he said. Bosch had a small pouch containing a set of lock picks in his pocket. He didn't want to have to work the deadbolt on the kitchen door. Let's do the garage, unless... He walked over to the kitchen door and tried it. It was unlocked, and he opened the door. In that moment, he knew they would find Trent dead inside. Trent would be the helpful suicide the one who leaves the door open so people don't have to break in. Shit. Edgar came over, pulling his gun from its holster. You're not going to need that, Bosch said. He stepped into the house, and they moved through the kitchen. Mr. Trent? Edgar yelled. Police! Police in the house! Are you here, Mr. Trent? Take the front, Bosch said. 
They split up and Bosch went down the short hallway to the rear bedrooms. He found Trent in the walk-in shower of the master bath. He had taken two wire hangers and fashioned a noose which he had attached to the stem pipe of the shower. He had then leaned back against the tiled wall and dropped his weight and asphyxiated himself. He was still dressed in the clothes he had worn the night before. His bare feet were on the floor tiles. There were no indications at all that Trent had had second thoughts about killing himself. Being that it was not a suspension hanging, he could have stopped his death at any time. He didn't. Bosch would have to leave it for the coroner's people, but he judged by the darkening of the body's tongue, which was distended from the mouth, that Trent had been dead at least twelve hours. That would put his death in the vicinity of the very early morning, not long after Channel 4 had first announced his hidden past to the world and labeled him a suspect in the Bones case. Harry? Bosch nearly jumped. He turned around and looked at Edgar. Don't do that to me, man. What? Edgar was staring at the body as he spoke. He left a three-page note out on the coffee table. Bosch stepped out of the shower and pushed past Edgar. He headed toward the living room, taking a pair of latex gloves from his pocket and blowing into them to expand the rubber before snapping them on. Did you read the whole thing? Yeah. He says he didn't do the kid. He says he's killing himself because the police and reporters have destroyed him and he can't go on. Like that. There's some weird stuff, too. Bosch went into the living room. Edgar was a few steps behind him. Bosch saw three handwritten pages spread side by side on the coffee table. He sat down on the couch in front of them. This how they were? Yep. I didn't touch them. Bosch started reading the pages. What he presumed were Trent's last words were a rambling denial of the murder of the boy on the hillside and a purging of anger over what had been done to him. Now everybody will know. You people have ruined me. Killed me. The blood is on you, not on me. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. No, no, no. I never hurt anyone. Never, never, never. Not a soul on this earth. I love the children. Love. No, it was you who hurt me. You. But it is I who can't live with the pain of what you have ruthlessly caused. I can't. It was repetitive and almost as if someone had written down an extemporaneous diatribe rather than sat down with pen and paper and wrote out their thoughts. The middle of the second page was blocked off and inside the box were names under a heading of Those Found Responsible. The list started with Judy Sertain included the anchor on the Channel 4 Nightly News, and listed Bosch, Edgar, and three names Bosch didn't recognize. Calvin Stumbo, Max Rebner, and Alicia Felzer. Stumbo was the cop and Rebner was the DA on the first case, Edgar said, in the 60s. Bosch nodded. And Felzer? Don't know that one. The pen with which the pages were apparently written was on the table next to the last page. Bosch didn't touch it because he planned to have it checked for Trent's fingerprints. As he continued to read, Bosch noticed that each page was signed at the bottom with Trent's signature. At the end of the last page, Trent made an odd plea that Bosch didn't readily understand. My one regret is for my children. Who will care for my children? They need food and clothes. I have some money. The money goes to them. Whatever I have. This is my last will and testament signed by me. Give the money to the children. Have Morton give the money and don't charge me anything. Do it for the children. His children? Bosch asked. Yeah, I know, Edgar said. Weird. What are you doing here? Where is Nicholas? They looked at the doorway from the kitchen to the living room. A short man in a suit, who Bosch guessed was a lawyer, and had to be Morton, stood there. Bosch stood up. He's dead. It looks like a suicide. Where? Master Bath, but I wouldn't... 
Morton was already gone, heading to the bathroom. Bosch called after him. Don't touch anything. He nodded to Edgar to follow and make sure. Bosch sat back down and looked at the pages again. He wondered how long it took Trent to decide that killing himself was all that he had left, and then to labor over the three-page note. It was the longest suicide note he had ever encountered. Morton came back into the living room, Edgar just behind him. His face was ashen, and his eyes held on the floor. I tried to tell you not to go back there, Bosch said. The lawyer's eyes came up and fixed on Bosch. They filled with anger which seemed to restore some color to Morton's face. Are you people happy now? You completely destroyed him. Give a man's secret to the vultures, they put it on the air, and this is what you get. He gestured with a hand in the direction of the bathroom. Mr. Morton, you've got your facts wrong, but essentially it looks like that's what happened. In fact, you'd probably be surprised by how much I agree with you. Now that he's dead, that must be very easy for you to say. Is that a note? Did he leave a note? Bosch got up and gestured for him to take his spot on the couch in front of the three pages. Just don't touch the pages. Morton sat down, unfolded a pair of reading glasses, and started studying the pages. Bosch walked over to Edgar and said in a low voice, I'm going to use the phone in the kitchen to make the calls. Edgar nodded. Better get media relations on it. The shit is going to hit that fan. Yeah. Bosch picked up the wall phone in the kitchen and saw it had a redial button. He pushed it and waited. He recognized the voice that answered as Morton's. It was an answering machine. Morton said he wasn't home and to leave a message. Bosch called Lieutenant Billet's direct line. She answered right away, and Bosch could tell she was eating. Well, I hate to break this to you while you're eating, but we're up here at Trent's place. It looks like he killed himself. There was silence for a long moment, and then she asked Bosch if he was sure. I'm sure he's dead, and I'm pretty sure he did it himself. Hung himself with a couple of wire hangers in the shower. There's a three-page note here. He denies anything to do with the bones. He blames his death on Channel 4 and the police, mostly. Me and Edgar, in particular. You're the first one I've called. Well, we all know it wasn't you who... That's okay, Lieutenant. I don't need the absolution. What do you want me to do here? You handle the routine call-outs. I'll call Chief Irving's office and tell him what has transpired. This is going to get hot. Yes. What about media relations? There's already a gang of reporters out on the street. I'll call them. Did you do anything about Thornton yet? Already in the pipeline. The woman from IAD, Bradley, is running with it. With this latest thing, I'd bet Thornton not only leaked his way out of a job, but they might want to go after him with a charge of some kind. Bosch nodded. Thornton deserved it. He still had no second thoughts about the scam he had devised. All right, well, we'll be here. For a while, at least. Let me know if you find anything there that connects him to the bones. Bosch thought of the boots with the dirt and the treads and the skateboard. You got it, he said. Bosch clicked off the call and then immediately made calls to the coroner's office and Sid. In the living room, Morton had finished reading the note. Mr. Morton, when was the last time you talked to Mr. Trent? Bosch asked. Last night. He called me at home after the news on Channel 4. His boss had seen it and called him. Bosch nodded. That accounted for the last call. You know his boss's name? Morton pointed to the middle page on the table. Right here on the list. Alicia Felzer. She told him she was going to seek his termination. The studio makes movies for children. She couldn't have him on a set with a child, you see. The leaking of his record to the media destroyed this man. You recklessly took a man's existence and... Let me ask the questions, Mr. Morton. You can save your outrage for when you go outside and talk to the reporters yourself, which I know you'll do. What about that last page? 
He mentions the children, his children. What does that mean? I have no idea. He obviously was emotionally distraught when he wrote this. It may mean nothing. Bosch remained standing, studying the attorney. Why did he call you last night? Why do you think? To tell me you had been here, that it was all over the news, that his boss had seen it and wanted to fire him. Did he say whether he buried that boy up there on the hill? Morton put on the best indignant look he could muster. He certainly said that he did not have a thing to do with it. He believed he was being persecuted for a past mistake, a very distant mistake, and I'd say he was correct about that. Bosch nodded. Okay, Mr. Morton. You can leave now. What are you talking about? I'm not going to... This house is now a crime scene. We are investigating your client's death to confirm or deny it was by his own hand. You're no longer welcome here. Jerry? Edgar stepped over to the couch and waved Morton up. Come on. Time to go out there and get your face on TV. It'll be good for business, right? Morton stood up and left in a huff. Bosch walked over to the front windows and pulled the curtain back a few inches. When Morton came down the side of the house to the driveway, he immediately walked to the center of the knot of reporters and started talking angrily. Bosch couldn't hear what was said. He didn't need to. When Edgar came back into the room, Bosch told him to call the watch office and get a patrol car up to Wonderland for crowd control. He had a feeling that the media mob, like a virus replicating itself, was going to start growing bigger and hungrier by the minute. Chapter 19 They found Nicholas Trent's children when they searched his home following the removal of his body. Filling the entire two drawers of a small desk in the living room, a desk Bosch had not searched the night before, were files, photographs, and financial records, including several thick bank envelopes containing canceled checks. Trent had been sending small amounts of money on a monthly basis to a number of charitable organizations that fed and clothed children. From Appalachia to the Brazilian rainforest to Kosovo, Trent had been sending checks for years. Bosch found no check for an amount higher than $12. He found dozens and dozens of photographs of the children he was supposedly helping, as well as small handwritten notes from them. Bosch had seen any number of public service ads for the charities on late-night television. He had always been suspicious. Not about whether a few dollars could keep a child from going hungry and unclothed, but about whether the few dollars would actually get to them. He wondered if the photos Trent kept in the drawers of his desk were the same stock shot sent to everybody who contributed. He wondered if the thank-you notes in childish printing were fake. Man! Edgar said as he surveyed the contents of the desk. This guy, it's like I think he was paying a penance or something. Sending all his cash to these outfits. Yeah, a penance for what? We may never know. Edgar went back to searching the second bedroom. Bosch studied some of the photos he had spread on the top of the desk. There were boys and girls, none looking older than ten, though this was hard to estimate because they all had the hollow and ancient eyes of children who have been through war and famine and indifference. He picked up one shot of a young white boy and turned it over. The information said the boy had been orphaned during the fighting in Kosovo. He had been injured in the mortar blast that killed his parents. His name was Milos Fedor, and he was ten years old. Bosch had been orphaned at age eleven. He looked into the boy's eyes and saw his own. At 4 p.m., they locked Trent's home and took three boxes of seized materials to the car. A small group of reporters lingered outside during the whole afternoon, despite word from media relations that all information on the day's events would be distributed through Parker Center. The reporters approached them with questions, but Bosch quickly said he was not allowed to comment on the investigation. They put the boxes in the trunk and drove off, heading downtown, where a meeting had been called by Deputy Chief Irvin Irving. Bosch was uncomfortable with himself as he drove. 
He was ill at ease because Trent's suicide, and he had no doubts now that it was, had served to deflect the forward movement of the investigation of the boy's death. Bosch had spent half the day going through Trent's belongings when what he had wanted to be doing was nailing down the ID of the boy, running out the lead he had received in the call-in reports. What's the matter, Harry? Edgar asked at one point on the drive. What? I don't know. You're acting all morose. I know that's probably your natural disposition, but you usually don't show it so much. Edgar smiled, but didn't get one in return from Bosch. I'm just thinking about things. This guy might be alive today if we had handled things differently. Come on, Harry. You mean like if we didn't investigate him? There was no way. We did our job and things ran their course. Nothing we could do. If anybody's responsible, it's Thornton, and he's going to get his due. But if you ask me, the world's better off without somebody like Trent in it anyway. My conscience is clear, man. Crystal clear. Good for you. Bosch thought about his decision to give Edgar the day off on Sunday. If he hadn't done that, Edgar might have been the one to make the computer runs on the names. His rider would have been out of the loop, and the information would have never gotten to Thornton. He sighed. Everything always seemed to work on a domino theory. If, then, if, then, if, then. What's your gut say on this guy? He asked Edgar. You mean, like, did he do the boy on the hill? Bosch nodded. I don't know, Edgar said. Have to see what the lab says about the dirt and the sister says about the skateboard. If it is the sister and we get an ID. Bosch didn't say anything. But he always felt uncomfortable about relying on lab reports and determining which way to go with an investigation. What about you, Harry? Bosch thought of the photos of all the children Trent thought he was caring for. His act of contrition. His chance at redemption. I'm thinking we're spinning our wheels, he said. He isn't the guy. Chapter 20 Deputy Chief Irvin Irving sat behind his desk in his spacious office on the sixth floor of Parker Center. Also seated in the room were Lieutenant Grace Billets, Bosch and Edgar, and an officer from the Media Relations Unit named Sergio Medina. Irving's adjutant, a female lieutenant named Simonton, stood in the open doorway of the office in case she was needed. Irving had a glass-topped desk. There was nothing on it except for two pieces of paper with printing on them that Bosch could not read from his spot in front of Irving's desk and to the left. Now then, Irving began, what do we know as fact about Mr. Trent? We know he was a pedophile with a criminal record of abusing a child. We know that he lived a stone's throw from the burial site of a murdered child. And we know that he committed suicide on the evening he was questioned by investigators in regard to the first two points just stated. Irving picked up one of the pages on his desk and studied it without sharing its contents with the room. Finally, he spoke. I have here a press release that states those same three facts and goes on to say, Mr. Trent is the subject of an ongoing investigation. Determination of whether he was responsible for the death of the victim found buried near his home is pending lab work and follow-up investigation. He looked at the page silently again, and then finally put it down. Nice and succinct. But it will do little to quell the thirst of the media for this story or to help us avert another troubling situation for this department. Bosch cleared his throat. Irving seemed to ignore it at first, but then spoke without looking at the detective. Yes, Detective Bosch? Well, it sort of seems as though you're not satisfied with that. The problem is, what is on that press release is exactly where we stand. I'd love to tell you I think the guy did the kid on the hill. I'd love to tell you I know he did it. But we are a long way from that, and if anything, I think we're going to end up concluding the opposite. Based on what? Irving snapped. It was becoming clear to Bosch what the purpose of the meeting was. He guessed that the second page on Irving's desk was the press release the deputy chief wanted to put out. It probably pinned everything on Trent and called his suicide the result of his knowing he would be found out. This would allow the department to handle Thornton 
the leaker, quietly, outside of the magnifying glass of the press. It would spare the department the humiliation of acknowledging that a leak of confidential information from one of its officers caused a possibly innocent man to kill himself. It would also allow them to close the case of the boy on the hill. Bosch understood that everyone sitting in the room knew that closing a case of this nature was the longest of long shots. The case had drawn growing media attention, and Trent with his suicide had now presented them with a way out. Suspicions could be cast on the dead pedophile, and the department could call it a day and move on to the next case, hopefully one with a better chance of being solved. Bosch could understand this, but not accept it. He had seen the bones. He had heard Gallagher run down the litany of injuries. In that autopsy suite, Bosch had resolved to find the killer and close the case. The expediency of department politics and image management would be second to that. He reached into his coat pocket and pulled out his notebook. He opened it to a page with a folded corner and looked at it as if he was studying a page full of notes. But there was only one notation on the page, written on Saturday in the autopsy suite. Forty-four separate indications of trauma. His eyes held on the number he had written until Irving spoke again. Detective Bosch? I asked, based on what? Bosch looked up and closed the notebook. Based on the timing. We don't think Trent moved into that neighborhood until after that boy was in the ground, and on the analysis of the bones. This kid was physically abused over a long period of time, from when he was a small child. It doesn't add up to Trent. Analysis of both the timing and the bones will not be conclusive, Irving said. No matter what they tell us, there is still a possibility, no matter how slim, that Nicholas Trent was the perpetrator of this crime. A very slim possibility. What about the search of Trent's home today? We took some old work boots with dried mud in the treads. It'll be compared to soil samples taken where the bones were found. But they'll be just as inconclusive. Even if they match up, Trent could have picked up the dirt hiking behind his house. It's all part of the same sediment, geologically speaking. What else? Not much. We've got a skateboard. A skateboard? Bosch explained about the call-in tip he had not had time to follow up on because of the suicide. As he told it, he could see Irving warming to the possibility that a skateboard in Trent's possession could be linked to the bones on the hill. I want that to be your priority, he said. I want that nailed down and I want to know it the moment you do. Bosch only nodded. Yes, sir, Billets threw in. Irving went silent and studied the two pages on his desk. Finally, he picked up the one he had not read from. The page Bosch guessed was the loaded press release and turned in his desk. He slid it into a shredder which whined loudly as it destroyed the document. He then turned back to his desk and picked up the remaining document. Officer Medina, you may put this out to the press. He handed the document to Medina, who stood up to receive it. Irving checked his watch. Just in time for the six o'clock news, he said. Sir, Medina said. Yes. Um, there have been many inquiries about the erroneous reports on Channel 4. Should we... Say it is against policy to comment on any internal investigation. You may also add that the department will not condone or accept the leaking of confidential information to the media. That is all, Officer Medina. Medina looked like he had another question to ask, but knew better. He nodded and left the office. Irving nodded to his adjutant, and she closed the office door, remaining in the anteroom outside. The deputy chief then turned his head looking from Billets to Edgar to Bosch. We have a delicate situation here, he said. Are we clear on how we are proceeding? Yes, Billets and Edgar said in unison. Bosch said nothing. Irving looked at him. Detective, do you have something to say? Bosch thought a moment before answering. I just want to say that I'm going to find out who killed that boy and put him up in that hole. If it's Trent, fine. Good. But if it's not him, I'm going to keep going. 
Irving saw something on his desk. Something small, like a hair or other near-microscopic particle. Something Bush couldn't see. Irving picked it up with two fingers and dropped it into the trash can behind him. As he brushed his fingers together over the shredder, Bosch looked on and wondered if the demonstration was some sort of threat directed at him. Not every case is solved, detective. Not every case is solvable, he said. At some point our duties may require us to move on to more pressing matters. Are you giving me a deadline? No, detective. I am saying I understand you. And I just hope you understand me. What's going to happen with Thornton? It's under internal review. I can't discuss it with you at this time. Bosch shook his head in frustration. Watch yourself, Detective Bosch, Irving said curtly. I've shown a lot of patience with you. On this case and others before it. What Thornton did jammed up this case. He should, if he is responsible, he'll be dealt with accordingly. But keep in mind, he was not operating in a vacuum. He needed to get the information in order to leak it. The investigation is ongoing. Bosch stared at Irving. The message was clear. His rider could go down with Thornton if Bosch didn't fall into step with Irving's march. You read me, detective? I read you. Loud and clear. Chapter 21 before taking Edgar back to Hollywood Division and then heading out to Venice, Bosch got the evidence box containing the skateboard out of the trunk and took it back inside Parker Center to the SID lab. At the counter, he asked for Antoine Jesper. While he waited, he studied the skateboard. It appeared to be made out of laminated plywood. It had a lacquered finish to which several decals had been applied, most notably a skull and crossbones located in the middle of the top surface of the board. When Jesper came to the counter, Bosch presented him with the evidence box. I want to know who made this, when it was made, and where it was sold, he said. It's priority one. I got the sixth floor riding my back on this case. No problem. I can tell you the make right now. It's a bony board. They don't make them anymore. He sold out and moved, I think, to Hawaii. How do you know all of that? Because when I was a kid, I was a boarder, and this was what I wanted but never had the dough for. Pretty ironic, huh? What is? A bony board in the case? You know, bones? Bosch nodded. Whatever. I want whatever you can get me by tomorrow. Mm, I can try. I can't promise tomorrow, Antoine. The sixth floor, remember? I'll be talking to you tomorrow. Jesper nodded. Give me the morning at least. You got it. Anything happening with documents? Jesper shook his head. Nothing yet. She tried the dies and nothing came up. I don't think you should count on anything there, Harry. All right, Antoine. Bosch left him there holding the box. On the way back to Hollywood, he let Edgar drive while he pulled the tip sheet out of his briefcase and called Sheila Delacroix on his cell phone. She answered promptly, and Bosch introduced himself and said her call had been referred to him. Was it Arthur? she asked urgently. We don't know, ma'am. That's why I'm calling. Oh. Will it be possible for me and my partner to come see you tomorrow morning to talk about Arthur and get some information? It will help us to be better able to determine if the remains are those of your brother. I understand. Mm, yes. You can come here if that is convenient. Where is there, ma'am? Oh, at my home, off Wilshire in the Miracle Mile. Bosch looked at the address on the call-in sheet. On Orange Grove. Yes, that's correct. Is 8.30 too early for you? That would be fine, officer. If I can help, I would like to. It just bothers me to think that that man lived there all those years after doing something like this, even if the victim wasn't my brother. Bosch decided it wasn't worth telling her that Trent was probably completely innocent in terms of the bone case. There were too many people in the world who believed everything they saw on television. Instead, Bosch gave her his cell phone number and told her to call it if something came up and 8.30 the next morning turned out to be a bad time for her. 
It won't be a bad time, she said. I want to help. If it's Arthur, I want to know. Part of me wants it to be him, so I know it is over. But the other part wants it to be somebody else. That way I can keep thinking he's out there someplace. Maybe with a family of his own now. I understand, Bosch said. We'll see you in the morning. Chapter 22 It was a brutal drive to Venice, and Bosch arrived more than a half hour late. His lateness was then compounded by his fruitless search for a parking space before he went back to the library lot in defeat. His delay was no bother to Julia Brasher, who was in the critical stage of putting things together in the kitchen. She instructed him to go to the stereo and put on some music, then pour himself a glass of wine from the bottle that was already open on the coffee table. She did not make a move to touch him or kiss him, but her manner was completely warm. He thought things seemed good, that maybe he had gotten past the gaff of the night before. He chose a CD of live recordings of the Bill Evans trio at the Village Vanguard in New York. He had the CD at home and knew it would make for quiet dinner music. He poured himself a glass of red wine and casually walked around the living room, looking at the things she had on display. The mantle of the white brick fireplace was crowded with small framed photos he hadn't gotten a chance to look at the night before. Some were propped on stands and displayed more prominently than others. Not all were of people. Some photos were of places he assumed she had visited in her travels. There was a ground shot of a live volcano billowing smoke and spewing molten debris in the air. There was an underwater shot of the gaping mouth and jagged teeth of a shark. The killer fish appeared to be launching itself right at the camera, and whoever was behind it. At the edge of the photo, Bosch could see one of the iron bars of the cage the photographer, who he assumed was Brasher, had been protected by. There was a photo of Brasher with two aboriginal men on either side of her standing somewhere, Bosch assumed, in the Australian outback. And there were several other photos of her with what appeared to be fellow backpackers in other locations of exotic or rugged terrain that Bosch could not readily identify. In none of the photos in which Julia was a subject was she looking at the camera. Her eyes were always staring off in the distance, or at one of the other individuals posed with her. In the last position on the mantel, as if hidden behind the other photos, was a small gold-framed shot of a much younger Julia Brasher with a slightly older man. Bosch reached behind the photos and lifted it out so he could see it better. The couple was sitting at a restaurant, or perhaps a wedding reception. Julia wore a beige gown with a low-cut neckline. The man wore a tuxedo. You know, this man is a god in Japan, Julia called from the kitchen. Bosch put the framed photo back in its place and walked to the kitchen. Her hair was down, and he couldn't decide which way he liked it best. Bill Evans? Yeah. It seems like they have whole channels of the radio dedicated to playing his music. Don't tell me. You spend some time in Japan, too. About two months. It's a fascinating place. It looked to Bosch like she was making a risotto with chicken and asparagus in it. Smells good. Thank you. I hope it is. So what do you think you were running from? She looked up at him from her work at the stove. A hand held a stirring spoon steady. What? You know, all the travel. Leaving Daddy's law firm to go swim with sharks and dive into volcanoes. Was it the old man or the law firm the old man ran? Some people would look at it as maybe I was running toward something. The guy in the tuxedo? Harry, take your gun off. Leave your badge at the door. I always do. Sorry. She went back to work at the stove and Bosch came up behind her. He put his hands on her shoulders and pushed his thumbs into the indentations of her upper spine. She offered no resistance. Soon he felt her muscles begin to relax. He noticed her empty wine glass on the counter. I'll go get the wine. 
He came back with his glass and the bottle. He refilled her glass, and she picked it up and clicked it off the side of his. Whether to something or away from something, here's to running, she said. Just running. What happened to hold fast? There's that, too. Here's to forgiveness and reconciliation. They clicked glasses again. He came around behind her and started working her neck again. You know, I thought about your story all last night after you left, she said. My story? About the bullet in the tunnel? And? She shrugged her shoulders. Nothing. It's just amazing, that's all. You know, after that day, I wasn't afraid anymore when I went down in the darkness. I just knew that I was going to make it through. I can't explain why. I just knew. Which, of course, was stupid, because there are no guarantees of that. Back then and there or anywhere else. It made me sort of reckless. He held his hand steady for a moment. It's not good to be too reckless, he said. You cross the tube too often, you'll eventually get burned. Hmm. Are you lecturing me, Harry? Do you want to be my training officer now? No. I checked my gun and my badge at the door, remember? Okay, then. She turned around, his hand still on her neck, and kissed him. Then she pulled back away. You know, the great thing about this risotto is that it can keep in the oven as long as we need it to. Bosch smiled. Later on, after they had made love, Bosch got up from her bed and went out to the living room. Where are you going? she called after him. When he didn't answer, she called out to him to turn the oven up. He came back into the room carrying the gold-framed photo. He got into the bed and turned on the light on the bed table. It was a low wattage bulb beneath a heavy lampshade. The room still was cast in shadow. Harry? What are you doing? Julia said in a tone that warned he was treading close to her heart. Did you turn the oven up? Yeah. 350. Tell me about this guy. Why? I just want to know. It's a private story. I know. But you can tell me. She tried to take the photo away, but he held it out of her reach. Is he the one? Did he break your heart and send you running? Harry, I thought you took your badge off. I did. And my clothes. Everything. She smiled. Well, I'm not telling you anything. She was on her back, head propped on a pillow. Bosch put the picture on the bed table and then turned back and moved in next to her. Under the sheet, he put his arm across her body and pulled her tightly to him. Look, you want to trade scars again? I got my heart broken twice by the same woman. And you know what? I kept her picture on a shelf in my living room for a long time. Then, on New Year's Day, I decided it had been a long enough time. I put her picture away. Then I got called out to work, and I met you. She looked at him, her eyes moving slightly back and forth as she seemed to be searching his face for something, maybe the slightest hint of insincerity. Yes, she finally said. He broke my heart. Okay? No, not okay. Who is the creep? She started laughing. Harry, you're my knight in tarnished armor, aren't you? She pulled herself up into a sitting position, the sheet falling away from her breasts. She folded her arms across them. He was in the firm. I really fell for him, right down the old elevator shaft. And then, then he decided it was over. And he decided to betray me and to tell secret things to my father. What things? She shook her head. Things I will never tell a man again. Where was that picture taken? Oh, at a firm function. Probably the New Year's banquet. I don't remember. They have a lot of them. 
Bosch had become angled behind her. He leaned down and kissed her back, just above the tattoo. I couldn't be there anymore while he was there, so I quit. I said I wanted to travel. My father thought it was a midlife crisis because I had turned 30. I just let him think it. But then I had to do what I said I wanted to do. Travel. I went to Australia first. It was the farthest place I could think of. Bosch pulled himself up and stacked two pillows behind his back. He then pulled her back against his chest. He kissed the top of her head and kept his nose in her hair. I had a lot of money from the firm, she said. I didn't have to worry. I just kept traveling, going wherever I wanted, working odd jobs when I felt like it. I didn't come home for almost four years. And when I did, that's when I joined the academy. I was walking along the boardwalk and saw the little Venice Community Service Office. I went in and picked up a pamphlet. It all happened pretty fast after that. Your history shows impulsive and possibly reckless decision-making processes. How did that get by the screeners? She gently elbowed him in the side, setting off a flare of pain from his ribs. He tensed. Oh, Harry, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, sure. She laughed. I guess all you old guys know that the department's been pushing big time for what they term mature women cadets the last few years, to smooth off all the hard testosterone edges of the department. She rocked her hips back against Bosch's genitals to underline the point. And speaking of testosterone, she said, you never told me how it went with old Bullethead himself today. Bosch groaned but didn't answer. You know, she said, Irving came to address our class one day on the moral responsibilities that come with carrying the badge. And everybody sitting there knew the guy probably makes more backroom deals up there on the sixth floor than there are days in the year. The guy's the classic fixer. He could practically cut the irony in the auditorium with a knife. Her use of the word irony made Bosch flash on what Antoine Jesper had said about coupling the bones found on the hill with the bones on the skateboard. He felt his body tensing as thoughts of the case started encroaching on what had been an oasis of respite from the investigation. She sensed his tightness. What is it? Nothing. You got all tense all of a sudden. The case, I guess. She was quiet a moment. I think it's kind of amazing, she then said. Those bones being up there all of these years and then coming up out of the ground. Like a ghost or something. It's a city of bones. And all of them are waiting to come up. He paused. I don't want to talk about Irving or the bones or the case or anything else right now. Then what do you want? He didn't answer. She turned to face him and started pushing him down off the pillows until he was flat on his back. How about a mature woman to smooth off all the hard edges again? It was impossible for Bosch not to smile. Chapter 23 Before dawn, Bosch was on the road. He left Julia Brasher sleeping in her bed and started on his way to his home after first stopping at Abbott's Habit for a coffee to go. Venice was like a ghost town, with the tendrils of the morning fog moving across the streets. But as he got closer to Hollywood, the lights of cars on the streets multiplied, and Bosch was reminded that the City of Bones was a 24-hour city. At home, he showered and put on fresh clothes. He then climbed back into his car and went down the hill to Hollywood Division. It was 7.30 when he got there. Surprisingly, a number of detectives were already in place, chasing paperwork and cases. Edgar wasn't among them. Bosch put his briefcase down and walked to the watch office to get coffee and to see if any citizen had brought in donuts. Almost every day, a John Q., who still kept the faith, brought in donuts for the division. A little way of saying there were still those out there who knew or at least understood the difficulties of the job. Every day in every division, cops put on the badge and tried to do their best in a place where the populace didn't understand them, didn't particularly like them, 
and in many instances outright despised them. Bosch always thought it was amazing how far a box of donuts could go in undoing that. He poured a cup and dropped a dollar in the basket. He took a sugar donut out of a box on the counter that had already been decimated by the patrol guys. No wonder. They were from Bub's Donuts and the Farmer's Market. He noticed Mankiewicz sitting at his desk, his dark eyebrows forming a deep V as he studied what looked like a deployment chart. Hey, Mank, I think we pulled the grade A lead off the call-in sheets. Thought you'd want to know. Mankiewicz answered without looking up. Good. Let me know when my guys can give it a rest. We're going to be short on the desk the next few days. Bush knew this meant he was juggling personnel. When there weren't enough uniforms to put in cars, due to vacations, court appearances, or sick outs, the watch sergeant always pulled people off the desk and put them on wheels. You got it. Edgar still wasn't at the table when Bosch got back to the detective squad room. Bosch put his coffee and donut down next to one of the Selectrics and went to get a search warrant application out of a community file drawer. For the next 15 minutes, he typed out an addendum to the search warrant he had already delivered to the records custodian at Queen of Angels. It asked for all records from the care of Arthur Delacroix, circa 1975 to 1985. When he was finished, he took it to the fax machine and sent it to the office of Judge John A. Houghton, who had signed all the hospital search warrants the day before. He added a note requesting that the judge review the addendum application as soon as possible, because it might lead to the positive identification of the bones and therefore swing the investigation into focus. Bosch returned to the table and from a drawer pulled out the stack of missing person reports he had gathered while fishing in the archives. He started looking through them quickly, glancing only at the box reserved for the name of the missing individual. In ten minutes he was finished. There had been no report in the stack about Arthur Delacroix. He didn't know what this meant, but he planned to ask the boy's sister about it. It was now eight o'clock and Bosch was ready to leave to visit the sister. But still, no Edgar. Bosch ate the remainder of his donut and decided to give his partner ten minutes to show before he would leave on his own. He had worked with Edgar for more than ten years and still was bothered by his partner's lack of punctuality. It was one thing to be late for dinner. It was another to be late for a case. He had always taken Edgar's tardiness as a lack of commitment to their mission as homicide investigators. His direct line rang, and Bosch answered it with an annoyed rasp, expecting it to be Edgar announcing he was running late. But it wasn't Edgar. It was Julia Brasher. So you just leave a woman high and dry in bed, huh? Bosch smiled, and his frustration with Edgar quickly drained away. I got a busy day here, he said. I had to get going. I know, but you could have said goodbye. Bosch saw Edgar making his way through the squad room. He wanted to get going before Edgar started his coffee, donut, and sports page ritual. Well, I'm saying goodbye now, okay? I'm in the middle of something here, and I gotta run. Harry, what? I thought you were gonna hang up on me or something. I'm not, but I gotta go. Look, come by before you go up for roll call, okay? I'll probably be back by then. All right. I'll see you. Bosch hung up and stood up just as Edgar got to the homicide table and dropped the folded sports page at his spot. You ready? Yeah, I was just going to get... Let's go. I don't want to keep the lady waiting. And she'll probably have coffee there. On the way out, Bosch checked the incoming tray on the fax machine. His search warrant addendum had been signed and returned by Judge Houghton. We're in business, Bosch said to Edgar, showing him the warrant as they walked to the car. See? You come in early, you get stuff done. What's that supposed to mean? Is that a crack on me? It means what it means, I guess. I just want some coffee. Chapter 24 Sheila Delacroix lived in a part of the city called the Miracle Mile. It was a neighborhood south of Wilshire that wasn't quite up to the standards of nearby Hancock Park, 
but was lined with nicely kept homes and duplexes with modest stylistic adjustments to promote individuality. Delacroix's home was the second floor of a duplex with pseudo Beaux Arts styling. She invited the detectives into her home in a friendly manner, but when the first question Edgar asked was about coffee, she said it was against her religion. She offered tea, and Edgar reluctantly accepted. Bosch passed. He wondered which religion outlawed coffee. They took seats in the living room while the woman made Edgar his tea in the kitchen. She called out to them, saying she only had an hour and then had to leave for work. What is it you do? Bosch asked as she came out with a mug of hot tea. The tag from the tea bag looped over the side. She put it down on a coaster on a side table next to Edgar. She was a tall woman. She was slightly overweight with blonde hair cut short. Bosch thought she wore too much makeup. I'm a casting agent, she said, as she took a seat on the couch. Mostly independent films, some episodic television. I'm actually casting a cop show this week. Bosch watched Edgar sip some tea and make a face. He then held the mug so he could read the teabag tag. It's a blend, Delacroix said. Strawberry and Darjeeling. Do you like it? Edgar put the mug down on its coaster. It's fine. Miss Delacroix, if you're in the entertainment business, did you by any chance know Nicholas Trent? Please, just call me Sheila. Now, that name, Nicholas Trent, it sounds familiar, but I can't quite place it. Is he an actor or is he in casting? Neither. He's the man who lived up on Wonderland. He was a set designer. I mean, decorator. Oh, the one on TV, the man who killed himself. Oh, no wonder it was familiar. So you didn't know him from the business, then? No, not at all. Okay, well, I shouldn't have asked that. We're out of order here. Let's just start with your brother. Tell us about Arthur. Do you have a picture we can look at? Yes, she said, as she stood up and walked behind his chair. Here he is. She went to a waist-high cabinet Bosch hadn't noticed behind him. There were framed photos on it, displayed in much the same way he had seen the photos on Julia Brasher's mantle. Delacroix chose one and turned around and handed it to Bosch. The frame contained a photo of a boy and a girl sitting on a set of stairs Bosch recognized as the stairs they had climbed before knocking on her door. The boy was much smaller than the girl. Both were smiling at the camera and had the smiles of children who have been told to smile. A lot of teeth, but not a legitimately turned up mouth. Bosch handed the photo to Edgar and looked at Delacroix, who had returned to the couch. Those stairs. Was that taken here? Yes, this is the home we grew up in. When he disappeared, it was from here? Yes. Are any of his belongings still here in the house? Delacroix smiled sadly and shook her head. No, it's all gone. I gave his things to the charity rummage sale at church. That was a long time ago. What church is that? The Wilshire Church of Nature. Bosch just nodded. They're the ones who don't let you have coffee? Edgar asked. Nothing with caffeine. Edgar put the framed photo down next to his tea. Do you have any other photos of him? He asked. Of course. I have a box of old photos. Can we look at those? You know, while we talk? Delacroix's eyebrows came together in confusion. Sheila, Bosch said. We found some clothing with the remains. We would like to look at the photos to see if any of it matches. It will help the investigation. She nodded. I see. Well, then I'll be right back. I just need to go to the closet in the hallway. Do you need help? No, I can manage. After she was gone, Edgar leaned over to Bosch and whispered, this church of nature tea tastes like piss water. Bosch whispered back, How would you know what piss water tastes like? The skin around Edgar's eyes drew tight with embarrassment as he realized he had walked into that one. Before he could muster a response, Sheila Delacroix came back into the room carrying an old shoebox. 
She put it down on the coffee table and removed the lid. The box was filled with loose photographs. These aren't in any order or anything, but he should be in a lot of them. Bosch nodded to Edgar, who reached into the box for the first stack of photos. While my partner looks through these, why don't you tell me about your brother and when he disappeared? Sheila nodded and composed her thoughts before beginning. May 4th, 1980. He didn't come home from school. That's it. That's all. We thought he had run away. You said you found clothes with the remains. Well, my father looked in his drawers and said that Arthur had taken clothes. That was what made us think he had run away. Bosch wrote a few notes down in a notebook he had pulled from his coat pocket. You mentioned that he had been injured a few months before on a skateboard. Yes, he hit his head and they had to operate. When he disappeared, did he take his skateboard? She thought about this for a long moment. It was so long ago. All I know is that he loved that board. So I think he probably took it. But I just remember the clothes. My father found some of his clothes missing. Did you report him missing? I was 16 years old at the time, so I didn't do anything. My father talked to the police, though. I'm sure of it. I couldn't find any record of Arthur being reported missing. Are you sure he reported him missing? I drove with him to the police station. Was it Wilshire Division? I would assume, but I don't really remember. Sheila, where is your father? Is he still alive? He's alive. He lives in the valley, but he's not well these days. Where in the valley? Van Nuys, in the Manchester trailer park. There was silence while Bosch wrote the information down. He had been to the Manchester trailer park before on investigations. It wasn't a pleasant place to live. He drinks. Bosch looked at her. Ever since Arthur. Bosch nodded that he understood. Edgar leaned forward and handed him a photograph. It was a yellowed three-by-five. It showed a young boy, his arms raised in an effort to maintain balance, gliding on the sidewalk on a skateboard. The angle of the photograph showed little of the skateboard other than its profile. Bosch could not tell if it carried a bone design on it or not. Can't see much there, he said, as he started to hand the photo back. No, the clothes, the shirt. Bosch looked at the photo again. Edgar was right. The boy in the photo wore a gray T-shirt with Solid Surf printed across the chest. Bosch showed the photo to Sheila. This is your brother, right? She leaned forward to look at the photo. Yes, definitely. That shirt he's wearing, do you remember if it is one of the pieces of clothing your father found missing? Delacroix shook her head. I can't remember. It's been... I just remember that he liked that shirt a lot. Bosch nodded and gave the photo back to Edgar. It wasn't the kind of solid confirmation they could get from x-rays and bone comparison, but it was one more notch. Bosch was feeling more and more sure that they were about to identify the bones. He watched Edgar put the photo in a short stack of pictures he intended to borrow from Sheila's collection. Bosch checked his watch and looked back at Sheila. What about your mother? Sheila immediately shook her head. Nope. She was long gone by the time all of this happened. You mean she died? I mean she took a bus the minute the going got tough. You see, Arthur was a difficult child, right from the beginning. He needed a lot of attention, and it fell to my mother. After a while, she couldn't take it any longer. One night she went out to get some medicine at the drugstore, and she never came back. We found little notes from her under our pillows. Bosch dropped his eyes to his notebook. It was hard to hear this story and keep looking at Sheila Delacroix. How old were you? How old was your brother? I was six, so that would make Artie two. Bosch nodded. Did you keep the note from her? No. There was no need. 
I didn't need a reminder of how she supposedly loved us, but not enough to stay with us. What about Arthur? Did he keep his? Well, he was only two, so my father kept it for him. He gave it to him when he was older. He may have kept it, I don't know. Because he never really knew her, he was always very interested in what she was like. He asked me a lot of questions about her. There were no photos of her. My father had gotten rid of them all so he wouldn't have any reminders. Do you know what happened to her? Or if she's still alive? I haven't the faintest idea. And to tell you the truth, I don't care if she's alive or not. What is her name? Christine Dorset Delacroix. Dorset was her maiden name. Do you know her birth date or social security number? Sheila shook her head. Do you have your own birth certificate handy here? It's somewhere in my records. I could go look for it. She started to get up. No, wait. We can look for that at the end. I'd like to keep talking here. Okay. Hmm, after your mother was gone, did your father remarry? No, he never did. He lives alone now. Did he ever have a girlfriend? Someone who might have stayed in the house? She looked at Bosch with eyes that seemed almost lifeless. No, she said. Never. Bosch decided to move on to an area of discussion that would be less difficult for her. What school did your brother go to? At the end, he was going to the Brethren. Bosch didn't say anything. He wrote the name of the school down on his pad and then a large letter B beneath it. He circled the letter, thinking about the backpack. Sheila continued, unbidden. It was a private school for troubled boys. My dad paid to send him there. It's off of Crescent Heights near Pico. It's still there. Why did he go there? I mean, why was he considered troubled? Because he got kicked out of his other schools for fighting, mostly. Fighting, Edgar said. That's right. Edgar picked the top photograph off of his keeper file and studied it for a moment. This boy looks like he was as light as smoke. Was he the one starting these fights? Most times. He had trouble getting along. All he wanted to do was be on his skateboard. I think that by today's standards he would be diagnosed as having attention deficit disorder or something similar. He just wanted to be by himself all the time. Did he get hurt in these fights? Bosch asked. Sometimes. Black and blue, mostly. Broken bones? Not that I remember. Just schoolyard fights. Bosch felt agitated. The information they were getting could point them in many different directions. He had hoped a clear-cut path might emerge from the interview. You said your father searched the drawers in your brother's room and found clothes missing. That's right. Not a lot. Just a few things. Any idea what was missing, specifically? She shook her head. I can't remember. What did he take the clothes in? Like a suitcase or something? I think he took his school bag. Took out the books and put in some clothes. Do you remember what that looked like? No. Just a backpack. Everybody had to use the same thing at the Brethren. I still see kids walking on Pico with them. The backpacks with the bee on the back. Bosch glanced at Edgar, and then back at Delacroix. Let's go back to the skateboard. Are you sure he took it with him? She paused to think about this, then slowly nodded. Yes, I'm pretty sure he took it with him. Bosch decided to cut off the interview and concentrate on completing the identification. Once they confirmed the bones came from Arthur Delacroix, then they could come back to his sister. He thought about Gallagher's take on the injuries to the bones. Chronic abuse. Could it all have been injuries from schoolyard fights and skateboarding? He knew he needed to approach the issue of child abuse, but did not feel the time was appropriate. He also didn't want to tip his hand to the daughter so that she could turn around and possibly tell the father. What Bosch wanted was to back out and come back in later when he felt he had a tighter grasp on the case and a solid investigative plan to go with. Okay, we're going to wrap things up here pretty quickly, Sheila, 
Just a few more questions. Did Arthur have some friends? Maybe a best friend, someone he might confide in? She shook her head. Not really. He mostly was by himself. Bosch nodded and was about to close his notebook when she continued. There was one boy he'd go boarding with. His name was Johnny Stokes. He was from somewhere down near Pico. He was bigger and a little bit older than Arthur, but they were in the same class at the Brethren. My father was pretty sure he smoked pot, so we didn't like Arthur being friends with him. By we, you mean your dad and you? Yes, my father. He was upset about it. Did either of you talk to Johnny Stokes after Arthur went missing? Yes. That night when he didn't come home, my father called Johnny Stokes, but he said he hadn't seen Artie. The next day, when Dad went to the school to ask about him, he told me he talked to Johnny again about Artie. And what did he say? That he hadn't seen him. Bosch wrote down the friend's name in his notebook and underlined it. Any other friends you can think of? No, not really. What's your father's name? Samuel. Are you going to talk to him? Most likely. Her eyes dropped to the hands clasped in her lap. Is that a problem if we talk to him? Not really. He's just not well. If those bones turn out to be Arthur... I was thinking it would be better if he didn't ever know. We'll keep that in mind when we talk to him. But we won't do it until we have a positive identification. But if you talk to him, then he'll know. It may be unavoidable, Sheila. Edgar handed Bosch another photo. It showed Arthur standing next to a tall, blunt man who looked faintly familiar to Bosch. He showed the photo to Sheila. Is this your father? Yes, it's him. He looks familiar. Was he ever... He's an actor. Was, actually. He was on some television shows in the 60s and a few things after that. Some movie parts. Not enough to make a living? No, he always had to work other jobs. So he could live. Bosch nodded and handed the photo back to Edgar, but Sheila reached across the coffee table and intercepted it. I don't want that one to leave, please. I don't have many photos of my father. Fine, Bosch said. Could we go look for the birth certificate now? I'll go look. You can stay here. She got up and left the room again, and Edgar took the opportunity to show Bosch some of the other photos he had taken to keep during the investigation. It's him, Harry, he whispered. I got no doubt. He showed him a photo of Arthur Delacroix that had apparently been taken for school. His hair was combed neatly and he wore a blue blazer and tie. Bosch studied the boy's eyes. They reminded him of the photo of the boy from Kosovo he had found in Nicholas Trent's house. The boy with a thousand-yard stare. I found it. Sheila Delacroix came into the room carrying an envelope and unfolding a yellowed document. Bosch looked at it for a moment and then copied down the names, birth dates, and social security numbers of her parents. Thanks, he said. You and Arthur had the same parents, right? Of course. Okay, Sheila, thank you. We're going to go. We'll call you as soon as we know something for sure. He stood up and so did Edgar. All right, if we borrow these photos, Edgar asked. I will personally see that you get them back. Okay, if you need them. They headed to the door and she opened it. While still on the threshold, Bosch asked her one last question. Sheila, have you always lived here? She nodded. All my life. I've stayed here in case he comes back, you know. In case he doesn't know where to start and comes here. She smiled, but not in any way that imparted humor. Bosch nodded and stepped outside behind Edgar. Chapter 25 Bosch walked up to the museum ticket window and told the woman sitting behind it his name and that he had an appointment with Dr. William Golliher in the anthropology lab. 
she picked up a phone and made a call. A few minutes later, she rapped on the glass with her wedding band until it drew the attention of a nearby security guard. He came over and the woman instructed him to escort Bosch to the lab. He did not have to pay the admission. The guard said nothing as they walked through the dimly lit museum, past the mammoth display and the wall of wolf skulls. Bosch had never been inside the museum, though he had gone to the La Brea tar pits often on field trips when he was a child. The museum was built after that to house and display all of the finds that bubbled up out of the earth and the tar pits. When Bosch had called Gallagher's cell phone after receiving the medical records on Arthur Delacroix, the anthropologist said he was already working on another case and couldn't get downtown to the medical examiner's office until the next day. Bosch had said he couldn't wait. Gallagher said he did have copies of the x-rays and photographs from the Wonderland case with him. If Bosch could come to him, he could make the comparisons and give an unofficial response. Bosch took the compromise and headed to the tar pits while Edgar remained at Hollywood Division working the computer to see if he could locate Arthur and Sheila Delacroix's mother as well as run down Arthur's friend, Johnny Stokes. Now, Bosch was curious as to what the new case was that Gallagher was working. The tar pits were an ancient black hole where animals had gone to their death for centuries. In a grim chain reaction, animals caught in the miasma became prey for other animals, who in turn were mired and slowly pulled down. In some form of natural equilibrium, the bones now came back up out of the blackness and were collected for study by modern man. All of this took place right next to one of the busiest streets in Los Angeles a constant reminder of the crushing passage of time. Bosch was led through two doors and into the crowded lab where the bones were identified, classified, dated, and cleaned. There appeared to be boxes of bones everywhere on every flat surface. A half dozen people in white lab coats worked at stations cleaning and examining the bones. Gallagher was the only one not in a lab coat. He had on another Hawaiian shirt this one with parrots on it, and was working at a table in the far corner. As Bosch approached, he saw there were two wooden bone boxes on the work table in front of him. In one of the boxes was a skull. Detective Bosch, how are you? Doing okay. What's this? This, as I'm sure you can tell, is a human skull. It and some other human bones were collected two days ago from asphalt that was actually excavated thirty years ago to make room for this museum. They've asked me to take a look before they make the announcement. I don't understand. Is it old or from thirty years ago? Oh, it's quite old. It was carbon dated to nine thousand years ago, actually. Bosch nodded. The skull and the bones in the other box looked like mahogany. Take a look, Gallagher said, and he lifted the skull out of the box. He turned it so that the rear of the skull faced Bosch. He moved his finger in a circle around a star fracture near the top of the skull. Look familiar? Blunt force fracture? Exactly. Much like your case. Just goes to show you. He gently replaced the skull in the wooden box. Show me what? Things don't change that much. This woman, at least we think it was a woman, was murdered 9,000 years ago, her body probably thrown into the tar pit as a means of covering the crime. Human nature, it doesn't change. Bosch stared at the skull. She's not the first. Bosch looked up at Gallagher. In 1914, the bones, a more complete skeleton, actually, of another woman were found in the tar. She had the same star fracture in the same spot on her skull. Her bones were carbon dated as 9,000 years old. Same time frame as her. He nodded to the skull in the box. So what are you saying, Doc? That there was a serial killer here 9,000 years ago? It's impossible to know that, Detective Bosch. All we have are the bones. Bosch looked down at the skull again. He thought about what Julia Brasher had said about his job. 
about his taking evil out of the world. What she didn't know was a truth he had known for too long, that true evil could never be taken out of the world. At best, he was wading into the dark waters of the abyss with two leaking buckets in his hands. But you have other things on your mind, don't you? Gulliher said, interrupting Bosch's thoughts. Do you have the hospital records? Bosch brought his briefcase up onto the work table and opened it. He handed Gulliher a file. Then, from his pocket, he pulled the stack of photos he and Edgar had borrowed from Sheila Delacroix. I don't know if these help, he said. But this is the kid. Gulliher picked up the photos. He went through them quickly, stopping at the posed close-up of Arthur Delacroix in a jacket and tie. He went over to a chair where a backpack was slung over the armrest. He pulled out his own file and came back to the work table. He opened the file and took out an 8x10 photo of the skull from Wonderland Avenue. For a long moment, he held the photos of Arthur Delacroix and the skull side by side and studied them. Finally, he said, The Mailer and Superciliary Ridge Formation look similar. I'm not an anthropologist, Doc. Gulliher put the photos down on the table. He then explained by running his finger across the left eyebrow of the boy and then down around the outside of his eye. The brow ridge and the exterior orbit, he said. It's wider than usual on the recovered specimen. Looking at this photo of the boy, we see his facial structure is in line with what we see here. Bosch nodded. Let's look at the x-rays, Gulliher said. There's a box back here. Gulliher gathered the files and led Bush to another work table, where there was a light box built into the surface. He opened the hospital file, picked up the x-rays, and began reading the patient history report. Bosch had already read the document. The hospital reported that the boy was brought into the emergency room at 5.40 p.m. on February 11, 1980, by his father who said he was found in a dazed and unresponsive state following a fall from a skateboard in which he struck his head. Neurosurgery was performed in order to relieve pressure inside the skull caused by swelling of the brain. The boy remained in the hospital under observation for ten days and was then released to his father. Two weeks later, he was readmitted for follow-up surgery to remove the clips that had been used to hold his skull together following the neurosurgery. There was no report anywhere in the file of the boy complaining about being mistreated by his father or anyone else. While recovering from the initial surgery, he was routinely interviewed by an on-site social worker. Her report was less than half a page. It reported that the boy said he had hurt himself while skateboarding. There was no follow-up questioning or referral to juvenile authorities or the police. Gulliher shook his head while he finished his scan of the document. What is it? Bosch asked. It's nothing. And that's the problem. No investigation. They took the boy at his word. His father was probably sitting right there in the room with him when he was interviewed. You know how hard it would have been for him to tell the truth? So they just patched him up and sent him right back to the person who was hurting him. Hey, Doc, you're getting a little bit ahead of us. Let's get the ID if it's there, and then we'll figure out who was hurting the kid. Fine. It's your case. It's just that I've seen this a hundred times. Gulliher dropped the reports and picked up the x-rays. Bosch watched him with a bemused smile on his face. It seemed that Gulliher was annoyed because Bosch had not jumped to the same conclusions he had with the same speed he had. Gulliher put two x-rays down on the light box, he then went to his own file and brought out x-rays he had taken of the Wonderland skull. He flipped the box's light on and three x-rays glowed before them. Gulliher pointed to the x-ray he had taken from his own file. This is a radiological x-ray I took to look inside the bone of the skull. But we can use it here for comparison purposes. Tomorrow, when I get back to the medical examiner's office, I will use the skull itself. Gulliher leaned over the light box and reached for a small glass eyepiece that was stored on a nearby shelf. He held one end to his eye and pressed the other against one of the x-rays. 
After a few moments, he moved to one of the hospital x-rays and pressed the eyepiece to the same location on the skull. He went back and forth numerous times, making comparison after comparison. When he was finished, Gallagher straightened up, leaned back against the next work table, and folded his arms. Queen of Angels was a government-subsidized hospital. Money was always tight. They should have taken more than two pictures of this kid's head. If they had, they might have seen some of his other injuries. Okay, but they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. But based on what they did do and what we've got here, I was able to make several comparison points on the roundel, the fracture pattern, and along the squamous suture. There is no doubt in my mind. He gestured toward the x-rays still glowing on the light box. Meet Arthur Delacroix. Bosch nodded. Okay. Gallagher stepped over to the light box and started collecting the x-rays. How sure are you? Like I said, there's no doubt. I'll look at the skull tomorrow when I'm downtown, but I can tell you now, it's him. It's a match. So, if we get somebody and go into court with it, there aren't going to be any surprises, right? Gallagher looked at Bosch. No surprises. These findings can't be challenged. As you know, the challenge lies in the interpretation of the injuries. I look at this boy and see something horribly, horribly wrong, and I will testify to that, gladly. But then, you have these official records. He gestured dismissively to the open file of hospital records. They say skateboard. That's where the fight will be. Bosch nodded. Gallagher put the two x-rays back into the file and closed it. Bosch put it back in his briefcase. Well, Doctor, thanks for taking the time to see me here. I think... Detective Bosch? Yes? The other day you seemed very uncomfortable when I mentioned the necessity of faith in what we do. Basically, you changed the subject. Not really a subject I feel comfortable talking about. I would think that in your line of work it would be paramount to have a healthy spirituality. I don't know. My partner likes blaming aliens from outer space for everything that's wrong. I guess that's healthy, too. You're avoiding the question. Bosch grew annoyed, and the feeling quickly slipped toward anger. What is the question, Doc? Why do you care so much about me and what I believe or don't believe? Because it is important to me. I study bones, the framework of life. And I have come to believe that there is something more than blood and tissue and bone. There is something else that holds us together. I have something inside that you'll never see on any x-ray that holds me together and keeps me going. And so when I meet someone who carries a void in the place where I carry my faith, I get scared for him. Bosch looked at him for a long moment. You're wrong about me. I have faith, and I have a mission. Call it blue religion. Call it whatever you like. It's the belief that this won't just go by. That those bones came out of the ground for a reason. That they came out of the ground for me to find and for me to do something about. And that's what holds me together and keeps me going. And it won't show up on any x-ray either. Okay? He stared at Gallagher, waiting for a reply. But the anthropologist said nothing. I gotta go, doctor, Bosch finally said. Thanks for your help. You've made things very clear for me. He left him there, surrounded by the dark bones the city had been built on. Chapter 26 Edgar was not at his spot at the homicide table when Bosch got back to the squad room. Harry? Bosch looked up and saw Lieutenant Billet standing in the doorway to her office. Through the glass window, Bosch could see Edgar in there sitting in front of her desk. Bosch put his briefcase down and headed over. What's up, he said as he entered the office. No, that's my question, Billet said as she closed the door. Do we have an ID? 
She went around behind her desk and sat down as Bosch took the seat next to Edgar. Yes, we have an ID. Arthur Delacroix disappeared May 4th, 1980. The Emmy is sure of this? Their bow guy says there's no doubt. How close are we on time of death? Pretty close. The bone guy said before we knew anything that the fatal impact to the skull came about three months after the kid had the earlier skull fracture in surgery. We got the records on that surgery today. February 11, 1980, at Queen of Angels. You add three months and we're almost right on the button. Arthur Delacroix disappeared May 4th, according to his sister. The point is, Arthur Delacroix was dead four years before Nicholas Trent moved into that neighborhood. I think that puts him in the clear. Billets reluctantly nodded. I've had Irving's office and media relations on my ass all day about this, she said. They're not going to like it when I call them back with this. That's too bad, Bosch said. That's the way the case shakes out. Okay, so Trent wasn't in the neighborhood in 1980. Do we have anything yet on where he was? Bosch blew out his breath and shook his head. You're not going to let this go, are you? We need to concentrate on the kid. I'm not letting go because they're not. Irving called me himself this morning. He was very clear without having to say the words. If it turns out an innocent man killed himself because a cop leaked information to the media that held him up to public ridicule, then it's one more black eye for the department. Haven't we had enough humiliation in the last ten years? Bosch smiled without a hint of humor. You sound just like him, Lieutenant. That's really good. It was the wrong thing to say. He could see that it hurt her. Yeah, well, maybe I sound like him because I agree with him for once. This department has had nothing but scandal after scandal. Like most of the decent cops around here, I for one am sick of it. Good. So am I. But the solution is not to bend things to fit our needs. This is a homicide case. I know that, Harry. I'm not saying bend anything. I'm saying we have to be sure. We're sure. I'm sure. They were silent for a long moment. Everyone's eyes avoiding the others. What about kids? Edgar finally asked. Bosch sneered. Irving won't do a thing to kids, he said. He knows it'll make him look even worse if he touches her. Besides, she's probably the best cop they got down there on the third floor. You're always so sure, Harry, Billet said. It must be nice. Well, I'm sure about this. He stood up. And I'd like to get back to it. We've got stuff happening. I know all about it. Jerry was just telling me. But sit down and let's get back to this for one minute, okay? Bosch sat back down. I can't just talk to Irving the way I let you talk to me, Billet said. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to update him on the ID and everything else. I'm going to say you are pursuing the case as is. I will then invite him to assign IAD to the background investigation of Trent. In other words, if he remains unconvinced by the circumstances of the ID, then he can have IAD or whoever he can find run the background on Trent to see where he was in 1980. Bosch just looked at her giving no indication of approval or disapproval of her plan. Can we go now? Yes, you can go. When they got back to the homicide table and sat down, Edgar asked Bosch why he hadn't mentioned the theory that maybe Trent moved into the neighborhood because he knew the bones were up on the hillside. Because your sick fuck theory is too far-fetched to go beyond this table for the time being. If that gets to Irving, next thing you know it's in a press release and is the official line. Now, did you get anything on the box or not? Yeah, I got stuff. What? First of all, I confirmed Samuel Delacroix's address at the Manchester trailer park. So he's there when we want to go see him. In the last ten years, he's had two DUIs. He drives on a restricted license at the moment. I also ran his social and came up with a hit. He works for the city. Bosch's face showed his surprise. Doing what? He works part-time at a driving range at the municipal golf course right next to the trailer park. I made a call to Parks and Rex. Discreetly. Delacroix drives the cart that collects all the balls. You know, 
out on the range? The guy everybody tries to hit when he's out there. I guess he comes over from the trailer park and does it a couple times a day. Okay. Next. Christine Dorset Delacroix, the name of the mother on Sheila's birth certificate. I ran her social and got her now listed as Christine Dorset Waters. Address is in Palm Springs. Must have gone there to reinvent herself. New name, new life, whatever. Bosch nodded. You pulled the divorce? Got it. She filed on Samuel Delacroix in 73. The boy would have been about five at the time. Cited mental and physical abuse. Details of what that abuse consisted of were not included. It never went to trial, so the details never came out. He didn't contest it? It looks like a deal was made. He got custody of the two kids and didn't contest. Nice and clean. The file's about 12 pages thick. I've seen some that are 12 inches. My own, for example. If Arthur was five, some of those injuries predate that, according to the anthropologist. Edgar shook his head. The extract says the marriage had ended three years prior and they were living separately, so it looks like she split when the boy was about two, like Sheila said. Harry, you usually don't refer to the Vic by name. Yeah, so? Just point it out. Thank you. Anything else in the file? That's about it. I got copies if you want it. Okay, what about the skateboard friend? Got him too. Still alive, still local. But there's a problem. I ran all the usual data banks and came up with three John Stokes in L.A. that fall into the right age range. Two are in the valley, both clean. The third's a player. Multiple arrests for petty theft, auto theft, burglary, and possession going back to a full juvie jacket. Five years ago, he finally ran out of second chances and got sent to Corcoran to iron out a nickel. Did two and a half to parole. You talk to his agent? Is Stokes still on the line? Talk to his agent, yes. No, Stokes isn't on the hook. He cleared parole two months ago. The agent doesn't know where he is. Damn. Yeah, but I got him to pull a look at the client bio. It has Stokes growing up mostly in mid-Wilshire, in and out of foster homes, in and out of trouble. He's got to be our guy. The agent think he's still in L.A.? Yeah, he thinks so. We just got to find him. I already had patrol go by his last known. He moved out of there as soon as he cleared parole. So he's in the wind. Beautiful. Edgar nodded. We have to put him on the box, Bosch said. Start with, did it, Edgar said. I also typed up a roll call notice and gave it to Mankiewicz a while ago. He promised to get it read at all calls. I'm having a batch of visor photos made, too. Good. Bosch was impressed. Getting photos of Stokes to clip to the sun visors of every patrol car was the sort of extra step Edgar usually didn't bother to make. We'll get him, Harry. I'm not sure what good he'll do us, but we'll get him. He could be a key witness. If Arthur, I mean the Vic, ever told him his father was beating him, then we've got something. Bosch looked at his watch. It was almost two. He wanted to keep things moving, keep the investigation focused and urgent. For him, the most difficult time was waiting. Whether it was for lab results or other cops to make moves, it was always when he became most agitated. What do you have going tonight, he asked Edgar. Tonight? Nothing much. You got your kid tonight? No, Thursdays. Why? I'm thinking about going out to the springs. Now? Yeah. Talk to the ex-wife. He saw Edgar check his watch. He knew that even if they left that moment, they still wouldn't get back until late. It's all right. I can go by myself. Just give me the address. Nah, I'm going with you. You sure? You don't have to. I just don't like waiting around for something to happen, you know? Yeah, Harry, I know. Edgar stood up and took his jacket off the back of his chair. Then I'll go tell Bullets, Bosch said. Chapter 27 They were more than halfway across the desert to Palm Springs before either one of them spoke. 
Harry, Edgar said. You're not talking. I know, Bosch said. The one thing they had always had as partners was the ability to share long silences. Whenever Edgar felt the need to break the silence, Bosch knew there was something on his mind he wanted to talk about. What is it, J. Edgar? Nothing. The case? No, man, nothing. I'm cool. All right, then. They were passing a windmill farm. The air was dead. None of the blades were turning. Did your parents stay together? Bosch asked. Yeah, all the way, Edgar said. Then he laughed. I think they wished sometimes they didn't, but yeah, they stuck it out. That's how it goes, I guess. The strong survive. Bosch nodded. They were both divorced, but rarely talked about their failed marriages. Harry, I heard about you in the boot. It's getting around. Bosch nodded. This is what Edgar had wanted to bring up. Rookies in the department were often called boots. The origin of the term was obscure. One school of thought was that it referred to boot camp. Another, that it was a sarcastic reference to rookies being the new boots of the fascist empire. All I'm saying, man, is be careful with that. You got rank on her, okay? Yeah, I know. I'll figure something out. From what I hear and have seen, she's worth the risk. But you still got to be careful. Bosch didn't say anything. After a few minutes, they passed a road sign that said Palm Springs was coming up in nine miles. It was nearing dusk. Bosch was hoping to knock on the door where Christine Waters lived before it got dark. Harry, you gonna take the lead on this when we get there? Yeah, I'll take it. You can be the indignant one. That will be easy. Once they crossed the city boundary into Palm Springs, they picked up a map at a gas station and made their way through the town until they found Frank Sinatra Boulevard and took it up toward the mountains. Bosch pulled the car up to the gatehouse of a place called Mountain Gate Estates. Their map showed the street Christine Waters lived on was within Mountain Gate. A uniformed rent-a-cop stepped out of the gatehouse, eyeing the slick back they were in and smiling. You guys are a little ways off the beat, he said. Bosch nodded and tried to give a pleasant smile, but it only made him look like he had something sour in his mouth. Something like that, he said. What's up? We're going to talk to Christine Waters, 312 Deepwaters Drive. Mrs. Waters know you're coming? Not unless she's a psychic, or you tell her. That's my job. Hold on a second. He returned to the gatehouse, and Bosch saw him pick up a phone. Looks like Christine Delacroix seriously traded up, Edgar said. He was looking through the windshield at some of the homes that were visible from their position. They were all huge, with manicured lawns big enough to play touch football on. The guard came out, put both hands on the window sill of the car, and leaned down to look in at Bosch. She wants to know what it's about. Tell her we'll discuss it with her at her house, privately. Tell her we have a court order. The guard shrugged his shoulders in a have-it-your-way gesture and went back inside. Bosch watched him speaking on the phone for a few more moments. After he hung up, the gate started to open slowly. The guard stood in the open doorway and waved them in, but not without the last word. You know, that tough guy stuff probably works real well for you in L.A. Out here in the desert, it's just... Bosch didn't hear the rest. He drove through the gate while putting the window up. They found Deepwater's Drive at the far extreme of the development. The homes here looked to be a couple million dollars more opulent than those built near the entrance to Mountain Gate. Who would name a street in the desert Deep Waters Drive, Edgar mused. Maybe somebody named Waters. It dawned on Edgar then. Damn, you think? Then she really has traded up. The address Edgar came up with for Christine Waters corresponded with a mansion of contemporary Spanish design that sat at the end of a cul-de-sac at the terminus of Mountain Gate Estates. It was most definitely the development's premier lot. The house was positioned on a promontory that afforded it a view of all the other homes in the development, as well as a sweeping view of the golf course that surrounded it. 
The property had its own gated drive, but the gate was open. Bosch wondered if it always stood open or had been open for them. This is going to be interesting, Edgar said as they pulled into a parking circle made of interlocking paving stones. Just remember, Bosch said, people can change their addresses, but they can't change who they are. Right. Homicide 101. They got out and walked under the portico that led to the double-wide front door. It was opened before they got to it by a woman in a black and white maid's uniform. In a thick Spanish accent, the woman told them that Mrs. Waters was waiting in the living room. The living room was the size and had the feel of a small cathedral, with a twenty-five-foot ceiling with exposed roof beams. High on the wall facing the east were three large stained-glass windows, a triptych depicting a sunrise, a garden, and a moonrise. The opposite wall had six side-by-side -side sliding doors with a view of a golf course putting green. The room had two distinct groupings of furniture, as if to accommodate two separate gatherings at the same time. Sitting in the middle of a cream-colored couch in the first grouping was a woman with blonde hair and a tight face. Her pale blue eyes followed the men as they entered and took in the size of the room. Mrs. Waters, Bosch said. I'm Detective Bosch and this is Detective Edgar. We're from the Los Angeles Police Department. He held out his hand and she took it, but didn't shake it. She just held it for a moment and then moved on to Edgar's outstretched hand. Bosch knew from the birth certificate that she was fifty-six years old, but she looked close to a decade younger, her smooth tan face a testament to the wonders of modern medical science. Please have a seat, she said. I can't tell you how embarrassed I am to have that car sitting in front of my house. I guess discretion is not the better part of valor when it comes to the LAPD. Bosch smiled. Well, Mrs. Waters, we're kind of embarrassed about it, too, but that's what the bosses tell us to drive. So that's what we drive. What is this about? The guard at the gate said you have a court order. May I see it? Bosch sat down on a couch directly opposite her and across a black coffee table with gold designs inlaid on it. Ah, uh, he must have misunderstood me, he said. I told him we could get a court order if you refused to see us. I'm sure he did, she replied, the tone of her voice letting them know she didn't believe Bosch at all. What do you want to see me about? We need to ask you about your husband. My husband has been dead for five years. Besides that, he rarely went to Los Angeles. What could he possibly... Your first husband, Mrs. Waters. Samuel Delacroix. We need to talk to you about your children as well. Bosch saw weariness immediately enter her eyes. I... I haven't seen or spoken to them in years. Almost thirty years. You mean since you went out for medicine for the boy and forgot to come back home? Edgar asked. The woman looked at him as though he had slapped her. Bosch had hoped Edgar was going to use a little more finesse when he acted indignant with her. Who told you that? Mrs. Waters, Bosch said. I want to ask questions first, and then we can get to yours. I don't understand this. How did you find me? What are you doing? Why are you here? Her voice rose with emotion from question to question. A life she had put aside thirty years before was suddenly intruding into the carefully ordered life she now had. We're homicide investigators, ma'am. We're working on a case that may involve your husband. We... He's not my husband. I divorced him twenty-five years ago, at least. This is crazy. You're coming here to ask about a man I don't even know anymore, that I didn't even know was still alive. I think you should leave. I want you to leave. She stood up and extended her hand in the direction they had come in. Bosch glanced at Edgar and then back at the woman. Her anger had turned the tan on her sculptured face uneven. There were blotches beginning to form, the tale of plastic surgery. Mrs. Waters, sit down, Bosch said sternly. Please try to relax. Relax? Do you know who I am? My husband built this place. The houses, the golf course, everything. You can't just come in here like this. I could pick up the phone and have the chief of police on the line and two. Your son is dead, lady. 
Edgar snapped. The one you left behind thirty years ago. So sit down and let us ask you our questions. She dropped back onto the couch as if her feet had been kicked out from beneath her. Her mouth opened and then closed. Her eyes were no longer on them. They were on some distant memory. Arthur. That's right, Edgar said. Arthur. Glad you at least remember it. They watched her in silence for a few moments. All the years and all the distance wasn't enough. She was hurt by the news. Hurt bad. Bosch had seen it before. The pest had a way of coming back up out of the ground. Always right below your feet. Bosch took his notebook out of his pocket and opened it to a blank page. He wrote Cool It on it and handed the notebook to Edgar. Jerry, why don't you take some notes? I think Mrs. Waters wants to cooperate with us. His speaking drew Christine Waters out of her blue reverie. She looked at Bosch. What happened? Was it Sam? We don't know. That's why we're here. Arthur has been dead a long time. His remains were found just last week. She slowly brought one of her hands to her mouth in a fist. She lightly started bumping it against her lips. How long? He had been buried for twenty years. It was a call from your daughter that helped us identify him. Sheila. It was as if she had not spoken the name in so long she had to try it out to see if it still worked. Mrs. Waters, Arthur disappeared in 1980. Did you know about that? She shook her head. I was gone. I left almost ten years before that. And you had no contact with your family at all? I thought... She didn't finish. Bosch waited. Mrs. Waters? I couldn't take them with me. I was young and couldn't handle... The responsibility. I ran away, I admit that. I ran away. I thought that it would be best for them to not hear from me, to not even know about me. Bosch nodded in a way he hoped conveyed that he understood and agreed with her thinking at the time. It didn't matter that he did not. It didn't matter that his own mother had faced the same hardship of having a child too soon and under difficult circumstances, but it clung to and protected him with a fierceness that inspired his life. You wrote them letters before you left? Your children, I mean. How did you know that? Sheila told us. What did you say in the letter to Arthur? I just... I just told him I loved him, and I'd always think about him. But I couldn't be with him. I can't really remember everything I said. Is it important? Bosch shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. Your son had a letter with him. It might have been the one from you. It's deteriorated. We probably won't ever know. In the divorce petition you found a few years after leaving home, you cited physical abuse as a cause of action. I need you to tell us about that. What was the physical abuse? She shook her head again, this time in a dismissive way, as if the question was annoying or stupid. What do you think? Sam liked to bat me around. He'd get drunk, and it was like walking on eggshells. Anything could set him off. The baby crying, Sheila talking too loud. And I was always the target. He would hit you? Yes, he would hit me. He'd become a monster. It was one of the reasons I had to leave. But you left the kids with the monster, Edgar said. This time she didn't react as if struck. She fixed her pale eyes on Edgar with a deathly look that made Edgar turn his indignant eyes away. She spoke very calmly to him. Who are you to judge anyone? I had to survive, and I could not take them with me. If I had tried, none of us would have survived. I'm sure they understood that, Edgar said. The woman stood up again. I don't think I'm going to talk to you anymore. I'm sure you can find your way out. She headed toward the arched doorway at the far end of the room. Mrs. Waters, Bosch said. 
If you don't talk to us now, we will go get that court order. Fine, she said without looking back. Do it. I'll have one of my attorneys handle it. And it will become public record at the courthouse in town. It was a gamble, but Bosch thought it might stop her. He guessed that her life in Palm Springs was built squarely atop her secrets, and that she wouldn't want anybody going down into the basement. The social gossips might, like Edgar, have a hard time viewing her actions and motives the way she did. Deep inside, she had had a hard time herself, even after so many years. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.